Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for the podcaster who who wants you to know you deserve a good night's sleep. That's one of the reasons I make the show is you deserve a bedtime you could look forward to, a bedtime you don't dread. Uh, and the other reason I make the show and, and tons of other people listening right now, uh, we know what it feels like in the deep dark night. We might not know exactly what you're going through. But we can relate. And, and this podcast it doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't barely work for anybody on the first try. Give it a few tries. See how it goes. But it's time for the podcast that's recorded on an SD card. And I would hope SD stands for Sleepy Delight. Uh, but it, <laughs> I think it stands, for, I don't even know what it stands for. To be Holy cow. First time t- today I learned I have no idea what SD card stands for. Small disc. Soon, one of you will be letting me know, and I appreciate it, because it's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. And thanks for making it possible, my patron peeps. Uh, Hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Well, welcome. Uh, This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights, and press play. We're going to do the rest. Uh, What we're going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever is keeping you awake. It could be thoughts that you're thinking about, things on your mind. So thoughts, you know, thinking thoughts, uh, I don't know, confused thoughts, uh, thoughts about the past, present, future. I don't know, like a... I don't want, I, I hate to, the word fan, fantasy gets you misused so much, but so many of my, my thoughts are um, of a future that is unreal, like a, like of painting a picture, not always, I say, how come I can't paint a picture like that during the day, but I lie my head down and it's painting a picture, oh boy. And sometimes that picture's unrealistically good and sometimes it's the, the other end, but unreal, pictures of unreality. Uh, stuff I think, stuff that's, that, that seems real, that's, uh, I don't know, but that's something that's, oh, so thoughts, it could be feelings, anything coming up for you emotionally uh, about those thoughts or that are just there. And I'll be honest, <laughs> just keeping rolling with that, uh, when I do take the time to, to, to be kind of like a loving presence, I say, like I said from Ruth King, I see a dear one, don't be afraid, I'm here to help, uh tell me or where where are the thoughts coming from or whatever I, I, I do see them a lot of times they come from feelings or senses like a sense of uh, lack as i talk about sometimes on the uh, in other places or on the podcast and they say okay okay and i can actually have some compassion and empathy i don't know if that's super useful because at bedtime <laughs> that is that's during the day that happens Bedtime's a little bit tougher. That's why I'm here. So it could be thoughts, feelings, physical sensations, uh, changes in time, temperature, uh, routine, somebody visiting, you're going somewhere, you got something coming up, uh, you got something going on. Whatever it is, I'm here to help to keep you company. And that's kind of the thing when you're, you know, you're, when you're tired. Like during the day, I can kind of be more empathetic and compassionate sometimes and see that choice. But, you know, they say when you're hungry, uh, you, you know, irritated, what is it? Uh, I don't know. Like, uh, tired is the last one. But whatever it is, like, uh, I don't know, if there's like another one. But whatever, like, if you're tired, it's a little bit harder to resist those thoughts. And they can be feel irresistible at bedtime and, and loop us in. So that's what I'm here to do is to keep you company and take your mind off of stuff. So that you can fall asleep, but because your sleep is important, you deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve a place you can rest, and I hope I can be a part of that for you. And I'll talk more about that. But what I'll do is I'll send my voice across the deep dark night here. I'm going to use lulling, soothing, creaky dulcet tones. Oh, so creaky are my tones, like a door opening. To a sleepy room, but, you know, you say, that's an older door. I know it'll be good for dampening sound later. That's great uh, once it's closed. 
So creaky dulcet tones, pointless meanders, superfluous tangents. Uh, those you've already seen a few of those. It's where I go off topic. I get mixed up. I backtrack. Then I say, wait a second. And then I say, wait, I forgot what I was going to say. That kind of stuff. Uh, those are pointless meanders super and superfluous tangents. When I say, oh, let's go on and on and on about that. So those are a couple ways I do it. Now, if you're new, a few things to know, very important stuff. Most people arrive at this podcast doubtful, skeptical, ambivalent, or just even more. You say, what is this? Somebody told me about this. It doesn't, it's not going how I expected. I'm tired. And I've tried a bunch of stuff. And that's how most listeners get here. Because, of course, you're tired. Of course, you're skeptical if you've tried a lot of different stuff. And, of course, you're even more skeptical because, you mean, what do you mean you care about me and my sleep? Or what is this? And I said, don't worry. I'm going to try to explain it to you. Because I'm here to earn your trust, uh, to be your boyfriend, so you can, you know, lie down and, 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 and get comfortable and drift off or listen to me barely. So if you're feeling any of those feelings, those are normal ways to get here. The show does take two or three tries to get used to. And when I say get used to it, it's like uh, it's like going from a relationship where you're unsure to being like, okay, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm now I'm comfortable just being myself. Uh, uh, like uh, after two or three tries, you say, oh, I don't need to listen to this podcast. I just barely pay attention. Oh, listening's kind of passive. So just see how it goes. If you already know the show is not for you, I got a ton of great stuff, uh, other sleep podcasts, other sleepy stuff listed at sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you that you could always check out. Uh, that's uh, like tons of cool podcasts and stuff like that that you could fall asleep to. Because like I said, your sleep's important. You're important. That's why I make the show because the world will be a better place. If your world's a better place, if it's more manageable, and I also know how it feels in the deep, dark night. That's why I make the show. Trouble getting to sleep. You know, I have all that stuff. Uh, what else do you need to know? Oh, this is a podcast you don't really listen to. I kind of talked about that. You just kind of barely pay attention. It's uh, like a TV on in the other room or a party going on down the street, but far enough down the street that you don't mind. You can just barely hear it. Uh and it's a party you don't want to be at. So you're like, huh, sounds like a nice party, just far enough off. Uh, and that doesn't really very, very often happen. But when it's happened, you remember it, right? If you, or yeah, you say, okay. So there's that. Uh, oh, so you don't really listen to me. I also am not here to put you to sleep. I'm here to keep you company and take your mind off of stuff while you drift off. You, If you can't sleep, I'm going to be here to the very end for you to keep you company. That is my job, whether you're awake or asleep. Listening to the show is optional, but when you need to listen, you can, because I'll be here just barely making sense. So tonight we'll have, we're going to do a spelling, not a spelling bee. But a sleep with me version of a spelling bee, I guess, where we just spell words and uh, I guess I, I guess I pontificate. I don't know how to spell that either. So that's uh, what. I, oh, so yeah, you don't really listen to me. I'm not really here to put you asleep. Yeah, I'm here to be your boar friend, your boar bay, your boar sib, your boar cuz, your boar bestie, your boar burr, your neighbor, your boar friend in the deep dark night to keep you company or whatever you're comfortable with. You know, I could be across town even calling you or, you know, I could be across the world sending something like across the short waves. I mean, because I'm short a few waves, you know, uh, a couple of my waves are too long and a couple of them are short, too short. Though I do find waving to be powerful technique for introverts. Uh, so, um yeah, so just kind of see how it goes. I'm here to be, keep you company, take your mind off stuff. The other thing that throws people off is the structure of the show. The show is designed in a very deliberate way. And as you become a regular listener, you can repurpose or kind of, uh, you know, redesign the show to suit your needs. But let me explain to you why we make the show the way we do. It starts off with a greeting. That's kind of the most important part. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Then I say something silly. So hopefully you feel seen and welcomed in because when I talk about that lack, that's one of the things I feel. I say, oh, you know, that's uh, the, the opposite of that. So I, I really want to try to do that, uh, even though it's this digital thing to say, oh, OK, I could go over there and check that out maybe. 
And that person's a little bit silly, so it's not going to be too serious. So that's the greeting. Then there's support for the show because uh, kind of similar to the greeting, I would like the show to come out for free twice a week uh, on any podcast platform uh, and that everybody who works on the show gets compensated. So that's what the sponsors and the listener support do for the show, make it sustainable to come out for free. So that's important to me. Uh, and so that's the sponsors and the support stuff. Then there's support for listeners who are having a tough time right now and support for communities around the show. Again, that's what makes the show sustainable is staying engaged with everybody involved. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that's that part. Then there's an intro. Now, if some people like that don't like the, the support stuff, they project it onto the intro or assume that the whole intro is about supporting the show. No, the intro is a show within a show lasts about 12 to 20 minutes comes after the support stuff, which is what we're in now. And the whole goal of the uh, intro is it's a familiar friend. So if you're a regular listener, you go, Oh, scoots is back. Uh, who knows what he's going to talk about? Will it make any sense? Who knows? Uh, so there's that. And then there's, um, there's, and then there's, um, uh, oh, so, so that's for a regular listener, but for a new listener, it's introducing the podcast to you in a, in an inefficient way, of course, because that's kind of the style of the show. But for everyone, the intro is a chance to get ready for bed or to start your wind down routine. My wind down routine is about an hour. So I don't know if the intro is going to be a start of your wind down routine or in the middle or at the end, but the, all, all the stuff I've ever read about sleep and practice that has worked is having a wind down routine, having a buffer between your day, your evening and falling asleep. I've ne- I've rarely ever been able to just fall asleep. And when I do that, it's like, you know, in the middle of a presentation or something, or I'm supposed to be listening and it's a warm room or whatever. Those are the only times I just fall asleep. Otherwise, I need a wind-down routine. I need a landing strip. And ideally, that's what the intro can do for you. Some listeners are in bed. Some listeners are asleep. We're so happy for them. <laughs> uh, 2% of listeners start the show at 20 or 30 minutes. A few thousand people pay to just listen to story-only episodes. So uh, those are a couple different um ways you use it but at first you you just listen because the intro i don't know there's also there's more people that listen to only intros than listen to story only episodes it's pretty close so kind of just see how it goes and what's going to work for you uh but that's the intro then there's support again between the intro and the show again because so the podcast can be sustainable and come out for free versus only being on one platform or something like that or being a part of a company like a premium only. I want the show to come out twice a week for free. Uh, Then there'll be our story. Tonight it'll be some sort of, don't worry if you have spelling, if you don't like spelling, don't worry because uh, it'll be, uh, yeah, don't worry. So there'll be uh, spelling, it'll be talking about words. That's what we'll be doing. And then there's thank yous at the end. So this is the structure of the show. That's why I make the show. I'm really glad you're here. I really appreciate your time. I couldn't do it without all of you. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're here. And I really hope I can help you fall asleep. Thanks again for coming by. And here's a couple of ways I'm able to do this for you for free twice a week. All right, buddy. It's Scoots here. And, uh... I, uh, this is, uh, interesting. Uh, I, I can't believe we've never done an episode about this, but I can't remember ever doing an episode about this. And so this will be a little bit of a setup here, but, uh, so I just took a COA for a walk. Well, about 45 minutes ago. And I was listening to the intro for what, what's scheduled to be episode 1071 spice friends, 10, Will it be episode 1071? I don't know. But uh, I do know that I was listening and, and it came up. I was talking about the word booyah base. Uh, and I was listening to myself expound on pointless meanders around booyah base uh, and the, how hard it, like how that's not a sight. That's a sight word for me. No chance of me spelling it. Maybe you don't know this and maybe I can normalize it for some people, but I have uh, like dyslexia. And. 
It wasn't like it was something I always talked about. Like, uh, I never was tested for it as a child or even a young adult. And it wasn't until, like, uh, adulthood that uh, someone was practicing giving out tests uh, as part of their education or their graduate education. And they gave me a test. And then I said, see, I I knew I was a, a dyslexic. And... Like, uh, not a big deal, but it, it just means, uh, I don't know what it means. I thought I'd just share that for you in case you've ever felt that way. And you could feel that way about something else. You say, well, a lot of times, you yeah, uh, know, like it's, uh, uh, but for me, the dyslexia is just one of those things where it's like, oh, well, why can't you just do, like memorize how to spell it or something? I say, well, this is my brain just doesn't quite work that way. But what I do want to do is look, let's, so, oh, so the idea for the episode so the idea for the episode was that uh, I said I've, I've never done a sp- episode based on the the, con- the archetypal concept of a spelling test. Now, not uh, don't worry if you have like if you're like me. I mean, because I'm sure that like there's all sorts of people having experience with spelling tests, right? And uh, I totally understand that. So. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to make this sleepy as possible, and it won't really be about spelling. It'll be about pointless meanders and superfluous tangents. So what I'm going to do is grab my research, and then I'll be right back. So without further ado, I want to welcome you to the uh, Scoots uh, Scriptless Spelling Bee, uh, where uh, I'll be the only contestant, and I'll be, t- you know, there'll be silent uh, people, so... so uh, It'll be structurally a bit like the spelling bees of fame, but oh boy. And it, I probably will also have to go on a tangent about where I'm getting my lists of words from because that'll make it fun as well, hopefully. Uh, but this first word comes from the intro from Spice Friends 10, I think. Uh, booyab- booyabase. Uh, booyabase. Uh, it, I'm looking at the word so I know the correct spelling. And I actually have the definition. It's a provincial fish stew uh, from France. And Bouillabaisse base is spelled B O U I L L. Bouille. So that Bouille. Bouille. Is it Bouille base or Bouille base? B A B I A A B A I S S E. Beautiful word. Beautiful spelling. I know, like, I don't eat, uh, I'm, I'm allergic to crustaceans, so I don't have a lot of booyah base, but I love saying booyah base. And booyah, booyah base has broth, uh, broth based booyah base. Uh, if I created my own subgenre of EDM, it would be called booyah base, uh, bo- b- b- broth, b- 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 something like that. So now let's hop over to some of these words that are hard to spell. This is from dictionary.com. Uh, 33 hard words to spell. From This was our just uh, January 19th, 2022. And it's necessary. I start with the word necessary because it's spelled necessary. N-E-C-E-S-S-A-R-Y. And it's a double consonant does not change how the word is pronounced. That's what makes it hard to spell. The two S's. Uh, this is where actually I'm at an advantage sometimes with necessary because I know the length of the word because it's a sight word for me. So if it's missing the S, I, would, I might add two C's, but I could add two S's because I know it's necessary to be a longer word when it's a sight word, which just means I, I see the word as a picture or what you would call a picture that is the, the how it's spelled. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't even know if it's correct. This is just my experience in trying to translate something that's almost untranslatable in my mind. But I'm pretty sure when I see ne- necessary, I just see the whole word. And I don't, it, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's the sum of its parts, but I don't necessarily see the parts, I guess. So when they have to break it into its component parts, that's when it gets interesting. And, you know, a lot of people say, you, you're taking a whole episode to make it about you. And I say, oh, boy, that's my middle name is making it about me. 
I know, and it's a bit narcissistic, right? Uh, N-A-R-C-I-S-S-I-S-T-I-C, narcissistic, which is similar to necessary. I guess it's got that double S, uh, and CNS is narcissistic. Uh, and I guess it comes from uh, Greek. Uh, but yeah, narcissistic, uh, you know, I, ha- I do have, I- I'm familiar with narcissus, n- narcissus, uh, which they just had the tick in there. And, you know, there's rarely an occasion where I don't, I, I mean, it's just part of uh, who I am. You know, I I, uh, I guess I have the, the uh, maybe the shadow side of narcissism where I tend to make it more about me negatively a lot of times. But it also it's about what, like I've learned from the podcast, it's like about the occasions that we could relate to with one another, like the occasions we find find ourselves strolling in the deep dark night trying to spell occasion, O-C-C-A-S-I-O-N. This features a C and an S. They're not making the same S sound, uh, but it's a hard C, like a K that can make it hard with a double C. Uh, so that's occasion. You know what I finally learned is that, me, like, but I never did it at my, one of my jobs was to ask to be accommodated or for, like, I say, hey, can you accommodate me uh, with what I'm going on? Because, like, as my job changed to my last day job, like, I was supposed to make some presentations and some reports, uh, but I was always, uh, de-accommodating me because I didn't want to ask, you know, for help. That's A-C-C-O-M-M-O-D-A-T-E. So that uses a double C and a double M, but it's the vowels, according to this, that are t- tough. Uh, accommodate uh, sounds like it could be spelled with three O's. Oh, uh, uh, oh, 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 accommodate, uh, or maybe a U, but there's no U's in the first letters in A. Now, this is a word I'd get this, like a consonant and the vowel mixed up on. and uh, But it's also something one of my siblings, I consider it his hobby, is a vacuum. A V-A-C-U-U-M. I think I would probably be tempted to do a V-A-C-C-U-M. Uh, but it's vacuum instead of a double C, it's got a rare double U. Other words, continuum and moo moo. M U U M U U. Oh, yeah, moo moo. Okay. Continuum also is C O N T I N U U M. U U M. I love saying there's something we already found we could love. Very sleepy. U U M. U U M. That could be a character somewhere, old U-U-M. It could be E-U-E-U, not E-U-E-U. I mean, like, e- well, isn't there an emu? An emu named E-U, or an emu named uh, U-U, U-U-M. I'm an emu, and uh, e- from Inu, named U-U-M. And that word comes from vacus, which means empty, which also is a W in Latin. And you know what I like to do? Uh, you know, if I was going to vacuum and uh, enjoy it, maybe I'd like uh, use not only use the accessory on the vacuum, but maybe wear a few accessories. Because accessory is another word that's supposedly hard to spell. A-C-C-E-S-S-O-R-Y. Now, that one I might have a dyslexic advantage because there's double-double consonants, which is a kind of a, like, again, that has the accessory has a certain length. And, and uh, like, it's almost like when you see one of those pictures and, and uh, they're like, what's different in this picture and the other picture? And uh, I say, okay, like, uh, like accessory's missing something. Uh and unlike accommodate, where the double C makes a single K sound, accessory, the first C makes a K sound, and the second C makes an S sound, accessory, X, X, accessory. So it's accessory. I'm learning stuff, uh, throwing a double S, and it's a real challenge. Now, there's a lot of, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, UK-based uh uh, espionage, there's a lot of broccoli, but you know who loves broccoli in this house? My dog, Koa. If you're new to the show, 
or you just want a cute reminder. Uh, Koa, my dog, loves broccoli. Uh, she loves it like uh, I've never done a test because I don't think it would be nice for her to choose between a bis like a dog biscuit or a dog treat and broccoli. Just because she loves broccoli so much, I just now she does she get broccoli every day? No. That's one of those things that's been on my to-do list for 20 or 30 years is to have broccoli every day. Never hit that, but, you know, twice a week is pretty good. Inko also likes broccoli stems. She's big into cruciferous vegetables. I don't know how much cauliflower I've given her. But, you know, if you're uh, breaking kale down, she'll eat the kale stems or she'll have kale. I think broccoli's her preferred thing. Cooked broccoli, a little bit easier to consume, a little bit less... uh, what are you, gasorific or something? I don't know if that's going to be on the spelling word. Oh, but broccoli, how do you spell it? For the love of Bar- Barbara Broccoli, uh, it's B-R-O-C-C-O-L-I. And uh, it's uh, from the Italian. It features a double C to make a K sound, and you, want, you might want a Y or an E-E to make that Lee sound, but it's just an L-I. And that one's... Uh, not quite as hard for me, I guess, but I probably, I don't know. I haven't spelled it in a while. Speaking of vegetables and foods, zucchini's up next. Z-U-C-C-H-I-N-I. And here's something I learned the hard way. I like zucchini. Um, my do- like, but I over, this was before the podcast, but I over uh, cooked, like I, I, I burned my daughter out of bra- or zucchini. Because, I, you know, especially like now in the East Coast, like zucchini, you know, summer zucchini, summer squashes, you could get bigger and you cut them up and you can grill them or fry them or bake them. But in the West Coast, I found, especially in the supermarket, you get more like a hot dog size zucchini, but you can cut them into medallions and fry them. They don't have, when you fry them, like a little flash fry, uh, they tend to have a little bit of a tannic, uh, bitter flavor that I don't necessarily associate with my childhood, which was that clean, watery flavor of a zucchini. And I think that was what did it for my daughter, is like that bitterness, which I could still overcome, because if you get the right al dente zucchini cook, it has a wonderful mouthfeel that is its own reward. uh, Because you say, how could this be so watery? It's like a watermelon almost. And uh, it's also a word that apparently is from Italian and hard to spell. It's got an I to make an E-E sound, a double C to make a K sound. In, oh, in, in UK, which comes from France, cour, cour, get, courgette, courgette, uh, courgette. Uh, thank you for writing that out for me. See, that, that's spelled like cougar, though. C-O-U-R-G-E-T-T-E, courgette. Uh, Never knew how to pronounce that till today. I'm not even sure. How about spaghetti while we're talking about stuff? Uh, I think I should be able to reliably spell that one again as a sight word. S-P-A-G, maybe not though. That S-P-A-G, H-E-T-T-I, I can probably get. Uh, that's an Italian or origins, uh, letter I at the end of a word. In Italian indicates that's plural. Single of spaghetti is spaghetto. Silent H could throw you off. Uh, yeah. I'm more worried about the sp- spag, I guess, because I don't say spaghetti. Spa. Oh, because uh, that's another way to pronounce A, apparently, that I probably should have learned in second grade. Uh, someone laughed not that long ago when I told them I, th- I actually do throw spaghetti against the wall to see if it's done. And... Uh, but uh, I don't eat a lot of pasta. Uh, and I mean, nowadays, most of the pasta I'm eating is uh, like a whole grain or quinoa or brown rice pasta, which I should probably eat some more of because uh, my daughter likes it too. Uh, embarrassed. Now, this one, I guess at first glance would be easy, but it's not. Uh, E-M-B-A-R-R-A-S-S. Uh, don't embarrass. I didn't realize there was an, I'm not kidding. Uh, I mean, I, I knew it, probably knew it, but that there's an ass instead of embarrassed. Uh, it's like, uh, for me, you could say anytime I go anywhere, I'm embarking on being asinine. Uh, 
So I do put, you know, what comes first embarking. We, I mean, I, uh, like, uh, I'm at home, I'm, you know, I'm, but, uh, then when I leave home, I'm embarrassed, but you know, I'm embarrassing myself, uh, embarrassing myself. What's that, uh, that embarrassing myself, uh, um, I don't know what that accent is. It just popped up in my brain, but it's E M B A R R A S S. Did I already say that? I may have embarrassed myself again. Uh, one thing that might help you is the ending. It sounds like us, uh, but it's spelled well, ass, uh, uh, the double R and the double S, uh, yes, bar ass, uh, it's adopted from the Portuguese embarcar, embara, m, m, baracar, yeah. Via French embarasa, emba, embarasar. Uh, bourbon, uh, I know how to spell that, even though it wasn't my thing. But now when I see it, I mean, there's a lot of fake, like, uh, imitation bourbon or whatever in, like, uh, or bourbon flavoring now and stuff, like ice cream and stuff. Uh, B o u r b o n, bourbon. That's a French word. Speaking of French, charcuterie, charcuterie, right? Charcuterie. That's a c h a r c u t e r i e or char cut erie. If you're big, you know, if you've been in Lake Erie or. Uh, the Erie Canal, that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, charcuterie, charcuterie. The French have a different so, so, so system of spelling, which can make it confusing. In French, the letters C H A R pronounced cha, cha, cha here. I don't know what that means. Char, 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 shahar, shahar. Shahar Kuteri, Shahar Kuteri. I think I just got it right. Shahar Kuteri. Uh, cooked process, you know, this is like a, like cheese, cheese and st- like the uh, charcuterie, char, shahar kuteri would be the, uh, meats with a, on a meat plate, I think. Meat and cheese plate. I accidentally got one of those one time when I was ordering lunch somewhere. And they gave me the shark. They gave me that thing, and I said I didn't order this. And they said, "Yeah, you did." And I said, "But I didn't pay for it." And they said, "It's on your order." Not like I don't know. Maybe, maybe that never happens to me, but it didn't happen to me on this case. But I think that would be pretty sly, especially for someone sober like me. If I was like to uh, send a cheese plate to someone, what if? They, but they like I don't eat dairy. That's what would happen to me. I don't eat meat or dairy. Thank you. And they said, well, I was going to send you a drink, but I know we both don't drink. So, uh, you see, yeah, but I also don't eat dairy or meat or cheese or, uh, also your bre- your, then you see the, even if it went well, they'd say your breath smells like salami and, uh, you know, but like whatever charcuterie breath is not romantic. There's like, there's a piece of wisdom. That's probably the biggest piece of wisdom you'll ever get. Uh, uh, charcuterie is not. Um, I think I went on a date. This was before I got sober too. And, uh, it was, I think it was the second date when I was like, okay, where is this going? And like, I hadn't even, like, I was like, uh, the person that let me know they, she, she was like, oh, let's go on another date. Uh, Cause I was like, I don't know how, how that went. Uh, uh, wonderful person like, uh, but, but it was like, uh. I was like, I don't know how that went. And then they said, Hey, are we going to go out again? And I said, yeah. Oh yeah. Like, uh, um, it was someone I found it was one of those times where you're like, if somebody's cool and attract, you're attracted to them, but there wasn't a connection probably cause I was still out there exploring my, uh, wasn't, pr- I was not boyfriend material, uh, we'll say, but this is probably another example of that is like, this was, a. We stopped at some place to get uh, just a drink because we were hiking or something. And after the hike, I got a kombucha, another word hard to spell probably. Uh, yeah, let's look that up because I have no idea how to spell it. And uh, there's another f- beverage never, like, the only thing worse would be if you had a kombucha with a uh, charcuterie and a cheese plate. And then, ha- like, that was, w- and then you had hot dogs or something. 
if I, if I could get this stuff imprinted in my brain to remember, uh, uh, kombucha is K O M B U C H A stuff never to drink or eat on dates. Uh, or, you know, you're married when, uh, but probably don't have those when you're like, you can have those when you're married, but not on date night or like, uh, anything within three hours of when you think there's going to be love in the air. I mean, my advice from somebody that, uh, his, his, his advice is, uh, well, I knew, you know, no, I'm an expert in making these mistakes just so you don't have to make them. Some people would say I'm an entrepreneur in bad decision making, and that's E N T R E P R E N E U R. I knew this was French uh, because of the entra, entrepreneur. It starts with an A ah sound. You may think it includes an A, but that's not the case. Uh, that one I, can, I, I definitely can't spell because it's just a. I think the E E U R at the end, entree, pre, newer. I'd have try. Yeah, I can't separate that out for some reason. Like I can do it while I'm looking at it and we're talking about it, but then when I close my eyes, can't do it. Uh, liaison. I need a spelling liaison. Uh, L I A I S O N O N O N. This is fun. Uh, I didn't realize, I can't believe it took us, whatever, a thousand and uh, almost 1,100 episodes to do this. Uh, thank you. Uh, liaison is L-I-A-I-S-O-N. Another French word. You may be tempted to spell it phonetically. Liaison. But much like the I at the end of Italian words, uh, the I in French can make the E-E sound. Remember, liaison has two eyes. That makes sense, because if you're having a, like, seriously, that's, uh, they, they, you know, dictionary.com, you could hire me for these quips, probably price you out, but, uh, you need two eyes to have a liaison in more than, like, because you, like, even, or four eyes, but you need two eyes in quotes, but two eyes would help start a liaison, because, oh boy, there's a liaison I'd like to have. Or when I see spelling, I say, could use a spelling liaison. My two eyes aren't going to cut it, so I need, uh, then I need another metaphor to spell liaison. But I know I see, li or you just say, I see liaison with two eyes. Uh, that's easy. Yeah, so we could just change that to, uh, you need two eyes to see liaison. Connecticut is on here. C O N N E C T I C U T. I can see that's hard to spell. Uh, connect, connect, I cut uh, is how it's spelled. Uh, uh, it comes from the Mohegan Pequot language and means upon the long river. C O N N E C T I C U T. It goes right into Massachusetts, M-A-S-S-A-C-H-U-S-E-T-T-S. -S -S -E uh, that's Algonquin. That's from Algonquin uh, at the Large Hill. Here's a, This one's challenging for everybody or for a lot of people, and a lot of times people get made fun of because they pronounce this the wrong way. Epitome or epitome, right? Uh, and I've said it. I've sure. I'm sure I said epitome on the podcast before, because it does. I mean, that's a epitome. And when I say epitome, I that's what I feel like inside. Epitome, or please pity me. No, I don't want pity though. I just say I feel like I'm epitome. That's where I feel like I am. Uh, e p i t o m e. That's from the Greek. Uh, I pit a me, e, e, I H, how do you say that? Pit a me. Um, one reason is similar to Italian, all the vowels from Greek words are pronounced. No silent E's here. E pit a me, epitome, epitome, e pit a me. Uh, indict, uh, yeah, you'll indict my spelling. Indict, uh, that, I don't, I, I N D I C T. I guess because it doesn't have 
You don't pronounce the letter C in this word, really? Oh, dict. Uh, I guess it depends on how you pronounce your C's. It's related to dictate, D-I-C. Did I say I-N-D-I-C-T? D-I-C-T-A. D-I-C-T-A-T-E is dictate. Oh, boy, we're getting into some good ones here. Gnaw. Gnaw has a G. G-N-A-W. We've seen T-H in silent C. Gnaw. I love that word. That sounds gnaw. Uh, Gnaw. It just sounds good to say. And it depends on what you're gnawing. Uh, But if if it's a metaphorical or figurative word, it's like, yeah, I got to gnaw on that or, you know. I don't know, phlegm, holy, what a gorgeous word, a gorgeous word, uh, in my opinion. Uh, P-H-L-E-G-M, phlegm, phlegm, it sounds lovely to say, lovely to look at. If I could have an affair with a word, uh, non-figuratively, you say, no, 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 no meaning. It's going to be a meaningless romance, <laughs> because I don't want the meaning behind you. It would be phlegm. I would choose, I choose to love phlegm, but not real, not the word phlegm. I'm in love with the word phlegm. I'll tell you. Like, it's a meaningless affair, please. Uh, but I lo- I'm in love with you, phlegm. Phlegm, I love you. Uh, because, I don't know, just looking at you. P-H-L-E-G-M, phlegm. Uh, silent G's do not only appear at the beginning words, they can show up in the endings as well. Uh, phlegm, F-L-E-M is how it's said. It uses the letters P-H to make an F-F sound and comes from the Greek uh, phlegm and phone. But yeah, I'm in love. I'm, I have a me- I'm having a meaningless romance with phlegm. Paradigm. I shifted the paradigm. I said, uh, you said, can you do that? Uh, I said, in in my mind, I can do it. Uh, but I mean, don't ask any more questions than that. I just meant to uh, be in love with phlegm and have loving, like a, like a meaningless, uh, like a long, I have a longing for phlegm. Let's just say that, but it not a meaningless longing for, I have a, lo- I have a meaningless longing for phlegm. Par- so I shifted the paradigm, P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M. So don't spell it dime, even though it's said dime, it's a D-I-G-M. From the Greek, uh, paradigma, maybe, D-E-I-G-M-A. Uh, island, uh, this the letter S is silent, uh, I-S-L-A-N-D. It's from Isle, I-S-L-E. You know what's going to get you is uh, I think it was I think it was Gloria Stefan and the Miami Sound Machine, but it could have just been Gloria Stefan, which we should look up right now. Gloria is G L O R I A, but Stefan is E S T E F A N. I'm surprised, at like a. Uh, like, uh, people, like, that's a pretty cool name to have if you have fans, uh, cause you'd say, uh, uh, or you could say, cause este is this, is a masculine this, right? And, uh, I wonder what famosa, I don't know what fan is, but, uh, you could say I'm a fan of, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, this fan of Gloria Est- Est- Estefan, but is correct pronunciation. Uh, but the rhythm would get you tonight uh, is R H Y T H M. Is two H's, one is silent, and the other is using a diphthong T H. It sounds like it should have a U. Oh, it doesn't have a U. Oh, interesting rhythm, but it doesn't. Uh, comes from the Greek rhythmos. Uh, uh, but I mean, I, I think let's see if we can figure out a way to help us spell this one. Rhythm. It's six letters. Uh, G L O R I A has seven letters, so that doesn't help us. Uh, Stefan has seven letters. Uh, rhythm. One less le- letter than the letters in go- either part. G L O R I A. Is that? F- I don't know. <laughs> now, G L O R I A. That's six, dude. Oh, thanks. Uh, Sorry, my, I was counting on my fingers. 
and I did it wrong. It was 35 minutes. This is like, uh, this could be like uh, one of the loosest episodes we've ever done. So Gloria and Rhythm have the same. I don't know if that'll be helpful. Um, there's a song, G-L-O-R-I-A, that used to, I don't know, like, uh, there's also another song about Gloria, because I had a crush on a teacher named Gloria, kind of, when I was a little kid, prepubescent, uh, so, and because she, she was also just nice to me. Wednesday, this is, this is a tough one, I never get this one, Wednesday, Wednesday. W E D N E S day, Wed Nez day. Okay, because I always think I mix up the E and the N. Woden's day, the old English. Uh, keeping Woden or Odin in mind is a good way to remember those pesky, that pesky D. Wed Nez day. That's how I, I mean, I don't know how I'll remember it. Eight is a homophone uh, uh, of the past participle of eat, eight, uh, E-I-G-H-T. But that's not the only thing confusing. I-G-H-T is normally for bright and tight, uh, but uh, eight, it's got that eight. Uh, how about uh, acquiesce? Uh, it's another word uh, with some letters. Uh, acquiesce. A C Q U I E S C E. Uh, let's see what else. Conscious, conscience. I'm trying to get through this list. I thought it only had 20 words, but it seems like it has more. I thought it said 30. Maybe it said 33, but uh, conscience, uh, C O N S C I O U S. Uh, grateful. G R A T E. Full, grateful. So just that one's easy. Go back to charcuterie, charcuterie. Uh, when I grate my cheese, I'm great. I'm grateful. I won't be kissing anyone when I'm grating this hard cheese. I'm grateful. Yeah. So there, that's how I could find my gratitude for being, you see, I'm grateful. Separate uh, is uh, separate. Uh, S-E-P-A-R-A-T-E. The second vowel sound is spelled with an A and not a U or an E, even though in, it does sound like that sometimes. And then finally, their last word is lightning, L-I-G-H-T-N-I-N-G, L-I-G-H-T-N-I-N-G. The u- unusual combination of T-N may throw you off. However, adding an E would make it lightening, which uh, is a different word to lighten, you know. Okay, so that's that, those words there. Let's see, I got tons of research, so let's see what we, else we can get through here. Okay, this one is uh, from StaffordHouse.com, Stafford House International blog. Alex Levantis, uh, May 16th, 2020. Ten common English words with weird spellings. Uh, this is a tough one. This is a good one. Thorough. T H R or through? Oh no, that's through. Through maybe I don't know. Through yeah, T H R T H rough uh, T H R O U G H. It can be an adjective. Uh, the hallway ran through the room or preposition. The printer is through the blue door. But when you look at the phonetics, uh, through or throw, it could be, but it's through. In the U.S., some people spell it T-H-R-U, and I mispronounce it thorough. But uh, I say if you if you know who the new kids on the block are, you uh, say uh, the rough. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why I thought of new kids on the block because it's the right stuff, baby. They sing. Why do you think of thorough? Oh, rough. They, I think they say something. Maybe it's just the right stuff. So I have no idea what I'm talking. I've totally. Well, it's funny. Okay, these are good ones. Q. That's a hard one. Like you might think it's K E W, which is an area in London, but how do you say it? Like spelled Q U E U E. 
I mean, that's important for theme parks because you got to get in line. They call it a queue. You're queuing up or you're in a queue. Q U. Wait, Q U E U E. Q. Occurred. Uh, o C C U R R E D. Uh, mortgage. Uh, M O R T gauge. Uh, that's a sight word, I think. I see it so many times. Mort gauge. Uh, so just think of someone named Mort gauging your interest rate. Mort gauge. Jeopardy. G. These again are sight words in the U.S. I guess. Uh, G E O P A R D Y. I lost. You know the. They just think of uh, Weird Al. I lost on Jeopardy, baby. Uh, Colonel C O L O N E L. I guess again in the U.S. we see that like on uh, advertisements, but uh, Colonel does, it definitely doesn't sound like K. You know K E R N E L. Need is a tricky one. K N E A D. It's a homophone uh, uh, as with need, N-E-E-D, um, like C and C, P and P, night and night, sure and shore, sure and shore, depending on pronunciation. Indict. Uh, did we do that one? I-N-D-I-C-T. Yeah, we did. Handkerchief. That's a good one. Or handkerchief. Uh Hand, wow, this is a tough one. Hand a kerchief. Uh, so I guess someone you have to think of, uh, if you if your sneeze is a kerchief, uh, then you say, hey, I'm going to hand you a kerchief for, for your sneeze. Uh, H-A-N-D-K-E-R-C-H-I-E-F, uh, hand kerchief. Uh, silent D, handkerchief, uh, handkerchief. Uh, so they say, who's got that sound? So that's from Stafford House. That's good. Okay, this one is from readersdigest.com, rd.com, Megan Jones, January 20th, 2022. Uh, dilate, there's a good one. Only six letters, D-I-L-A-T-E. People, uh, dial a dial, uh, late, uh, uh, may... Huh, I don't know. Dilate. Uh, oh, here's a beautiful. This is a word uh, not quite as gorgeous as that other word I fell in love with, uh, which is whose name I forgot. Uh, and it was a word that stood for something you wouldn't want to be, like gaseous, but it wasn't gaseous. Uh, this is liquefy. Not quite as gorgeous as that other word that I had uh, yearned for so much, so, so mindlessly that uh, liquefy, L-I-Q-U-E-F-Y, liquefy. Uh, last three letters uh, throw people off, E-F-Y, because it sounds like pacify, clarify, specify, rectify. But no, it's L-I-Q-U-E-F-Y. Uh, meaning to become liquid. Wednesday, we get Sherbert. Here's another one we haven't gotten yet. Sherbert, H S A. Sorry, I already mispronounced it or misspelled it. S H E R B E T. Sherbet, Sherbert, 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 Sherbert. Sometimes I say Sherbert. Uh, so that's hard to say because it's it's an American Americanization of sorbet. Sherbert, uh, uh, let's see, both come from the Turkish word serbe, S-E-R-B-E-T. Um, and as you can read a lot more, but Sherbert, uh, is how people pronounce it in the U in different regions of the U.S. Sherbert, yeah, Sherbert is how they said it in Syracuse. Sherbert, Sherbert, uh, Bologna, you know what they say about me a lot of times, it's baloney, B-O-L-O-G-N-A. I think it, that for like 20 or 30 years in the U.S., uh, people would spell out uh, that word. Uh, so in the U.S., uh, but it's from Bologna, right? Bologna is how you say the place in Italy. I don't think I've had any, but like that was one of the things I never ate, though I know it's popular, uh, it's like that's very similar to some other things where I could taste other ingredients in there or something. Playwrights on here. Used to go to this bar called the Playwright to drink when I was, uh, not all the time, but uh, 
especially if I was meeting people from out of town. I think it closed too. It's called the playwright. Uh, playwright is P L A Y W R I G H T. Playwright. Uh, it's uh, in the 1660s. People who produced plays were, were workers who wrought plays. W R O U G H T. That's a nice word. Wrought. Holy cow. Rather than the people that wrote them. So if you wrought something. You were considered a right. This is beautiful stuff. This is this is why this is why I love this. Uh, so if you wrought something, W R O U G H T, you were considered a right. W R I G H T. What if you wrought, uh, like you know that thing that's not Casper, but there's another another word for it, a white, uh, and I think that's a G H. Like what if you wrought? Oh, you write, you you write a right, right, right. So you're right, right, uh, white, right. Uh, that's a D and that's a character in D and D. Uh, and also, right, W R I G H T is another homophone for uh, right, W R I T E. Fuchsia. Oh boy, holy mackerel! That's a good looking word. Uh, uh, fuchsia. F U C H S I A. Man, that's beautiful. This is beautiful. That's a beautiful color, beautiful word. Fuchsia. Just lovely to say, too. Fuchsia. What was the word, though, that I was in love with? I can't believe it was like 10 minutes ago. Was it polyglot? P O L Y G L O T. No, I guess not. Uh, but I guess I've gone polyglot on my word romances. Uh, I really wish you, I'll, I'll look it up. Minuscule. Wow. Did I spell fuchsia? F U C H uh, S I A. Minuscule. There's another. Man, I'm not trying to be too, like, uh, but minuscule is nice too. M I N U S C U L E. Uh, it comes from Latin minus uh, or minus, uh, meaning less. Uh, uh, but it bears no linguistic re- relation to mini or miniature. Minuscule. It's not minuscule, no matter how much logic would suggest. Oh, they have the actual F U C H. Huh. Oh, they have the misspelling in the correct minuscule. Oh, there's a U where people would put an I. Okay. Okay, ingenious. Uh, it has an O, so you, in- ingenious, but add an O. Because if you're around a genius, you're probably saying, oh, you're a genius, eh? There you go. I-N-G-E-N-I-O-U-S. It's uh, so similar in sound and meaning that people, uh, and I guess it is hard if you're looking at it and you're dyslexic, you say ingenious, uh, ingenious. uh, But I think maybe that's sacrilegious. My spelling has been considered sacrilegious. No chance in planet Earth I'd ever spell this word right. I wouldn't even get the incorrect spelling, but it's uh, S A C R I L E G I O U S. Uh, oh, because people would put sacrilegious, uh, which totally makes sense. Uh, but it comes from sacrilege, not religious. Uh, oh, beautiful, beautiful writing, uh, Reader's Digest. I like this. Uh, uh, it came from Latin of sacred and legere, accommodate. Put an extra C up in there. AC, because, cause, you know, extra comfort, accommodate. Extra comfort, A C C O M M O D A T E, accommodate. We did that one already, though. Oh, boy. Here's another good one orangutan. Orangutan. Uh, O-R-A-N-G-U-T-A-N. Beautiful. That's another one. Bornean primates. Uh, it's, uh, uh, from Malay, uh, O-R-A-N-G, or for man or forest, uh, but it has been anglicized, uh, orangutan. Oh, Hutan for forest, uh, Oring for man, and Hutan for forest. 
I just want to thank all you for allowing me to be so mischievous uh, and keep you company. Mischievous. Uh, so this one, it, I, no chance of me smelling this one either. M-I-S-C-H-I-E-V-O-U-S. Uh, makes me think of sous vide for some reason. Have you pronounced this world mischievous a whole bit? Uh, even maybe you pronounce it that way. It's correct, incorrect. It's mischievous, uh, chivos, uh, or something. I don't know. Mischief. Uh, but that's our gubernatorial. So people usually do it with governor, but I say goober anyway. So gubernat, gubernator, guber, I can't even say it. G u b e r n a t o r i n. No, that's not correct. Uh, G u b. -E I was reading it off the thing. Miscorrect. Like uh, G u b e r n a t o r i a l. So the word governor, but no u b or t in it. Uh, so where do we get this wacky thing? Uh, it's uh, closer to governor than the uh, origin of the word. Uh, uh, both words come from the Latin gubernator or governor. Acquiesce. I think we did acquiesce. Let's spell it one more time. Is that like I'd acquiesce? Uh, A C Q U I E S C E. I wish I was more conscientious uh, about the words I fall in love with. Uh, C O N S C I E N T I O U S. Maybe I could even put it together some paraphernalia to give as a gift. Uh, P A R A P H E R N A L I A. Paraphernalia. Sounds like the end of a, like a, like a come on line for words. Paraphernalia. Uh, sorry. It's, uh, Onomatopoeia. O n o m a t o p o e i a. O n o m a t o p o e i a. It's a technique where a word mimics a sound, like in a comic book, uh, or when Antonio Banderas on the show and he says uh, swoosh. I think. Uh, between eight vowels and the fact you only need half the letters to make the pia sound. Uh, I'm going to onomatopoeia. You know, my, so let me just, uh, that's everything. I do want to apologize. I guess I got to make an apology to one word, uh, which I'll, I, I'll, I know I've embarrassed myself as an entrepreneur. Charcuterie? And that's not who I was in love with, though, was it? Uh, it was an epitome. It's gnawing at me. Oh, phlegm. I'm sorry, phlegm. It was gnawing at me, though, Flem, that I uh, couldn't uh, remember you. But it's because, you, I mean, just your meaning is so contradictory to your, like, the way you sound and look. Uh, so I'm sorry I forgot you, Flem. I'm sure I won't. I'm sure I'll be paid back with extra Flem soon. But thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for letting me make an experimental episode. I think this went pretty well. So maybe we'll do more spelling soon. Uh, thanks and good night. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, trees and multiforms. You might be saying, what in the name of the face of Bo? <laughs> no, because it's not the face of Bo, isn't it? Or it's the face of Bo. What in the name of the face of Bo? Because they say, well, wait a second. Is it is the name the face of Bo? Or is the name Bo? And the face is of Bo. If you're confused, you're probably in the right place. Even though I already uh, may know the answer or be able to speculate on the answer to whom is Bo, I couldn't answer it on the essay. If this was, you say, is this, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know what I'm trying to explain. And that means you're in the right place because it's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. Thanks for making it possible, patrons. And uh, thanks to these sponsors is how we're able to be here for you for free twice a week. Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you 
to sleep, we do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights, and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake. It could be thoughts on your mind, things you're thinking about. Thoughts about the past, the present, the future. So thoughts, it could be uh, feelings, anything coming up for you emotionally related to those thoughts. Uh, My thoughts give me feelings, my feelings give me thoughts. It's, uh, they don't quite, they work together. I I would say they conspire together. You know, I don't like to use that word, conspire together, but my thoughts and my feelings, I don't know what, I I do know. (laughs) So thoughts, feelings, conspiring to keep me awake, uh, they try to draw me into it too. They say, it's not a conspiracy. We're just working together. They say, no, no, it seems like my thoughts and my feelings, but it could also be physical sensations. It could be changes in time, temperature, routine. You could be traveling. Your schedule could have changed. Uh, Like, you know, lock, you could have guests. You could be a guest. You could be putting the magic to the test. Uh, You could be, you could have had too much gray stuff, even though if you tried it, it's delicious. I don't know why that po- Well, as soon as I thought of being my guest, uh, you could have watched too much Angel- Angela Lansbury, whether it's movies or her show, one of her many shows. Here's a question that's never come up. I don't think on the podcast before. And please reach out to me. Do, do, do people, co- how many people have cosplayed as an angel, as a character Angela Lansbury has played? I would bet some people. I don't know if the, the Venn diagram. I mean, it's somewhat niche, and I'm not talking about Halloween, but you could do it as Halloween. Is Well, here's the other thing. Is there an Angel Lansbury convention? I hope to goodness there is. If there's not, and you're listening to this, please message me. And after I start the Rom-Com Con convention, or restart it and get a booth, because they think that one already exists, I'm I'm willing to do I mean I'm I'm willing to do it in my imagination so you're welcome to come Lansbury Con I guess this could be an episode idea that's where the, yeah we'll do it uh, th- that's uh, I guess what tonight's episode will be about and what I'll, I'll, I'll yeah we'll we'll figure it out I mean why not lean in maybe Cheryl Sandberg have you ever cosplayed as a would you consider cosplaying at like a uh, is Cabot Cove the place, or is that a cheese or a wine? No answer. My brain doesn't have an answer for that. Uh, we'll we'll have Cabot cheese at at, at, at Cadbury. Not no 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 Lansbury Con, not Cadbury Con. That's different. Sponsor Lansbury Con, uh, sponsored by Cadbury. Because just because they sound similar and in, in, all in Scoots's brain, so uh, we didn't have a problem. How, how'd you get all those corporate sponsors, Scoots? Oh, they're imaginary sponsors of an imaginary event, uh, so not a problem. Okay, so uh, where were we? If you're new, you may be confused. Like, I mean, totally makes sense if you are. But so if you're confused and you're new, I'm, I'm glad you're here. What, oh, whatever's keeping me like, I'd like to take your mind off of that. The way I'm going to do it is getting distracted. But I'm going to send my voice across the deep, dark night. I'm going to use lulling, soothing, creaky dulcet tones, pointless meanders, uh, superfluous tangents. I get to introduce, I don't even, I'm not even, I'm not someone that would actually, I just want, just wanted to point this out and, and uh, level the playing field. Even though I'm supposed to be introducing a sleep podcast, I'm not like I'm not an I'm not not an Angela Lansbury fan, but I've never seen her show, an episode of that show she's really famous for. Don't worry if you're if you're uh, young, I'll explain who Angela Lansbury is because I don't really, I know she was in either Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, or M- Incredible Mr. Limpent, or, um, maybe I mean she was Mrs. Potts and. Is that what is Mrs. Teapot or something in Beauty and the Beast, the animated one? But she was, uh, I don't know, was she, she was in, uh, she's been in movies with Dick Van Dyke. Uh, she may have been in Mary Poppins. 
not positive about any of this, uh, but Angela Lansbury was a beloved actress, and she's succeeded in so many different worlds uh, per, in performance. And so I think it, I'm assuming there already is a conference, but if there isn't, we'll give it its due. And I'll pro- the good thing is I'll learn more about who Angela Lansbury is. I'm not promising to watch any of those shows because uh, they don't really go along with the, the, she was on a famous procedural show called uh, Writing Mysteries, uh, Writing Mysteries, she wrote, uh, Mysteries, she wrote. So, okay, so, um, oh, so I'll explain more. So if you say, who's Angela? It sounds nice, though, don't you think? That sounds like somebody you'd be nice, you'd be like, oh, have you met my mother's friend, Angela Lansbury? You say, do you introduce all your mother's friends by their full names? Uh, I do when it sounds so lovely, when I can say Angela Lansbury. You do. You say, okay, this will be, I'm not trying to, like, I do have, because some of my brain said, Scoots, who's your favorite Angela? And I'd say probably Angela Bassett. I mean, because I just don't know as much about Angela Lansbury, but I would cosplay as Angela, like, I will do an episode about Angela Lansbury. Also, Angela... Uh, it was a twin of the sister who I gave a pencil sharpener to, who I, briefly, like, uh, like I, I thought was my girlfriend in fourth or fifth grade, but wasn't, uh, or maybe was, because Angela was dating my best friend. And so my best friend, who was my best friend at the time, said, well, why doesn't your sister go out with uh, my friend Andy? And... It didn't work out like uh, it was a, it was a, like uh, you've I've talked about it on the show before. Uh, Beaver Lake Nature Center got a pencil sharpener for her. But we also went and bought um, earrings at Kmart. I think I bought her telephone ear, earrings that looked like a telephone or something. Or maybe that's what Bo was buying. Yeah, I think I like I think I bought her. No, you're right. My brain. I bought her some dangling earrings. Bo was buying Angela telephone earrings. And I said, maybe I should buy her sister earrings too. Didn't work out, you know, but I mean, that's, that's why you make a sleep podcast. Oh, but you should start your sleep podcast. You're right. As soon as I my voice across the deep, dark night, use lulling, soothing tones, uh, lulling, soothing, creaky dulcet tones, which is means my voice is not perfect. Pointless meanders and superfluous tangents. You've already heard a couple of those which means I'm going to go off topic and get mixed up and, you know, just do my thing. But all to keep you company while you fall asleep. So if you're new, a few things to know. The most important thing is you deserve a good night's sleep. I'm glad you're here. And I hope you can, I can help you fall asleep because when I've been there, when I've been there, tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep, I got all of those. So I know how it feels. That's why I call it the deep, dark night. I know it can feel lonely frustrating it can be make sleep something you're not looking forward to that you're dreading so if i can help you that would be my honor but also i really believe you deserve a good night's sleep if you get the rest you need your life's going to be more manageable and your world and our world will be a better place that's important to me because it's true you do deserve a place you can get some rest there are a couple things with the show one the first thing is it's very different sounds different doesn't have it never gets started it's always going mike you know i was supposed to introduce the podcast then i invented a new you know humble brag i invented a new convention maybe it may you know the first imaginary convention i've invented today or came up with i don't know i thought i was going to talk about my brain my feelings and my thoughts conspiring against me but uh, clearly i got past that i came up with a ridiculous meander uh, but so this podcast does take some uh, getting used to. Most listeners report, this is like, I'm not kidding, I think I've heard this a million times. Took two or three tries for me to get used to the show. So give it a few tries. There's really nothing to lose. And I only gain if, if you become a regular listener. If the podcast works for you, then it works for both of us. If it doesn't work for you, you can check out sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you. That has other sleep podcasts and stuff on there and sleep audio. But give it a few tries just because it's so different. And what's different about it, one, it's a podcast you don't really listen to. 
just like something that's a little bit out of focus. You say, okay, I kind of barely understand what he's talking about. And also, you just kind of barely listen. And what was the other thing? I don't even remember anymore. Oh, uh, this is a podcast. Oh, I don't put you to sleep. I'm here to keep you company while you fall asleep. I'm here to be your boar friend, your boar bay, your boar sib, your boar cuz, your boar bestie, your boar burr, your neighbor. And so I'm here to help you fall asleep. That's really what I'm here to do is, is, is keep you company, take your mind off stuff, and then you fall asleep. So I guess I'm not here to help you fall asleep. I'm here to keep you company. Uh, the other things that throw people off is the structure of the show, which is very specific, but it is adjustable as you become a regular listener. Though I found more and more people coming back to the traditional structure of the show or using Patreon to, to use the show differently. But it, here's the structure of the show. It starts off with a greeting. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. So you feel seen, you feel welcome. Then I say something silly. So you say, okay, the tone of the show about something serious is a little bit silly. And then there's an intro, or no, then there's support for the show. So the show can come out for free twice a week on every podcast app. That's important to me. And the only thing that makes it possible is the sponsors and the people that support the show and support all the work that we all put into this show, which I appreciate. Uh, Then there's support for the community around the show, for listeners. And then there's an intro, which we're like 10 or 12 minutes into, 14 according to the clock, uh, but some of this will be edited out, believe it or not. And the intro is really a show within a show. Some people, especially when they first listen or they just don't like me in the show, which is understandable, they clump the support for the show and the intro together. But the intro is really like where I'm trying to explain what the podcast is, I'm not succeeding but it's also just supposed to serve as a wind down as part of like listeners are getting ready for bed. They may be doing something else, relaxing. They're getting comfortable. And so th- that's like p- part of the wind down it is uh, to ease you into bedtime, to give you a landing strip. Uh, Cause it just doesn't work for me to just get in bed and fall asleep. I have a wind down routine I take. So some listeners are getting ready for bed. Some people are doing a chill activity. Some people are in bed getting comfortable. There are people that are already asleep. We're happy for all of you. Though We do have a little bit of like whatever sleepy FOMO is. There's like 2% of people that skip ahead to 20 or 30 minutes and start the show there. And then there's an equal amount of patrons, people that support the show online, that either just listen to the intros or just listen to the story portion. So that's kind of interesting that that, uh, for the people that are the most engaged with the podcast, half of them listen to intros and half of them listen to story only. That's not of all the supporters. There's most people listen to the episode straight through. I mean, not in one sitting. There's no wrong way to use the show, even though now I'm explaining different use cases. Uh, But so you could kind of see as you become a regular listener what's going to work. But the intro is a part of it because it eases you into bedtime. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, Then there's support for the show again between the intro and the story. Again, so the show can come out free twice a week. Even though the show sounds free and easy, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And then there'll be our bedtime story, which apparently will be something about Angela Lansbury. I'm excited to find out more. Maybe I'll even watch, like, I'll just do a quick Angela Lansbury search and watch something later. And then there's the thank yous at the end. So that's the structure of show. That's why I make the show. I'm really glad you're here. Or I'm really appreciative of that you're back if you're a regular listener or that you checked the show out on someone's recommendation or you're searching for something to help. Please give it a few tries. I really hope it can help you. I work really hard. I yearn and I strive. I really hope I can help you fall asleep. And here's a couple of ways I'm able to do it for you for free twice a week. Everybody, this is Scoots here and... I don't know what past Scoots, like, I know past Scoots was talking about Angela Lansbury, uh, but sometimes he doesn't write, write everything down. And uh, I know he was talking to, like, Angela Lansbury's famous roles. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, like, uh, like my like knowledge of Angela, A- Angela Lansbury's pretty, pretty limited, Scooter. 
I don't know if you know that, but when you decided to make an entire, but, but, but here's the thing I know, Angel Lansbury is pretty wonderful. So I said, let's learn more and let's just be open-minded and see where it goes from there. So I looked up uh, on Wikipedia, of course, where you say, Scooch, where do you learn more? Where do you, where, what's the definitive reference on Angel Lansbury? And I say, the definitive one? I don't know. I'll probably hear about it uh, when this episode comes out. But the reference I have easy access to, to get a basic overview, uh, thank you, is uh, Angel, uh, uh, Wikipedia. And here's the first thing. This is how um, not, like, a... Uh, Clear I was. Angel Lansbury is an Irish-British actress who's played, uh, she's been, I knew she was in film, theater, music, musicals too, television roles. Uh, she is, uh, she is DBE, uh, so she's royal, royalty at this point. That made me think of uh, the Marple character, Miss Ms. Marple or whatever, but then I said, I can't really, I think we are to push our luck with that one. Because I don't even remember how I was trying to skirt around it. Oh, Miss, was it Miss Marble? I don't know. But uh, so 80 years of career at this point. She's an Academy Award nominee. She uh, was a star in the golden age of Hollywood, according to Wikipedia. Grew up in London. Uh, moved to the United States in 1940, started studying acting, uh, then moved to Hollywood in 42. Uh, she like signed to MGM, uh, and, uh, oh, she was in the picture of Dorian Gray in a movie called Gaslight, uh, in picture of Dorian Gray, she got two Oscar nominations and a Golden Globe. She was in 11 more MGM films, uh. And uh, then her contract ended in 1952. She did supplemental uh, work uh, with theatrical appearances. I don't know what that means. Uh, but she then appeared in 1962 in The Manchurian Candidate, uh, which was uh, met with widespread acclaim and is considered one of her finer performances. Uh, that doesn't have a citation, though. But uh, so if I saw I'm, I'm assuming it is, though. Then moved into musical theater uh, on Broadway. She was in MAME. Ho- holy cow. Okay, so that's where we can go next. Uh, this could be all facts about uh, Angela Lansbury and where it leads. Uh, and uh, she got a Tony Award. Uh, then she moved from California to County Cork in Ireland in 1970, but consider can still continued with uh, theatrical and cinematic performances. She was in leading roles in the musicals Gypsy, Sweeney Todd, The King and I, then Bedknobs and Broomsticks. And we'll talk, cover that one. I, I thought I was going to rewatch that, but I don't remember. I think we started it. Or maybe it was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I don't know if she, that's a good question. I don't know if she was in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I don't see it listed here yet. Uh, Moving into television in 1984, she, uh, this was 1984 when she was on the show, uh, Mystery Writer, Writer of Mysteries. And that ran for 12 seasons in one of the longest running and most popular detective drama series in TV history. Uh, Lan- Lansbury actually assumed ownership of the series and was its executive producer for the final four seasons. Uh, then she moved into voice work. Uh, that probably came up as that's maybe where it came from is, uh, Beauty and the Beast and, and also in Don Bluth's Anastasia. And she toured in a variety of international productions and continued to make film appearances. Nancy McPhee, Mary Poppins Returns. Has received an Academy Award, uh, BAFTA, Tony Awards, Golden Globes, Olivier Award, uh, and then nominated for other things, Best Supporting Actress on three occasions, Primetime Emmy Awards on 18 occasions, and a Grammy Award. And, uh, yeah, she, in 19, 2014, she was made a Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire by Qu- Queen Elizabeth II. She's also had three biographies written about her. So let's go to uh, 
a little bit deeper into her career. Uh, tonight at 8.30, and then was joined, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, I don't know, I don't understand this because I don't have the context, so I'm trying to think. Uh, having gained the job by claiming to be 19 when she was 16, well, she was working at a nightclub in Montreal, earning $60 a week, then returned to New York City in 1942. Uh, then Hollywood, her, she was following her mother, who was trying to re, re, resurrect her cinematic career. Lived in a bungalow in Laurel Canyon. That sounds nice. Lansbury and her mother obtained jobs. They worked at Bullock's Wilshire Department Store. And she was actually, Lansbury maintained her job. $28 a week supported the rest of her family. Uh, then uh, was in Gaslight, which was a mystery thriller in, set in London. It starred Ingrid Bergman as the star, lead role of Paula Alquist. Uh, Angela, Angela Lansbury played the role of Nancy Oliver or Olivier um, and uh, then got an agent, then signed a seven-year contract with Metro Goldwyn Mayer, Mayer uh, that was $500 a week, using her real name as her professional name. Got casting attention in Variety magazine, uh, and then uh, Gaslight. Although Lansbury's role was widely praised, uh, that was the one she got Best Supporting Actress for. Then National Velvet as the older sister of Velvet Brown, and maintained a white, lifelong friendship with Elizabeth Taylor. No, let's open that one just in case. Uh, then was in picture a picture of the picture of Dorian Gray, a cinematic uh, adaptation of Oscar Wilde's novel. Set again in Victorian w London. She played Sybil Vane, a working class music hall singer, singer who falls in love with Dorian Gray. I have not read that novel. I'm reading something now, but that might go on my list. Uh, the film was not a financial success, but Lansbury's performance once more drew praise, got a Golden Globe Award for Best Supporting Actress in a Motion Picture, and uh, that was a nomination but lost to Anne Revere, her co-star in National Velvet. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, then let's see what else we got here established career 1950 to 1960 11 further films till the care contract ended as we talked about keeping up with b-list stars mgm used her less than the smaller similar aged actresses biographers uh these were mediocre films anyway uh some people claim she was miscast repeatedly by mgm and, uh, you know, playing different roles. Uh, and the company then had a slump. Uh, in 1948, started cutting their budgets. Uh, Lansbury played her first American character as M, E M, a honky tonk saloon singer with Ju Judy Garland uh, in the Wild West musical The Harvey Girls. And then she was in The Hoodlum Saint Till the Clouds Roll By, If Winter Comes, 10th Avenue Angel, The Three Musketeers, State of the Union, Red Danube. Then was in a UA film, The Private Affairs of Bellamy, uh, Paramount on Samson and Delilah. Then in uh, Kind Lady in 1951 and Mutiny in 1952. Uh, then was in uh, a few different radio plays, uh, including Pride and Prejudice, and then started on television, Robert Montgomery Presents uh, The Citadel. That was an episode of that. But not happy with those roles, did not re instructed her manager not to, to terminate her contract, uh, and then joined East Coast Touring Productions. This is so cool because this is like someone taking charge of, like, uh, of uh, instead of just, I don't know, this is like changing it up. 
and staying a professional performer. Uh, uh, but yeah, it was in, uh, uh, affair remains to be seen in affairs of the state. Uh, two, uh, two, those are two former broad, oh, Broadway plays, uh, but uh, not happy at this time either. So again, I'm projecting, of course, uh, my, my uh, uh, then, uh, let's see. They mix a lot of personal stuff in here, even though it's supposed to be about career. Return to cinema as a freelance actress uh, and still like, the, um, did not enjoy, like was being miscast and... Uh, she had uh, some roles on different films. Uh, are these films? Or, uh, I mean, it says Hollywood. She played Princess Gwendolyn in the comedy film The Court Jester. Uh, like uh, Steak, Street, Purple were three other movies. And then another movie, uh, in, uh Long Summer, Reluctant Debutante. Uh, and then... Uh, she, those were the last few movies, uh, the summer movie and the debutante movie, really boosted her career again. Throughout this period, she kept going on television in m- m- recurring roles uh, or recurring appearances on Revlon M- Mirror Theater, Ford Theater, the Go- George Goebel Show, and a regular on the uh, game show Pantomime, T- Pantomime Quiz. Uh, then finally got a sympathetic role in the, uh, dark at the top of the stairs, uh, which was critically acclaimed, but then of course it had the other side and all fall down. And then the Manchurian candidate, uh, which was, she was cast in after Frankenheimer saw a performance in all fall down. And let's see what else, uh. She had agreed to appear in the film after reading the novel, one of the most exciting books I ever read. She got her third Best Act Supporting Actress Academy Award nomination for the film, and but she lost to Patty Duke for The Miracle Worker in 1962. Then was in the cool in the cool of the day, uh, World of Henry, Dear Heart. Uh, a lot of her titles are not. Uh, uh, she t- t- turned down some roles, including uh, Nurse, Nurse Ratched in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. She did uh, was in Something for Everyone, 1970. In that same year, she put, she was in Bed Knobs and Broomsticks in 1971. That was her first lead in a screen musical. And she did a lot of publicizing of it, including on the David Frost show. And that secured an enormous audience for me. So then she spent most of the 1970s on stage rather than screen. Uh, Big Farm on the Nile, uh, who, like uh, the Vanishing Something, uh, based on uh, a re- that was a remake. I don't know if this is a film, a mirror one based on Agatha Christie novel. This time is Miss Holy Small World as Miss Marple. So we can't say Miss Marple's Agatha Christie thing. Lady Marple, that's who I was thinking of. Uh, not Miss Marple. That was a character I was wondering about. So then uh, a sleuth in 1950s Kent. Uh, she hoped to get, get get away from the depiction of the role. Uh, instead returning to Christie, oh, that someone else had played. She kind of based on Agatha Christie's description of the character which kind of did it was a precursor to Jessica Fletcher on uh, mystery. I wrote, uh, she was signed on to appear in two sequels as Miss Marple that were never made. And then was in the animated film, the last unicorn. Uh, let's see. Okay. So then 1990 to 2000 doesn't say any, but this is when uh mystery she wrote is running. I think this did this come up because of the um uh if you live in LA or you visit LA and you go on the um Universal Tour you you get to see uh Cabot part of Cabot Cove or once what what was it's considered a, a Amity and Cabot Cove I think or is my memory serving me 
but Lansbury continued on television, miniseries, and cinema. Uh, did the uh, New York Philharmonic's a tribute to the centenary of uh, Statue of Liberty with Kurt Doug- Tur- Kirk Douglas. Uh, was in uh, like uh, something called uh, a- a- Angels with a Frowny Face. Uh, was in a cu- couple other m- m- TV movies, I think. Uh, Shell Seekers. Uh, the Love She Sought. Uh, uh, Miss Harris Goes to Paris. Uh, there's a rhyme. Uh, and uh, that was an adaptation of a novel. That was her highest profile. Oh, no. Her highest profile cinematic role was as Mrs. Mrs. Potts in Beauty and the Beast, which uh, she considered a gift to her three grandchildren. And the title song to the film won the Academy Award for Best Original Song, Golden Globe for Best Original Song, Grammy Award for Best Song Written for Motion Picture, Television, or Other Visual Media. And also made a surprise appearance uh, on, uh, in 2021, inspiring Walt Disney, the animation of French decorative arts at the Metropolitan Museums of Art's first ever exposition about, uh, exhibition about uh, Walt Disney and Studios. Was also in films in uh, Nancy McPhee in 2005. Uh, and that really was a positive experience for her. Then in Mr. Popper's Penguins with Jim Carrey, uh, was said to be in Grand Budapest Hotel. Holy mackerel. Uh, but had scheduling conflicts, uh, with the Australian production of Driving Miss Daisy, which she co-starred in with James Earl Jones, uh, then got an honorary Academy Award, uh, prevented, presented to her by Robert Osborne, Emma Thompson, and Jeffrey Rush also were offered tributes. Then was in Miss Poppins Returns, the sequel. And, uh, what else we got? Uh, was invited to the AFI, AFI oh, uh, spoke about some of her other experiences. Okay, now we get into theater, which is, so it's kept separate. So I guess we'll go theater, Broadway. But, uh, yeah, so theater from uh, Breakthrough was in uh, Hotel Paradiso uh, in 1957 on Broadway at the Henry Miller Theater. It only ran for 15 weeks, but she got good reviews. Uh, then was in A Taste of Honey at the Lyceum Theater. Uh, and uh, let's see what else we got. It got a great deal of satisfaction from that role and uh, developed uh, a friendship with uh, Lawrence Olivier and Joan Plowright. Uh, lived on East 97th Street. Uh, was in the summer of the 17th Doll. Uh, a Breath of a Scandal, Blue Hawaii, with uh, uh, Elvis Presley playing. Uh, that's a play? I don't know. It was in Anyone Can Whistle, uh, which was short-lived, but it was uh, written by, like, Stephen Sondheim was involved. Uh, uh, she appeared in a second season episode of The Man from Uncle, The Greatest Story Ever Told, which is a biop. Uh, uh, Ma Flanders, Harlow, Mr. Budwig. These are films, though, so this is <laughs> jumping around. Uh, this is all, this is like Wikipedia made for Sleep With Me. She was in musical cinema, including The Pirates of Penzance. Uh, I saw that movie. A few times. I didn't get it, but, uh, like, on repeat or something as a kid. She was in a gothic fantasy film, The Company of Wolves, in 84. Little Gloria, Happy at Last. Uh, the Gift of Love, A Christmas Story. A Talent for Mystery, 1984, as a mystery writer, which she's considered a rush job, but Laurence Olivier was in it, uh, she was in Lace in the First Olympics in 1984. And then she played Mame Dennis in Mame, which made uh, Jerry Herman's uh, musical adaptation of Auntie Mame. 
which my dad was in in the community theater, which I think has come up in a couple of episodes, including a repeat uh, not that long ago. Uh, she actively sought the role in hopes that it would mark a change in her career. It, theater critics were surprised. They thought it would go to a better known actress. Uh, and it was her first starring role. And I was trying to explain my ta- to my daughter, actually, the character of uh, Mame. She's a gl- glamorous character, 20 costume changes in the, in the, in the Broadway play. Ten songs, uh, dance routines. First appeared in uh, Philadelphia, then Bo- Boston, and then uh, at the Winter Garden Theater in 1966 in Broadway. And really gained, gained uh, uh, Angela Lansbury a big following, overwhelmingly positive, and uh, made her a superstar, according to some of her biographers. Everyone loves you. Everyone loves the success, enjoys it as much as you do. And that letter to be on Perry Cuomo, Cuomo's uh a Thanksgiving special in 1966. Uh, she used to also use as a jumping off point to raise money for uh, organizations. Uh, she was invited to star in, in the 1968 Academy Awards uh, and uh, in a musical performance and host co-host uh, that year's Tony Awards. Harvard University's Hasty Pudding Club elected her Woman of the Year. When the film adaptation of Maine was put in production, she was offered the part, but it went to Lucille Ball. Oh, she hoped to be offered the part, uh, but Lucille Ball was a more established uh, box office. Uh, Lansbury considers this a big disappointment. Uh, she followed her success in Maine as uh, in uh, Dear World, a musical adaptation of... Uh, Something else, uh, but did not enjoy the experience. The reviews were positive, and she secured her second Tony Award uh, of her performances, but the reviews of the show were not great. Uh, then she was in uh, Pretty Bell. Uh, then, uh, then, set, oh, then, uh, 1970. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. In 1972, returned to London's West End, performing the Royal Shakespeare Company's uh, uh, performance of uh, Albies all over. And uh, then she had a reluctant involvement. That This was following her reluctant involvement, a revival of Maine, touring the United States. Uh, then played Rose and Gypsy on the West End. She initially turned down the role, didn't want to be in the shadow of Ethel Merman, who played the Broadway version, and got rave reviews, standing ovation in May 1973. And she was soon in demand among London society, having dinners held in her honor. And then Gypsy went on tour in the U.S. in Chicago, Oh, and, and in Chicago was awarded the Sarah Siddons Award for her performance. Eventually got back to Broadway, where it was a critical success, third Tony Award. And then toured the country again in 1975. Then she needed a break from the musicals, uh, and uh, she was a Gertrude in Hamlet. Uh, let's see what else, uh, was in a few, another one, uh, two one act plays by Al, Edward Albee, uh, way counting the ways and listening. Then another revival tour of gypsy, then 24 performances of the King and I, um, taking over somebody who's on break. Then on, uh, sleeping on the Nile, which is an Agatha Christie adaptation and Betty Davis and uh, I think Betty Davis was in that too. Then was in Sweeney Todd in 1979, uh, which uh, let's see, she jumped on the roll being a Sondheim project, uh, and loved the wit and intelligence of the lyrics, uh, remained in that role for 14 months. 
and uh, got fourth Tony. Uh, then kind of went on some a little family business. Uh, what else here? Then she was in, inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame. Then appeared in another main revival at the Gershwin, but the show did not. It wasn't commercially successful. It's more of a period piece, not a show of today, Lansbury noted. 2001 returned after a mystery she wrote. She returned to Broadway in the musical The Visit. Uh, and she thought she was going to take a break uh, um, from a role. You know, had a bunch of family things going on. But returned to a, in a play by Terrence McNally, the uh, Deuce, not The Deuce, just Deuce. And received a Tony nomination for that one. She was in Blythe, Blythe Spirit uh, in 2009. Got a Tony Award uh, for Best Featured Actress in a Play, her fifth Tony. Uh, then uh, was in something, let's see, all of, uh, let's see, 20, 2009. She was in something with Catherine Zeta-Jones, a revival of A Little Night Music, seventh Tony nomination, and then she got a doctoral degree from the Manhattan School of Music, who then returned to the West End in Gore Vidal's The Best Man. Then that's when she did the Australian tour of Driving Miss Daisy in uh, 2013 with James Earl Jones. Then she returned to 2014 to Blythe Spirit, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It was even in the tour across North America. Got the Olivier Award in uh, 2015 at 89. And uh, in 2016 was announced it would return to Broadway in uh, the Chalk Garden. Uh, but then Lansbury decided, uh, I don't know, I'm going to think I'm going to not, I'm going to keep taking a break, hang with my family. In 2019, Lansbury returned to Broadway portraying, portraying Lady Bracknell in, uh, from, uh, the importance of being earnest for roundabout theater. And, uh. She, uh, yeah, then television. So this is totally, uh, so sleep with me. So in television, let's see, uh, Lansbury, uh, was, uh, offered a 1983 in Norman Lear sitcom with Charles Durning and then a detective, uh, series, uh, and unable to do both. She decided to do the detective series. Despite the fact her agents told her to do the sitcom, the series mystery she wrote, she played Jessica Fletcher. We'll look that up. Uh, we'll learn more about that. Uh, who was a mystery novelist, uh, solving mysteries, encountered. So she was writing mysteries and solving mysteries. An American Miss Marple. And the, the team that made it had made Columbo. Uh, first, the role was offered to Gene Stapleton, who declined the role, as did Doris Day. And uh, his premiere, uh, which had to do with Sherlock Holmes, came out in 1984. It was on Sundays from 8 to 9 p.m. And it was highly popular. Critical reviews were mixed. It got a Nielsen rating of 18.9, top rated in its time slot. Inoffensive family viewing. Despite it, it, like despite the topic, the the show was uh, very mild and followed a who done it format, uh, and you know nothing to keep you up at night. So kind of sleep with me. Protect Lansbury was protective of Jessica Fletcher and had creative input over her costumes, makeup, hair, and would not you know submit to pressure from network executives. That wanted her to be in a relationship. She wanted to be a strong single female. And she believed that a script writer had made uh, things, if she would disagree, you know, with the script and ask for it to be changed if it was not within the character. And she said it was a role model for older female viewers. And it was even called a television landmark, uh, maybe even paved the way for the Golden Girls. And, uh, 
it gradually gained a younger audience. It says by 1991, one third of the audience was under 50 years old. It outdid many things in the same time slot, even Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories. Uh, there was even a spinoff in 1987. It looks like she was in MAME with B. Arthur. We'll find out. Uh, and then, you know, as it continued, she took over uh, in 1989, co-producing the show. But she did kind of, you know, it was long hours uh, and thought like by 1991, it would be, the show would be ending. But then she became an executive producer in 92, 93. And the show setting moved to New York City in the eighth season where Jessica had taken a job at Manhattan University teaching. And that was an attempt to, to get more younger viewers. It, it became, you know, it was a Sunday night institution and the show's ratings improved during the early 90s, uh, but CBS executives moved it to Thursdays at 8 p.m. There's not a good move. Opposite Friends, uh, Lansbury was not happy. And the show finally ended in 1996. Uh, Angela Lansbury voicing a goodbye from Jessica Message at the end. And... Uh, it was uh, it kind of like uh, everybody was focused on youth and the youth demographic at the time. But the role was very prominent. Um, uh, let's see. What else? Uh, there was uh, Mrs. Santa Claus, in which Lansbury played Santa Claus's wife, which was a hit. Uh, Lansbury was in different TV commercials. Uh, and even spinoffs of, uh, you know, things related to her success. Uh, was guests on uh, other TV shows that you like where uh, Order, Legal Order, uh, those shows. BBC miniseries she, she produced, she played Aunt March uh, on Little Women. And I think that's everything of uh, her thing. So let's go to... Um, Mame next uh, because this is like a m musical that uh, I saw three or four times when my dad was in it, uh, and I had no reference. Uh, but it, it was telling my daughter it was kind of a, like a plot device back then. So it was originally titled "My Best Girl." It's based on a 1955 novel. Oh, written by Patrick Dennis uh, in a f 1956 play. It's set in New York City, spans the Great Depression, WW2. Uh, eccentric bohemian Mame Dennis, uh, whose motto is life is a banquet and most people don't eat, you know, don't eat their fill. She lives a fabulous life with wealthy friends, which is interrupted when the son of her, the young son of her brother comes to live with her, Patrick, uh, and they cope with the depression in a series of adventures. It was also a film, but uh, it opened on Broadway in 1966 with Angela Lansbury and B. Arthur. Oh, yeah, because she has a best friend, I think, that she plays off of. Uh... Oh, it was, oh, it was 58, it was a film, and 74. The Lucille Ball role was in 1974. Okay, the musical was inspired by the success of the play. Uh, and the Broadway was at the Winter Garden Theater. There was national tours. I don't think that, I don't know if this covers the plot adaptation. Oh, here's the synopsis. So Dane, um, Madam Dane, Mame, Mame Dennis. I don't know where, where my brain is. Uh, she's in a clique. Ten-year-old Patrick uh, is entrusted to her care. And she, now, so, so when I saw it, it was a theater, a community theater at a retirement community where my dad lives. So everyone, my dad was playing a boy. He was playing the teen, ver, like, so there was a little kid who played the little Patrick, like an actual 10 year old. But for the rest of the play, it was played by my dad who played like the high school, college and adult Patrick. She, yeah, she, she uh, introduces a boy to her freewheeling lifestyle uh, Agnes Gooch is, uh, I don't know if that's her best friend. That says Mame's personal secretary and nanny-in-law. Vera Charles, oh, that's her bosom buddy and a partier. 
and Dwight Babcock, uh, who's the one who has control of her brother's estates. So, yeah, and it's like a kind of like a, a pretty basic advice, like a fish out of, you know, like a fish out of water for both of them. Patrick's just a kid, goes to live with uh, Mame. Mame's like it's living a single party life, kind of like with plenty of money. Then they lose everything in 1929. And Mame tries to get jobs, but she always has good humor and an irrepressible sense of style, according to Wikipedia. Mame, oh, so Mame gets married to a Southern aristocrat. Uh, for some reason, I thought Patrick gets married at some point, though, too, I think. Uh, oh, Patrick goes to boarding school, St. Boniface in Mach Ma Massachusetts, an imaginary school. Mame and Bo travel the world on an endless honeymoon. Then Bo visits a big farm during the honeymoon, but Mame's a wealthy widow. But Patrick is engaged. Uh, he's become a snob, I guess. He's engaged to a debutante, Gloria Upson. Her family's not open-minded at all, pretty close-minded. Uh, and Mame kind of gets Patrick's mind open. Then he meets another woman who becomes his wife. Uh, and in the end, uh, Mame is hanging out with Pete Patrick's son, Peter, uh, with her usual flair. It's going to go through the num songs, uh, Overture, then St. Bridget with Patrick and Agnes. Uh, then It's Today, which is Mame, Vera, and Company. Then open a new window. This must be when Patrick comes. Mame, young Patrick, and company. Then the moon song, the man in the moon, Vera, Maine, and, Mame, and company. Then my best girl, M young Patrick, and Mame. Then we need a little Christmas. I don't know if that's that song. We need a little Christmas right this very moment. Let's look that up next. That's uh, young Patrick, Agnes, Ito, and Beauregard, and Mame. Fox Hunt, Uncle Jeff, Uncle Patrick, Cousin Fan, Mother Burnside. Then Mame, Beauregard and Company. That must be when he falls for Mame. Final Act One, My, my Best Girl and Mame and Young Patrick and Company. Intra Octa before Act Two. Then opening Act Two, The Letter, Young Patrick and Older Patrick. Then a reprise of My Best Girl with Older Patrick, would have been my dad. Bosom Buddies with Mame and Vera. Gooch's song with Agnes Gooch. Uh, that's how young I feel, Mame, Junior and Company. If you walked into my life, Mame. It's Today, reprise, Mame and Company. My Best Girl, reprise with Older Patrick. Final act two, open a new window, all. Then curtain calls, it's today, we need a little Christmas in Mame. Yeah, that is, uh, it's from, uh, that is, it's a popular Christmas tune. We need a little Christmas, uh, which makes sense because it was written during, yeah, 1929. Now, bed knobs and Broomsticks. I get this movie and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang mixed up along with uh, some one of those Christmas movies, uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. And I guess I saw this on repeat or something. It, was, it came out before my time, but I definitely saw this when I was a kid. It's a animation and uh, what do they call it? Well, they'll tell us. Uh, 1971, uh, Walt Disney... It was loosely based on books, Magic Bed Knob, or How to Become a Witch in Ten Easy Lessons, and Bonfires and Broomsticks by Mary Norton. Uh, during the night, it was entered development, like uh, during the negotiations for Mary Poppins, when those were placed on hold. And then it was shelled because it was too similar to Mary Poppins. Uh, it was originally 139 minutes long, then it was edited to under two hours before its premiere. The Sherman Brothers composed the songs. It was released in 1971 in mixed reviews. Like they liked the live action animated sequence. Uh, five Academy Awards, best visual, special visual effects at one. It was the last film released uh, before uh, 
prior to uh, Roy O. Disney visiting his brother at Big Farm. Uh, let's see. It was restored. Oh, 1996. It was restored with most of its deleted material put back in. There was a stage adaptation. So and it takes place in 1940 with Charlie, Carey, and Paul. They leave London. Oh, yeah. I remember starting this out because I just read a book about London in 1940 and watched a documentary. So the children, they want to go back to London, but they're supposed to be living out there. They see this lady flying on a broomstick. They change her mind. Uh, she reveals she's going to a correspondence school. Yes, there's a lot of funny stuff. Uh, and she wants to help the British, uh, defeat the, 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 you know, the, the people that are up to no good. She even has a transportation spell. She'll teach them to keep silence so that, uh, she, uh, figures out on the bed knob, uh, only Paul can work the spell. Then their school's closed, uh, she does, so she can't learn the final spell. She turns the bread, bed into something. They go to London to find the professor. And, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, uh, so, yeah, I remember meeting the professor. And they go to a magical land. The bed goes underwater. And so, I don't know. Uh, yeah, eventually they teach the kids a bunch of stuff. Uh, let's just close out with mystery. She wrote uh, a little bit about it. Uh, I wonder if it has uh, not the facts, So Let's see the premise. So we talked about the ending, the cast, uh, regular cast. I want to let learn about Cabot Cove, though. So what am I, my thing is, is that really where it was set? I'm almost positive Uh if there's a Wikipedia article on Cabot Cove, uh, I don't know if there is. So I'm searching searching for Cabot Cove. Uh, let's see. It's mostly produced in Universal Studios, Universal City, California. Exterior shots, uh, some of them in Mendocino, oh, which also stood in for the main town of Cabot Cove. So they did some exterior shots on location but that's all about Cabot Cove. That's there. That's unfortunate. Tom Bosley was in it for the first uh, four seasons. Uh, that's interesting. Tom Bosley uh, from 1984 to 1988. So Tom Bosley was in Happy Days, which we were, I was watching with my parents. And uh, what is that thing called? It's like an app. You can watch free TV from the, like, it's kind of like Nick at night in the app version. Pl Plasma or something. Pluto, Pluto TV. And I said, I had, I like, I had to leave the room because it was like bringing up too many, like, I couldn't remember. Like it, whenever happy days was airing, I must've been a child. So, but Tom Bosley was on that show. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. Yeah. He was on happy days. Uh, the sitcom Happy Days, which was like a 1950s sitcom that was out in the 70s, maybe. Let's see. Happy Days is uh, yes, American sitcom. It was on TV from 74 to 84. 255 half-hour episodes, 11 seasons. Gary Marshall. It was an idealized vision of life in the 50s and 60s in the Midwest U.S. Ron Howard, Henry Winkler, Tom Bosley, Marion Ross, Anson Williams. Uh, it was an unsold pilot originally. Howard Ross and Anson Williams uh, loving the television set and then loving the happy days. And then... George Lucas cast Howard in uh, American Graffiti, which ABC took a second look at the pilot. And then they focused it on the dilemmas of innocent teenager Richie Cunningham. Who would have thought we got from Angela Lansbury to Happy Days? Oh, and that leads to Laverne and Shirley and Mork and Mindy, which were spinoffs from that. Laverne and Shirley, I highly recommend. I'm, I wonder if there's a Laverne and Shirley. That went from 1976 to 1983. Uh, you got so many great people in that. Penny Marshall, Cindy Williams, Michael McKean, 
David Lander and uh, a couple other people uh, played uh, like other recurring roles. Uh, it was a physical comedy. In its third season, it was the most watched American television program. Six Golden Globes, one M- Emmy. It was a spinoff of Happy Days. Its two lead characters were introduced uh, as acquaintances of Fonzie, Henry Winkler. Uh, they, uh, uh, let's see, set in the roughly the same period, 1958 to 1967, made for Paramount by Gary Marshall, along with Lowell Gantz and Mark Rothman and, uh, Michael Eisner. According to Michael Eisner, Cindy Williams had refused to do a Laverne and Shirley spinoff, uh, but her role was cast with Liberty Williams, no relation they did a screen test, but they said no way. And they eventually got her to be a co-star with Penny Penny Marshall, uh, co-star of the series. And uh, the Shamil Schmeichel, Hoffman, Hoffman Puffer Incorporated, which is a Yiddish-American hopscotch chant, uh, which leads the series theme song, Making Our Dreams Come True. Shamil Shemazel. Awesome Pepper Incorporated, probably saying it wrong. Uh, the hopstock, hopscotch chant is uh, is from Penny Marshall's childhood. It was set in Milwaukee for the first five seasons. Uh, they worked as bottle cappers at the Schatz Brewery. And uh, yeah, I think that's a nice place to close out. Uh, Angela Lansbury. All the way to Penny Marshall. Those are two uh, amazing, amazing. So thanks, Angel Lansbury. We didn't get any fan fiction of yours. We just got, I don't know. This was interesting to take a little journey uh, through uh, Angel Lansbury's career and it led us to a couple other uh, little meanders. So thanks and good night. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for the podcaster who's wearing a watch, uh, but I don't need, you know what time it is. It's time for me to go off topic, get mixed up. It's time for me to keep you company. Uh, cause you, cause, uh, that's kind of what I do. That's, uh, also, I was trying to think of more witty things to say about not having a watch. Uh, you're here just in time for me to go off topic and get mixed up. And if you say, I don't know what you're talking about. I thought this was a sleep podcast meant to keep you company. So you're not alone in the deep, dark night to take your mind off stuff so you could fall asleep. You're the most important part of the show. But this podcast is very different. Uh, not, not for everybody. Give it a few tries. See how it goes. The structure show is uh, I'm going to do uh, some support for the podcast. Then there'll be an intro to help you ease you into bedtime. And there'll be an episodically modular bedtime story you could listen to in any order. And it's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. And uh, thanks for making it possible, patrons. Uh, here you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep. Well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights, and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside... Whatever is keeping you awake, whether it's uh, thoughts, you know, things on your mind, like things you're thinking about, about the past, present, future, that comes up for me. Thoughts, uh, they come up, uh, they're thoughts. Uh, always, uh, uh, <laughs> you've heard me say it, if you heard me say it once, you heard me say it a thousand times. Yeah, I'll be thinking about what I just said uh, for a thousand more. It doesn't even make it as thoughts, so thoughts, uh, feelings, anything coming up for you emotionally related to the thoughts or that are just there, whatever it is, uh, like, uh, you know, feelings about thoughts or feelings about feelings. It could be physical sensations, it could be changes in time, temperature, routine, uh, whatever's keeping awake. It could be a lot of different stuff. And and by the way, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. 
I wish you weren't going through whatever you were going through that is keeping you up, but I'm glad you're here. And there's a lot of other listeners that are glad you're here or glad you found the show. And hopefully it'll work for you and help you out because you deserve a good night's sleep. That's why I make the show. And while whatever is keeping you up or whatever you're you're going through or, or whether it's just temporary or situational or something that's been kind of ongoing for a while, I might not have experienced it, but for, for a lot of uh, people that listen to the show, including me, I, I kind of might, uh, there's a good chance I know how it feels. And that's why I'm here to help uh, where I can. And that's why I see there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people listening too that are like, I'm glad you're here. I really hope this podcast helps you. And that's why like so many people recommend the show when it's helped them. And I appreciate that so much. So thank you for checking the podcast out and thank you for recommending the podcast or thanks for just trying it. Uh, and I do hope it helps you. Now, the one thing to know is this podcast just doesn't work for everybody. So kind of give it a few tries and I'm going to try to explain everything to you of what to expect and why the show's so different. That may even put you to sleep, believe it or not. For a percentage of people, they're already dozing off, and we're happy for them, really. No, we really are. We're just slightly jealous at the same time. So uh, so how does this show work? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is try to create a safe place, as I said, where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake. I'm going to smooth it. I'm going to pat it. I'm going to rub it down. I'm going to say safe place. Then I'm going to send my voice across to the deep, dark night. I'm going to use lulling, soothing, creaky dulcet tones, pointless meanders, superfluous tangents. So I'm going to go off topic. I'm going to get mixed up and all to keep you company and to take your mind off of stuff. And creaky dulcet tones kind of means that my voice is not traditionally soothing. It's a voice you could just kind of listen to. You say, well, the voice isn't bad. Not great. Not bad either. Creaky doll, you know, not memorable. That sleep podcast. I remember forgetting it. Uh, I don't even know what he was talking about. Uh, so, yeah, that's the goal of the show. Really, that's hopefully what you're, you're, you're better. You say, hey, did you check out that sleep podcast the uh, the person told you about? Oh, yeah, I, I, sl- I think I slept great. I don't even remember. I barely remember listening to the podcast. It was some dude he had a... Uh, Grapey, grape, grapey, uh, something, do- domes or something. Why was he talking about grapey, dump, dump, do- grape, grapey donut domes or something? He was talking about that on his podcast. It doesn't, I've never even heard of that. It didn't make any sense. Put me right to, well, it didn't put me right to sleep. At first, I kind of smiled. It was like, not pity. But I kind of felt something for him, like, oh, okay, uh, this guy doesn't know where he's, this guy's spinning his wheels, like a character in a text-based adventure. Shout out to anybody that's played a text-based adventure uh, and then got the answer. Look, look, try to pull on the string. You're spinning your wheels doing that. That's what, uh, it, that's, it'll take too much to explain, but I'm sure you can play a text-based adventure. I'm sure they're available in the app store. Here's one I haven't really played very much of. Zork was like the first big text-based adventure. I think that like a breakout hit. Zork, yeah. And uh, I may be wrong also. A lot of times I'm wrong when I say stuff, especially when I say stuff definitively like that. And you see, yeah, he was trying to describe what I was talking about at breakfast. Then he was t- Then he managed to not explain what a text-based adventure is. Uh, but then he tried a video game without the video that's just text-based. Uh, they were around before and after video games. Maybe even, they were maybe even invented it. One, one time probably pen pals might have done it, but that would have taken super long, like a pen pal-based uh, chess game. But And maybe that's where it came. And one of the answers, when you're doing something that was not going to work out, uh, or, or they said, try, instead of saying, try something else, this definitely won't work, but you may be close. They'd say, you're spinning your wheels looking at that. Or he'd say, pull pull on the string, and it'd say, uh, 
The string does nothing. Pull on the string twice. Uh, the str- nothing happens. Pull on the string three times. It would have to be pretty smart to say, you're spinning your wheels doing that. Probably a bad example, too. I'm spinning my wheels making, and I'm trying to make a metaphor and an analogy about spinning my wheels at that. Uh, also, at the time, I didn't really realize what spinning your wheels meant, but I think what it means now, and actually, I'm not kidding. This may sound like I'm trying to be funny. This is the first time I realized what it meant. I, I mean, I, somewhere, some part of my brain knew what it meant, but not the conscious me. I was always like, huh, what does that even mean? Spinning my wheels looking at that. Because you're not in a vehicle, to me, it didn't make any sense. If you were driving, I'd say, oh, okay, makes perfect sense to me. But in most of these te- tech space adventures, let me just give an example. Because I think the first, oh, you know what was the one I played was uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the first thing you had to do is get out of bed and drink water and take an aspirin because you were hung over. I don't know what that has to do with anything. But that would have been it. You wake up in bed. You have a throbbing headache. Uh, the sun is, you know, ri- rise. You look at, you know, you look at the clock. Oh, it's 1240. There's a the sound of a construction equipment. Uh, you're, you know, and then you say, okay, grab a water, drink some, a- take some aspirin. You see, well, it'd say, look around the room. There's a sparkling glass of water, a jar of aspirin, your alarm clock, your wind, the rest of the room is a normal bedroom as you might imagine it. You Now, you may be saying, I thought I was at a sleep podcast uh, and not in a text-based adventure. And I'd say, you're right, uh but uh, this is more of a, a meander-based adventure, uh, which could, to, could, like, I don't know if text space adventures are good for that. Maybe. I don't know. I'm going to have to play one, but I don't know when I'm going to find time. But this podcast is meant to keep you company and take your mind off stuff so you could fall asleep. As I said at the beginning, it doesn't work for everybody. And, of course, you're going to be skeptical or doubtful. Now, if you already know this isn't going to work for you, you could check out sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you. Uh, check that out and, and see 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 if there's anything else. There's other sleep podcasts and sleepy stuff on there. Uh, what else is uh, Sleep With Me Podcast? Oh, so this, this podcast, it doesn't really put you to sleep. It's more here to keep you company while you fall asleep. And if you can't sleep, you should know I'll be here at the very end to keep you company, whether you're awake or asleep. So it's kind of weird. This is a podcast you could listen to if you need to or if you need a break during the day. But you also don't need I don't expect you to listen. So you could listen to me like background noise or you could listen to me because that's really what I'm here. I'm not here to put you to sleep. I'm here to keep you company. Even if you barely listen, I'm here to be your boar friend, your boar bay, your boar sib, your boar cuz, your boar bestie, your boar burr, your neighbor, your boar bud, whatever it is. I'm here to be your friend in the deep dark night that you don't have like that. Yeah, just tell me about your, tell me about a text based adventures. They'd say, well, I think I got to the end of that subject. Uh, look around. You haven't got, or think, you could never say, think about it. Uh, like, put some, how about the character does some work? I'm doing all this typing here. Think about it. Uh, you thought, you've thought for a bit, uh, but nothing's changed. That would probably be the answer. So, uh, and here's the thing. Like, I'm late to it. I think five or six years ago, text based adventures were cool again. Now they're probably, now that I'm talking about it, you'd say, well, you might as well, like, literally, like, uh, that's what, but that's how I buy my clothes. I buy them for 10 years from now, even though I'm, you see, if Scoots was wearing that 10 years ago, right, when it was out of fashion, like I just got some waffle-based, waffle short shorts. Uh, you see, I don't think those, which you got shorts made out of waffles? No, but that would be, I mean, would that ever go out of style? Yeah, if you were around any birds, it would be out of style pretty fast. You'd be without shorts. Okay, so where was I? Oh, it's a podcast you don't really listen to. It doesn't really put you to sleep. Can you give me some more good news? I'm new to this podcast. Uh, I was hoping to fall asleep. Well, you will. Uh, I'm here to take your mind off of stuff. But the show also has a very different structure that I want to fill you in on. 
uh, because it's a specific structure that you can adjust as you become a regular listener. But you might want to try the structure out. Try it on for size. Put it on like a, a waffle material or, you know, put it on like a, like a, I don't know how you'd make waffle pants uh, or waffle. You definitely be better off making waffle shorts and then seeing if that worked before you went for the pants. You say, no, no, first I developed waffle, waffle shorts. I called them waffles, but that was only because I mispronounced it. Then I tried, then I made a uh, waffle capris and now I've moved on to waffle pants. Uh, what are you going to do next? Huh? Uh, I don't know. I may probably, uh, have some breakfast. I don't have like, uh, obviously I sacrificed a lot of breakfasts for this clothing. Uh, but so, oh, so structure shows very different. Starts off with a greeting, friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. And I say something silly. So you feel seen and welcome in, but you get the tone of the show is good natured. And a little bit fun, not so serious. Uh, then there's support for the show, so it can be free or paying for it can be optional. So that anybody that wants to listen can listen. There's almost 500 episodes you could listen to for free. Uh, then there's support for listeners who are having a tough time. And then there's support for communities around the show. That's the kind of support part of the start of the show. Then there's the intro, which we're into, which is separate from the support. And the intro is actually a show within a show. And you kind of heard it. Never, uh, It's never gone this way before. Every time it goes different, it follows the same general structure where I try to explain what the podcast is unsuccessfully. Uh, and then I go off on a bunch of tangents. Uh, and the, that is uh, fun for regular listeners. What I, you know, I've never talked about make, putting making waffles into clothes that I remember, right, regular listeners? Some of them might not even remember because a few percentage of people, like I said, are already asleep. But a lot of listeners use the intro to wind down as part of their bedtime routine, whether they're getting ready for bed, they're doing some other relaxing activity, or they're in bed getting comfortable, the intro gives you a space between being awake and going to sleep uh, that's uh, been proven to work over and over again. It's like the one piece of consistent bedtime advice. Have a wind down. Have a little twilight. Have a landing strip. And that's what the intro does. So that's the intro. Because some people say, oh, it's part of the business, or is it self congratulate I say, no, this is definitely... Well, I was congratulating myself on imagining I was a waffle clothing designer and that I had iterated. Uh, and it, now I'm probably pretty proud of the fact that I use the word iterated. Pro, pro, well, probably not correctly. Is it iteration if you're going from short shorts to board shorts to capris to pants? Are those iterations or are they just uh, different pieces of clothing? Some part of my brain said, you're an iteration. And I'd say, uh, I said, you're, you're, that's funny. Uh, that's a real fun, that's a good burn. Uh, uh, why, like, uh, I'm, I'm blushing. My brain just got me so good. You're an iteration. You see, people tell, say that all the time when I'm, hey, iteration. It has less syllables, so I think. Uh, they start out like that. Uh, but I don't think they're saying iteration iteration maybe there can be yeah it does not go there because my brain just thought of more jokes based on my uh based on iter and ration i say no 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 let's just skip that uh so uh oh, what was my point i have no idea i was making imaginary waffle oh so regular listeners get to hear the intro but they know they don't have to listen they just kind of listen as they're getting ready for bed, as they're drifting away or, or, you know, winding down. So there's a couple percentage of people that skip the intro, a couple percentage of people that fall asleep during it. But for the most part, people listen to the intro to, to, to turn the dial on the day down. Then again, there's more support so the show can be free, sponsor support. And come out twice a week. And then there's our story. Tonight it'll be a tale of the tape, a look at a Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring. Do I remember it? Here's one piece of gold I'll tell you right here. 
there's a pretty strong possibility I already did this, and I don't rem- I don't even remember recording it. So I rec- I'm going to record it. So so it's like I probably and maybe I already did a tell the tape trying to remember Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring, and I forgot. So not only did I forget the plot of the movie, but I forgot if I recorded that episode. So that should be fun. So, but maybe I didn't. I said, did I, have I done this already? I know I've talked about hobbits and stuff. So we'll do that. Then there's some thank yous at the end. So this is a structure show. That's why I make this show. Like I said, give it a few tries. You got nothing to lose. The show's free. It's here to help you. So just see how it goes. I hope it can help you out. I hope it can uh, give you the rest you need and you deserve. I really appreciate you checking the podcast out. I really hope I can help you fall asleep. Thanks again for coming by. And here's a couple of ways I'm able to do it for you for free twice a week. All right, everybody. Uh, it's time to do something I haven't recorded in a long time. And we're going to cover the movie uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring. And part of the reason I'm doing this, I was like, geez, trying to figure out movies that came out... Uh, what I presume is the aughts, but I really don't know. So I probably should look that up. Uh, and also, at some point here, maybe before this even comes out, uh, there'll be what I think is a Lord of the Rings TV, like streaming, like a streaming pro show or a super extended film. So I'm talking about the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to remember what I can of the first movie. I will say that I've seen the movie, like this will be, be even more embarrassing because I've seen the extended version in the last three years. And I would say I've seen it twice in the last three to five years, probably in the last three years since I bought the extended version. I probably watched it once alone and then watched it with my daughter and then watched about half of the two towers with my daughter before she said, uh, there's still three more hours in this part of the thing. And I said, that sounds like something someone from Rohan would say. And she said that even in the context of the film, actually that part never happened, but, uh, so I can remember seeing this in the movie theater, uh, a Grand Lake theater in Oakland, and in preparation, I reread the books, uh, though I don't really, like at this point, my mind is, uh, but I remember, and I think it was one of those things where I didn't know if the idea was, like, I can remember where I was when I bought uh, a used mass market paperback version of The Fellowship of the Rings. I was in um, a... Uh, a, what is that place called? It's like a used, like a like a secondhand store. The kind of mass market paperback you buy at a secondhand store. Something town, thrift town, I think. I think it was called somewhere in the East Bay, Hayward, San Leandro. And uh, I was looking through their books, saying, or maybe I was in, I don't know. I can kind of picture it, and I can picture where I was standing. And I said, oh, yeah, I haven't read these in a while. It's a cool cover. And maybe I was even aware that the movies were being filmed, and that's why I bought it. I can't remember my motivation or if I bought it. And then I was like, holy cow. But I do remember trying to read the books before the movies came out. I think successfully, and... It was before I went to England, I think, because uh, then when I went to Oxford and Cambridge, I was very disappointed not to be able to go to the pub uh, that I can't think of the name of that either. But whatever, you know, life moves on. So this may be more on the extended version because that's the last thing I saw. And I can't even remember really how it's like, so it starts off in the world, what is that place called? The Shire, uh, where the hobbits live. Hobbiton, uh, I think. Uh, and I don't remember exactly how it starts. We start to get introduced to all the main characters, uh, Bilbo and uh, Frodo, Baggins. Bag End is where they live. And Samwise Ganji 
again, people are going to get, I'm not doing this on purpose. I do pronounce words differently. What is a sight word to me? Even if I heard it in the movie, it's still going to be a sight word that I imagined how it sounded. But so, we I think we first we get an idea of those two, of uh, Frodo and uh, Bilbo, and Frodo kind of being... Uh, you get you saying, huh, is this all there is? Uh, life in the Shire is pretty good, but what else is going on? And we, we meet Sam, who's uh, uh, Frodo's best friend, and then we meet uh, Bilbo. I think we get a hint to the ring even early on and that Bilbo's preparing for a journey and a little bit stressed about something. And then Gandalf arrives, Gandalf the Grey, and I don't know if Gandalf arrives twice. I think Gandalf does come twice, but it's like this big, I think it's like a Frodo's birthday, maybe. I don't know, his name day or whatever they call it there, candle day or cake day. And so there's a big party for, 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 for Frodo or Bilbo. And we also meet uh, Pippin and Mary. Maybe I don't, I'm not kidding. I'm not trying to do a bit here, uh, but I think those are the two other characters. And we, we get a sense of the, the, the Shire. Pretty nice place to live. Hobbits who love life. They like uh, dancing, fireworks, uh, dating, eating, and drinking. And we get the sense of Gandalf and Bilbo's friendship and the, the looming thing, the the ring and some other, uh, something else going on that's stressing everybody out. And that Bilbo is leaving, and I think he's planning on leaving the Shire forever. And then also that Bilbo is either, I can't remember what happens with the ring, if he gives it to, to uh, Frodo I know there's like an envelope or something. Then what happens is Gandalf returns. Some stuff happens. I don't even know. So maybe this happens next. I don't think it does. Uh, but uh, I don't know why. But because I, 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 I was having trouble figuring out if this happens in this movie or in another movie. I mean, like within the series of three. But. Uh, yeah, let's hold off on that because I'm not sure when it happens, if it happened right now. But it wouldn't make sense because we're still getting to know Frodo. So, yeah, what I think happens is uh, Gandalf returns, um, maybe some interstitial, like uh, some other stuff happens. But he says, listen, kid, uh, you got to get that ring. So why would, no, because, yeah, then why would he be, why did he return? I don't know. Because he rides really fast. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he's leaving and comes back. So I don't know if, again, what happened in between here. But basically, are these are the ring wraiths, I think. Uh, they're, start, they're looking for... So there's... Okay, so just to set it up for you. Okay, oh boy. Because in case you don't watch this or you're not familiar. So hobbits are... Um, they're, they're, uh, they're a humanoid... Uh, about three, I don't know, three, four feet high. Uh, they don't need shoes because they have like hairy, uh, sturdy feet. Uh, they're not like, if you, depending on, like, they're not like a kender or a troll or anything. Uh, typically in Dungeons and Dragons, they are called halflings, I think, uh, but uh, maybe not, because, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of Kenders, because I'm from the Dragonlance world, not uh, the other, like, that's what I read the most fiction from. Anyway, though, so, what was my point? Okay, so, oh, so that's what uh, hobbits are. They're uh, nice, nice people. Let's just go with that. Just picture in mind, nice, friendly, community-based people, love joy. Gandalf is a human wizard, uh... Now, a couple of things about Gandalf. I've talked about this on the show before. And even picture in my mind. Now, Gan when Gandalf is Gandalf the Grey, great portrayal. It seems like a cool wizard. He's uh, joyful, but also can be uh, have a temper and be a grouch. He also is a bit, um, 
he looks like he probably uh, he needs a shower at most points in the movie. In this first move, in the first half of this movie, you see Gandalf could use a shower, at least to wash his hair. So he looks like he would be pungent and probably be like, dude, can you wash that robe? Like, I don't care if you walk around naked. Like, I'm going to wash you and I'm going to wash your robe. Uh, do, do you have an extra robe? But so, so that's the situation. Uh, th- those are the characters. Then there's Sauron. Now it gets really confusing here, but just think of Sour Balls, Sauron. Uh, don't worry about spelling it, but Sauron, in some point they explain the history. Maybe this is in here too, in the beginning. There's a lot of, uh, at so- different points, there's a little bit of elven narration. It's very nice. And uh, I think that's Kate Blanchett does a, uh, the narration, maybe. Like, long ago, there was a land with pure joy. And then, you know, like that kind of stuff. Uh, not quite sleepy. Uh, but so, meanwhile, while so basically this, the movie starts, hobbits are living their best life, I, I could say, except for Frodo or except for Bilbo, who's an older hobbit, wants to write a book, but it has some stress, has this ring. That's at least the symbol of stress. Hint, though, it's not. It's actually the cause, of, not a metaphor. With that ring, one ring grew them all. Not a met- it is a metaphor, but also not a metaphor in the movie. So the ring is stressing him out, and his health's not so great or whatever or something. I don't know. You get the sense of, like, okay, this cat's like a... Uh, looking at it and saying, what am I going to do with the rest of my days? You have his nephew Frodo, lives with him, it, more or less a father-son style relationship. Uh, Frodo's a kid, right at the cusp of adulthood, and or like a young adult saying, what the heck is it, well, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Uh, this is kind of boring. I, I have a sense of adventure, but I love my home. The Shire's the best. Have his best friend Samwise Ganji, who is, uh, uh, you know, bit uh, like working his way up, scrapper, uh, rough around the edges, a little bit um, has a broader emotional range. That, like he has a bit of an emotional range in a good way. And then you have uh, Mary and Pippin or whatever, who are their, their secondary friends, really nice. Uh, they'll become, they'll play a big role at different times. And they're, they're a bit of, they got the trickster in them and the adventurer, you know, they're like, uh, w- like Winnie the Pooh, Pooh, not, nah, well, sometimes they act like Winnie the Pooh, sometimes they act like other characters, you know, getting into trouble. And you have Gandalf the Grey, a leader, part of a council of something, uh, love, full love, uh, but also, uh, like, uh, has a heroic streak, uh, and involved in the ways of the world, and a leader, uh, but also wandering around. It seems like wandering around, loves to check up on the communities, but also is checking up on them for some reason. Good friends with Frodo. They had some adventures way back. Uh, didn't go so hot. This ring's a part of it. Uh, Gandalf stressed about the ring, too. Okay, then meanwhile, in the world, which may be explained or not, there's Sauron, thought, to- totally evil uh, being, demigod-type powers, maybe even more, Uh they thought they got rid of them, but, you know, history shows that uh, Sauron way back made these rings to trick people to share the power, but really Sauron was a dictator. This one, these, uh, these, uh, this, uh, this uh, king stood up to him, worked with the elves. They did, you know, a bunch of stuff happened. Sauron was defeated. They thought it was forever. Turns out it's not. Uh, meanwhile, when Sauron was giving out these rings, uh, one ring to rule a moment, Sauron wore a ring, the ring of power. They gave out all the rings to the leaders of all the kingdoms, but everybody put on a ring, you know, they became under Sauron's power. 
I think, and I'm not, you know, don't hold me to this. This is what I to tell the tape in my mind. Uh, now Sauron lives in a volcano or lives in Mount Doom, I think, uh, and is up to stuff, recruiting people, uh, looking for this ring, sends out these ring wraiths who are like, uh, uh, just like in other movies, uh, you know, fairly powerful, uh, uh, forces of Sauron's, uh, Sauron's main, um, heavies, I'd say. They ride horses, they wear armor, they're up to no good. They can sense the ring because they're, you know, related to it and they're sniffing it out. So basic situation is Sauron needs that ring back. Uh, and the ring was lost forever, found by Frodo. Also, no, I think the back, the back story of that, I'll just tell it to you now, but I think one of the elves tells it to us later, it tells Frodo. Once upon a time, there was a, I think, I don't even think this comes in this movie, but basically there's a Smeagol golem. And the ring had been lost uh, because, you know, it was this, the ring is its own sentience and it's not a good sentience. Uh, it wants to get back to Sauron or corrupt whoever wears it. The rings were corruptive, like all power corrupts type stuff. All of them, but this was the main ring, I believe. Uh, so it had fallen out of the world, but the ring wants to find its way back. So it had found this one dude, Smeagol, who uh, found the ring when he was swimming with his cousin or something. He got, he, he like took the ring, ended up going and living like in a, um, a grotto and became obsessed with the ring. The ring became his best friend. And I guess the ring just kind of parked itself with Smeagol for a while or a golem. Sooner or later, he was totally isolated. Kind of the ring was a higher power type drug for him. And Frodo found it during his adventures. He ran into Smeagol and the ring. Ring makes you invisible, but not in a good way. Not like some invisible cloak. And Smeagol swore he would get the ring back, Gollum. Uh, so he's been looking for it too. So as the movie starts, uh, Frodo gives uh, Bilbo the ring. No, Bilbo gives Frodo the ring. Gandalf warns him. He comes back. He says, There's, everybody's looking for this ring. You got to get out of the Shire and get yourself to this pub. Meet up with this dude Strider. He'll help you out. And Bilbo's like, I'm not sure I want to leave home. Never left home. Sam says, I'll go with you. And uh, because Bilbo just departed, he couldn't say handle goodbye or something, but he left the ring. Maybe Gandalf was hung over when all this happened, but whatever. Like, so Bilbo or Frodo has to head out. Sam goes with him. Then Merry and Pippin meet up with them and they say, hey, we're coming too. Frodo already realizes that this is pretty uh, serious. uh, And they just dodge the ring race at one point when they're on the road. The ring race are looking for them. And Gandalf goes, yo, I got to go take care of some business. Uh, So you find Strider. I'm going to take care of this other stuff. So I get to this part here, cause, but plus I forget a ton of stuff. But so then Gandalf goes off. Now, now this is confusing. There's Sauron, but there's also Sauron. And again, Sauron and Sauron or Saruman or something. Christopher Lee plays a Sauron, Sauron, who's also a famous wizard, was uh, once one of the great wizards of the world. Uh, Gandalf's friend, super powerful, but uh, wears uh, white robes. But this is not the same as Dragonlance. Like, your robes don't uh, necessarily... like in So in Dragonlance, the wizards wore either uh, black robes, red robes, or white robes, uh, and they kind of showed their alignment. I don't know about this world, but Gandalf wears gray robes. His robes could have been white, though, the way he, like, launders stuff. But so he goes to Sauron and says, yo, do you know about the Sauron? He's up to stuff. Uh, And uh, he's building an army. He's looking for this ring. What do you think we should do? We got to get everybody 
you know, nobody, uh, also apathy and stuff and, and an ambition rule the world now. And Saruman says, yeah, we definitely do, but I think you're overreacting. And he goes, I've been spying on him. Uh, I got this, like, globe uh, that, you know, helped me to see him. And then, uh, and Gandalf says, man, I heard about those. It's like a seeing stone or something. He goes, but I heard those were, like, two-way, man. That's not good. And then he goes, two-way. And then he realizes too late that uh, Sauron has made a deal with Sauron or been, you know, overpowered by him. And they do a little dance off, uh, and uh, Sauron wins. And he says, "I'm going to lock you up till you tell me where the ring's at." Uh, but he already says, "Don't worry, the ring's already safe." Uh, now, meanwhile, Sauron is starting to build another army for Sauron of like combined beings. Uh, and so he starts build. He starts this whole like uh, industri- military industrial complex at his uh, tower. I think that's a lot of that's in the next movie. But just you know, set it up. So meanwhile, Gandalf is like stuck there on his roof. Uh, but then Gandalf uh, calls a moth. He talks to a moth and says, "Go get me a griffin." And the moth says, no problem. And the griffin comes and rescues Gandalf. That happens at some point in the first half of this film. Meanwhile, the hobbits, they go meet over the Strider at a pub, a human pub. Of course, there's trouble. Of course, oh, they said, keep a low profile. But once you get a drink in a hobbit, they're dancing on the tables, pouring drinks over their heads. And so the uh, ring race eventually tracked them down at the hotel, I think. And they sneak out of there. Then they try to hide out again, uh, like somewhere else, uh, like at a castle the next day, because they're on the run. And they're sleeping there. And then uh, the ring race show up again. Meanwhile, Strider's, like, doing his best. He's trying to train the... uh, the hobbits and stuff. But then Frodo puts on the ring, I think by accident, and he realizes he disappears, but the ring race can see them. And they basically give him like a, like a little, like a spectral touch or something. And he gets a tummy tum tum. Now they're on the run from the ring race. Frodo has a tummy tum tum, but they meet up with uh, Strider, who ends up as a, uh, like this, like royal blood. He's considered, he's like one of those people that's like, uh, can go between the world of the elves. You know, he's loved by elves, loved by some humans. Heir to the throne of Gondor. Aragon, or yeah, Aragon. Aragon, something like that, uh, is his human name. Strider's his elven name. He's a ranger, you know, ranger by day, you know, Harlequin style, you know, like he's got flowing hair, beautiful eyes, and he's dating an elven queen, an elven princess, of course. Uh, she shows up, and now she's also got magic powers, uh, so she helps them escape, uh, maybe even twice from the ring race, uh, and uh, like uh, they go on the run. She helps Frodo. They split up. Frodo goes to sleep. Uh, next thing you know, do they get away? They do. Uh, and Frodo wakes up after resting for a while. Uh, Bilbo's there. And uh, Frodo's on the mend. And we're, we're in Elven. We're in, we're in uh, I don't know where we are. Uh, maybe I'll think of it. So, you know, Elven Paradise, basically. Now we get a lot of info here. One. We find out that Bilbo's still obsessed with the ring, and he's, but he, like, so Frodo says, whoa, 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 buddy, boundaries. Uh, Then he gives, uh, oh, he'd already given, like, a mithril chain mail and and his uh, sword to Bilbo, or Frodo, maybe, or maybe he gives him to him now, but whatever. Then we find out, uh, you know, Sam and Mary and Pippin are there. And we find out that, uh, you know, like, uh, all is not well in the human world. We, Sean Bean is, uh, Boromir, 
he thinks that uh, his family is ready to take the throne or maybe even him and uh, like that there will be leaders of pure heart that he could even handle the ring and that we should use the ring for good but really you're supposed to throw the ring in Mount Doom and that will solve it all. The elves are bo- bolting from the world. They're taking boats and they're leaving. Frodo's going, Bilbo's going with them. But we, we had the last great council to decide what to do. And everybody's represented. So you have uh, elves, dwarves, and hu- different, uh, well, a couple of humans from different, uh, Boromir from whatever. I don't know if he's from Rohan or, uh, I think he's from Gondor, but he's not an official. He's on like the second tier family or something. And he just says he's a little needy. Uh, so then they say, they say, what are we going to do about this? We got to throw this ring in Mount Doom, but, it, you know, it has power. It corrupts most people. And they say, we need a hero. And then everybody says, I don't know what to do. And they're arguing. And Frodo says, whoa, 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 man. Uh, I'll do it because uh, I've been wearing it anyway. It, you know, it's my responsibility. I got it covered. And then Sam's like, no way you're going without me. And then even Gandalf and uh, Strider, Aragon, Boromir, uh, Gimli, or this, the representative of the dwarves, and um, Legolas, uh, the best uh, like athlete in all of Elven, uh, the elves, uh, they all say, we'll go with you. We'll form a fellowship of the ring. And we'll help you get to Mount Doom. And they say, okay, sounds good. So they set out, but they're trying to avoid the ring wraiths. Uh, now Sauron's got uh, people going out looking for them. Also, Sar- they try to go over this one mountain. So they're encountering all sorts of difficulties, right? Also, uh, Aragon has to break up with uh, the elven princess uh, because she, she says, uh, you know, I guess they're... Um, they have this impressive lifespan, but she could give up her lifespan to be with a human. He says, nah, nah, don't waste your time with me. And meanwhile, they're like, you're splitting? Like, you're basically going into isolation when we need, we could use some elven help with this uh, sour. And they say, it's not going to go good. We're getting out of here. So then they try to go over this mountain, but Saur- Sauron is like casting like, uh, light, you know, He's so powerful, you could cast lightning bolts, across, like change the weather and stuff. So they can't get over this mountain. So then they go back down and they say, what are we going to do? we got to get over these mountains to get to the next round of mountains to get to Mount Doom. And you, there's like even apps that tell you how far it is uh, that Bilbo had to walk. There's like one running app. I never use it, but I downloaded it. Uh, because you could use it to track your running to see how long it would take you to recap uh, Bilbo's or whatever, uh, Frodo's journey. But so then they're in a pickle, right? So then they say, okay, well, what are we going to do? And they said, well, like, you could go through this old uh, dwarven mine and fortress or kingdom built into this one mountain, but we heard it, nothing good came out of it Uh And this is where a little bit of the history is confusing to me. Um, And again, because I read so much Dragonlance, so it's just kind of hard for me to separate. But I guess you could fill in the blanks. So now they're like cornered, right? Uh, They they go back down the mountain. They can't go over it. Everybody's looking for them. They're at this magical set of doors. uh, And then they have to figure out the spell and they have to figure out how to say open it. I think you have to do it like a full moon, just happens to be a full moon. They finally get the door open with some teamwork brainstorming and arguing. They get the door open. And then, I don't know if you remember uh, the first Star Wars movie in the trash compactor. The same friggin' thing that was in there is in the water or pretty close to it. uh, in the water outside of this uh, mine. So they have to like ditch that thing, but it, it messes up the door, jams the door on them. 
because it's always trying to press buttons. So now they're locked in the, because the, at first they get in the mind, they go, oh boy, never mind. This place has uh, not got a good feel, but they can't leave. So now they have to go through this mine or kingdom or whatever. And it's totally uh, empty, but there's a weird feel there. Like, and they, basically, this is when Gandalf is really grouchy. He says, don't make a sound and we'll be fine. But don't do anything dumb, Pippin and Mary, by the way. So meanwhile, they're searching for a while. Then they find this, like, uh, one room where they decide to take a break. And they find these books. Uh, and they say, oh, boy, this is the history of uh, the last uh, residence here. And they're reading it. And it's very tense. This is one of the best best scenes in all three movies in my for me. Because the tension really builds, and then there's some great action. But so they're reading this book, and it says, "Oh boy, there's something we woke, we dug too deep, uh, and uh, we found things that should never be found deep." You know, th- this is all fiction, by the way. Uh, they say, "Don't worry, it'll be fine." But for this part, uh, you know, this is part of the movie where you learn this, you know, gain the skills that you'll learn, you know, use later, two or three movies from now. But they say, yo, boy, there's, like, little people, like, uh, and then there's some big baddie, too, like a big boss level. Biggest of the big boss levels in the first movie, but not as big as the final boss, uh, Sauron. Probably have to deal with Sauron, too, at some point. But for now, and then Mary or Pippin, they knock some stuff into a well, makes a bunch of noise. That wakes up everybody that lives in the uh, mine. They come. And they're not friends. They're, they're like, hey, we want to take your stuff. Uh, it, you, this is our house. Uh, so basically, the fellowship, they have to get out of there. While they're trying to get out of there, they realize that some the big boss is even, like, the, this is a boss level. It's not just a level. It's a level with a boss at the end. And this one looks like a boss. Like, uh, it's big. It's got hot skin. Uh, no shirt on. You know, the whole nine yards, uh, it's got, you know, feet, uh, and it doesn't have feet. It has, you know, uh, whatever those things are called, clompers. And apparently I say this wrong. I always call it a bar log, but I guess it's called a, it's come something else, bar log. I don't know. Bar log is what I call it. That's just what I, but that's like the giant big boss. So they're on the run from everybody that lives there and the big boss. And they're running, running, running. They're trying to get away. Couple things in here were, you know, the physics of it, of the effects were a little over the top. But most of them get away. But then they're still, this is like big boss is still in pursuit. And Gandalf says, you know, I got to stop this. Uh, because in the end, Frodo has to get away. That's the most important thing. And uh, and so uh, they, uh, they like uh, Gandalf stands up and tries to take on the big boss level. Kind of does at first. That's when he says, and I misquote this all the time. I always thought he said, you shall not pass or, or something. But uh, he says something different. But I always used to yell that all the time. But he tries to shut stuff down. Uh, then him and um, him and the like boss they go they leave the movie for for a time being. Now don't worry, be bad. Don't worry at all. Now so then everybody's heartbroken because Gandalf, while he was a grouch, he could be a grouch and he probably was pungent, uh, and he could have used a hair washing. He was their leader, pretty powerful and a father figure and kind hearted when he could be. And considered the brains of the operation, uh, they say, holy cow, what are we going to do now that uh, without Strider uh, or without uh, Gandalf, we're toast? And now I'm not sure. I mean, I know. Okay, so then they wander into the elven kingdom and these elves find them. And now they're totally heartbroken. Takes them a while. I think they have to dodge the ring race once or twice. They get into this elven kingdom, a different elven kingdom. These are the forest elves. Uh, 
And Kate Blanchett is the queen of the forest elves. They find out about Gandalf. They have a whole ceremony where they find we find out that Aragon is like totally she can tell she totally can see into everybody's heart. So she's trying to give everybody advice. But she says this is going to be tough, really, really tough. Uh, but she says you could do it together. Uh, you got to get this ring. You can't give up because uh, they all want to give up, of course. But she says it's not going to happen. So then she says, here's some lembas. I got some, you know, camouflage cloaks for you. You know, we'll rebuild your spirits. Lembas is like traveling bread or rations. Uh, and uh, so she gives them some tools that they're going to need. Camouflage coats are always great. Uh, and she gives them canoes. They set off again. But meanwhile, now Saruman's army is looking for them, and they're like can run really fast, and they have a great sense of smell. So it's even worse. So eventually, what happens is uh, they try to park their boats. They got to go over. They got to go around these falls, and this is all like taking its toll on uh, uh, Frodo too. And Frodo, like, like they all get the advice from Cape uh, Blanchett else, but you know how you interpret the advice is up to you. Now, meanwhile, Boromir, uh, the Sean Bean character, he's like still like, wait a second, I've got royal blood. I know what's best, you know. I should just take this ring. We'll bring it back to Gondor, and we'll rule all in place of Sauron. Power, you know, ultimate power does not corrupt. And he almost is like this. These all these uh, foibles prove my point. So at some point he corners Frodo. He says, "Yo, get, now the ring, you know, plays tricks. It's got a built-in delusion." So he says, "Yo, give me the uh, ring, or I'll take it." Basically, and Frodo says, "No, man, that's not how it works." And he says, "I'll just take it from you then." And then Frodo wakes him up, uh, but at the same time he wakes up uh, from the delusion. That's when the Sauron's crew comes in. And everybody's separated, so it becomes this whole mess. Uh, and Boromir decides to go see the great Gondor in the sky, fly with the Gondors above Gondor. And um, uh, uh, everybody's split up for a time, and Frodo says to himself, maybe this is for the best, uh, I'm just going to go by myself. Maybe they re-meet again and they have a reconvene for a little while. But then Frodo sneaks out and even uh, Strider sees him and he says, okay, I get it, I get it. And so Frodo tries to head out solo, but Sam says, yo, you're not going with me. And Frodo says, I got to do this alone. Uh, I feel like uh, it'll be safer for everybody. I'm small, I can hide. Also, the Elven Queen pointed out to Ga uh, Frodo that they were being followed by Smeagol. And that Smeagol was already following them. So then, so that comes up, I think, in the next next uh, movie. And so then um, uh, Frodo says, no, Sam, you're not coming. Sam says, I'm come, come with you, basically. And I'm 100% coming with you. He doesn't give him a choice. Uh, so they head off together. Meanwhile, I had forgotten that Mary and Pippin they became guests of Saruman's army because Saruman's army, they said, just get the halflings. Uh, they said, get them all and bring them, bring them to Saruman. So Mary and Pippin are stuck with these, this, the, their guests of the army. So then uh, Aragon, Gimli, and uh, Legolas, so the last three of the fellowship left. To their knowledge, G Gandalf has gone to the tower in the sky, but even though that's not what happened. And uh, Boromir's, you know, in the great Gondor. And Sam and Frodo are off, and so they kind of almost need a distraction. And maybe the Sauron's army is not that smart, so they just said, we got what we came for. We got two of the halflings, right? So they say our mission now is to rescue Sam and uh, Pippin or Sam and Mary or whatever, Mary and Pippin. 
And so they head off to do that. And I think that's how the movie ends. But let's uh, let's look it up a little bit. Okay, it came out in 2001. Uh, what else do we need to know here? Uh, the budget was $900 million. Oh, no, $93 million. Almost did a billion dollars in box office. Uh, Sauron, One Ring... Frodo Baggins, uh, Middle Earth in the ba- hangs in the balance. Uh, they start off to Mount Doom where they can destroy the ring. Uh, let's see, plot, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, in the Second Age, they were all given these rings of power, but they were, uh, you know, they were really under the control of Sauron in Mordor, Isildur of Gondor. To, is the one who say gets the ring off of Sauron and defeats Sauron, returns Sauron to spirit form. Uh, Isidor actually wore the ring, uh, then he loses the ring. That's when you got 2,500 years later, Gollum finds it. Uh, then Bilbo finds it with Gollum. Oh, yeah, it was uh, six years after that, 111th birthday for Bilbo. Gandalf shows up. Uh, he leaves everything to Frodo, including the ring. Gandalf says, wait a second, this is the one true ring. Uh, and uh, also learns that Gollum was the one who told them that it was the Shire and Baggins who took the ring. Gandalf says, you got to get out of here. So I guess that'll happen, in, you know, over two nights. Samwise heads off. Uh, Sour, Gandalf goes to meet with Sauron, and uh, Frodo and Sam are joined by Merry and Pippin. I got that right. Uh, they go to Bree uh, to meet with Strider. Oh, was, was supposed to meet with Gandalf, but Strider says, "I'm there. We're going to Rivendell." Then they go to Weathertop. So this part's right. Uh, Frodo gets kissed by a ring wraith, uh, and then the uh, Arwen, the elf, and Strider's beloved, and uh, oh, Strider and Arwen reunite their love for each other. Then they say Lord Elrond decides he can't keep the ring in Rivendell. Got to be destroyed in Mount Doom. Frodo volunteers, and then Gandalf, Sam, Mary Pippin, Legolas, Gimli, and Boromir, and Strider, who is actually Aragorn, Isidil's heir, and rightful king of Gondor. Frodo gives a sting and a chain shirt of Mithril uh, to Frodo. Bilbo gives him those. Okay, so they head out to Gap of Rohan, uh, but Saruman's watching that. Then they go off over the mountains. Uh, that's when the storm comes. They have to go through the mines of Moria. And that's when they run into the, the, all those uh, Balrog, I guess. There's a, is that how it's spelled? B-A-L, Barlog, but it's Balrog. Uh, Gandalf fends that off, uh, but they go. they vanish together. Uh, then they go to Lothlorien, Lothar- Lothar- uh, Galadriel. Uh, she's the one. She she tells Frodo that only he can complete the quest, uh, and that someone's going to try to take the ring. Sauron's got his crew looking for them. Then they go to Parth Galen. And Frodo gets, oh, so I was right, deals with Boromir, tries to take the ring. Then the crew shows up, Merry and Pippin go with them. Aragon comforts Boromir as he heads to the Great Gondor, promises to help the people of Gondor. Frodo heads off alone, but Sam comes, uh, because he promised Gandalf he would look after Frodo as his friend. He's going to need a friend. And, uh, yeah, so I guess I was pretty close there. I mean, I guess I've seen it, uh, and there was definitely changes. I don't know what'll be on, the, um, the Amazon product, but yeah, it'd be interesting. And I mean, I'm sure it's uh, like, uh, 
like uh, looking back at this and then preparing for something new. I always like it. Uh, if it's, as long as the casting's good and the story's good uh, and the effects are good and the music's good. And, no, but uh, I think the casting will be interesting. I don't have, know any of the cast. But I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so uh, good night, everybody. That's the tale of the tape with Inside My Mind. Friends beyond binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I I guess technically I'm just wearing a shorts and a t-shirt, but it is kind of my pajamas or my like uh, pre-bed clothing. But I was also, I guess, pre-bed clothing or clothing you sleep in your bed in or clothing you sleep. But I was thinking like pajamas is like one word, right? But then it got shortened to PJs. Which, I, the, you know, the S is lowercase for whatever that is, uh, multiple or what, I don't know. First of all, isn't it a pajama? Or is the top, like, because what if you're in a one-piece pajama? Like, is it like, uh, so why, is, there's, a, there's a question, and someone will give me the right answer. Why are pajamas plural? plural? Uh, so anyway, that's the kind of questions I'm asking here. Breaking news, I have no idea about anything. And they'll stay, and you say, why, where did it, well, because you deserve a good night's sleep. Your sleep is important. This is a silly show here to keep you company and take your mind off of stuff so you could get the sleep you need and deserve. And I'm here to let you know that. Uh, then we'll talk about some stuff about the show. Then there'll be an intro and then there'll be a bedtime story. And I'm so glad you're here because this is a special, special episode, 11, 11. Uh, so what do you say, uh, what, what, what do I do next? Uh, and, uh, thanks for making it possible, my patron peeps. Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Well, welcome, this is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We've been doing, we do, we do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights, and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake. It could be thoughts, like things on your mind. It could be feelings, anything coming up for you emotionally, you know, that you're feeling. Uh, so thoughts, feelings, physical sensations, uh, changes in time or temperature or routine, it could be something else. Whatever it is uh, that's keeping you awake, you know, the reason I make the show is twofold. One, because I've had trouble fall- falling asleep, staying asleep, uh, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep. But well, well, yeah, well, uh, being welcoming, being welcomed in, even those things, I say, well, now I got to welcome some people. Oh, boy, that's going to be... Uh, a lot of work, uh, but whatever, uh, whatever's keeping you awake, what I wanted to say is like, well, I might not know exactly what you're going through. The idea of the show is to make it feel less lonely because there's a lot of us, uh, e- either me or somebody that's listening right now that m- probably knows how it feels or that can relate to what you're going through. Cause a lot of us know that there's some common feelings. That's why we call it the deep, dark night. And the other reason, and the most important reason I make this show is because of you. You deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve a place you could get some rest, uh, that you could get comfortable, that you could get the rest you need and deserve so that you can fully live your life. You know, that as you get more rest, your life becomes more manageable. You'd be out there flourishing. That means the world we live in is a better place if your world's a better place. So that's why I make the show the way I do it is I try to create a safe place, as I said, where you could set all that stuff aside. I smooth it, I pat it, I rub it down the safe place, uh, kind of polish it. I I mean, polishing is a lot of pressure, right? Uh, But I probably like if a safe place had a a surface that could gleam, uh, I would, but you know, like, uh, and it was uh, appropriate because you say, well, that's my safe place. I don't need you putting your uh, whatever that is, your internal fog on there and then polishing it. But if it was someplace open, you know, where you say, OK, don't. Yeah, you could go ahead and polish up that safe place. Uh, it can't. I, I don't normally associate safe places with hard like uh, rocks, polished rocks. But um, maybe it's at the entrance of the safe place. I got to polish that up. Uh, 
I don't know, is that quartz or um, something else? But yeah, I could, I could do that. What do you call that? Breathe on it and then polish it. Or I could use some polish. The old turtle wax hasn't come up in a few intros. And I'm still confused about that. I say, who came up with that idea? Like, how many turtles wax their shells? Uh, and then I think the posit was during, you know, like, uh, do, don't do this, but imaginarily, you know, during mating season, imaginarily polish a turtle's shell. But then probably what would happen is uh, if I was playing that, if I did it, they'd say, what happened to the turtle population in this uh, in the 315 area code? And back when Scoots was a kid, there was like a, there was like a, like during like this five year period. Oh, he thought he was helping the turtles. He was polishing their shells with turtle wax. And uh, it turns out it makes per- turtles very unattractive uh, to their mates, makes them hard to find a mate. I mean, one, they smell like turtle wax. Uh, and it, I guess I didn't realize it because it was during my, uh, was supposed to be my, I said, oh, that's why I'm covered in turtle wax. That's why you won't go out with me. And they said, no, that's just a symptom of uh and I say, okay, well, I'm going to go wax some more turtles. Uh, and then finally the company called me uh, and they said, D- D- it's not it's, it's not turtle wax. And I said, are, is this Abbott and Costello calling me from the big farm in the sky? It's called, tur- it's not for waxing turtle. Turtle wax is not for waxing turtles. And actually they were very patriot. They said, son. And I said, but it's called turtle wax. And I, I said, I'm pretty sure it has a shiny turtle. Like, like at least in 1991, it did. I'm pretty sure there's a shiny, happy turtle on there. So you're telling me that this stuff is just called turtle wax. And the turtle, on, and they say, yeah, it's called marketing. And it's exactly like if I wanted to wax some turtles, like you've got yourself a winning product. Like uh, that turtle seems very happy. And they say, how do I make a turtle happy? Oh, turtle wax. Uh, Of course a turtle's going to want a shell waxed. Again, none of this really happened, just in case you're, uh, I mean, in my mind it did. Like, uh, they said, that'll fix everything. I'll feel it. Finally, I'll feel like a good person and part of Mother Nature. If I could just wax some turtle shells, uh, I'll get it right this time. And it turns out I was wrong about everything. And that's okay, too. You say, okay. Oh, it's for car polish, huh? Our car is there like a car called the turtle? No, I mean briefly there was a car called the turtle, but it uh it was a Volkswagen competitor. It didn't last. Uh, okay, our cars nicknamed the turtle? No. Um, I mean I guess we get in a car like a turtle. Okay, I mean that's a stretch. I mean it's it works though, and I guess I don't understand why. Once again, branding don't understand it. Uh, but I say, okay. And they say, yeah, it's just simple. Like, uh, you're complicated. I, I say, oh, okay. So it's simple, but not so simple that I should, but I shouldn't. It's simple, but it's for waxing cars, not turtles. Exactly. Thanks for your time. Okay, I'm glad we got that clear. So it's simple, but uh, it's beyond words. Okay, now I'm getting it. Some part of my brain just said that it's beyond words, and it, it, you just get it. Uh, and I'd say, yeah, just get it, but don't understand, like, make sure to not understand it. Turtle wax for waxing your car, not for waxing turtles. So this is the second intro, at least, that this has come up. And spe- speaking for turtles, please don't wax us. We don't We don't understand it. And, I mean, honest, honestly, uh, it probably won't help us with finding any mates or, find you know, sustain, you know, probably not good for us. If Mother Nature wants our turtles waxed, uh, she'll find a way. So thank you uh, on behalf of turtles. Pl- please don't wax us. O- also, don't wax tortoises. Uh, don't try to get around it. And on behalf of tortoises, we say, hey, no thanks. We, like, wh- what's wrong? What do we have, too many syllables in our name so you couldn't call it tortoise wax? And also, hey, don't assume tortoises and turtles are the same thing. Even though Sco- Scooter doesn't know, maybe they are. Uh, okay, enough of that. Uh, I, I thought I was, oh, I was waxing my safe place. I was waxing on a safe place. Uh, 
And then I'll send my voice across a deep, dark night. I'll use lulling, soothing, creaky dulcet tones, pointless meanders, and superfluous tangents. And we just got caught up in a couple of those because uh, I guess I was imagining myself polishing. Oh, yeah, because I was polishing. And I said, well, I could use some turtle wax to, if I'm going to polish anything or wax it. Um, so, yeah, th- those are pointless meanders and superfluous tangents. Not traditionally known to help people fall asleep, even though they are. Well, actually, they are traditionally known, not popularly known to help people fall asleep. Traditionally, they are. Someone talking about nothing that you could just barely listen to. That's like what puts people to sleep. That's what I make. I've been doing it. This is episode 1111, believe it or not. And as I said earlier, I make the show because you deserve a good night's sleep, and I've been there. But there are a few things to know. If this is your first episode, yeah, uh, you've heard it. This podcast is very strange, very different. I mean, you're talking about someone who grew up thinking maybe one, my all, you know, all my adolescence will be solved if I could just wax some turtles. Uh, that, who attaches his self-esteem to actions like waxing turtles based on the marketing of a product for cars, which I don't even know if they actually need to be waxed. Uh, so I guess on the East Coast with all the salt, they probably do after, you know, the old spring waxing. But only cars, not turtles. Again, just because the spring is in the air, wax a car with your turtle wax, not a turtle. Could also be confusing if a pet, I mean, hopefully no pet stores sold turtle wax. Maybe there is some sort of, you know, that's, uh, but probably not. Uh, and then for someone like me, they say turtle snacks. And no, no. They say, did you say you need turtle wax, son? No, I need some turtle snacks. Uh, and they say, okay, I don't know. what. Tur- I think I've seen at the zoo tortoises like chomping on leafy greens. Okay, I thought this was a sleep podcast. You're right. Uh, so this is a podcast you don't really listen to. It doesn't really put you to sleep. Uh, and yeah, it's very different. It takes like two or three tries for most people to get into the show, but it is free. So just see how it goes. And that's because it's so different. It's You don't really listen to me, just kind of barely listen. I'm like a voice in the background talking for your benefit, but you don't have to pay attention to me. So I'm here to keep you company and take your mind off stuff. I'm actually not here to put you to sleep. I'm here to be your boar friend, your boar bay, your boar sib, your boar cuz, your boar bestie, your boar, bur- your neighbor, your boar burr. To be your friend in the deep dark night and keep you company, whether you're listening or uh, not. Whether you're awake or asleep, there's no pressure to fall asleep. I'm going to be here to the very end of the show. And if you can't sleep, I'll be here for you. And if you're not listening, I'll be here for you. I've been doing this uh, since 2013 uh, because you deserve a good night's sleep. And even if you loathe me and you say this show is not for me, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you. There's other sleep podcasts out there and other sleepy stuff. uh, So check those out. So that's a couple of things to know. Podcasts you don't really listen to. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. It takes a few times listening. I don't really put you to sleep. Oh, more like structure of the show also throws people off. And uh, let me just explain to you the structure of the show. You could, you know, you can adjust as you become a regular listener. Show starts off with a greeting. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. So you feel seen and welcomed in. And you say, okay, I got a basic idea for the show, like what the show to expect. It. Then there's support for the show. So the show can be free, like uh, versus being paid only. And that's my preference. And it benefits a lot of people and the people that take action to support the show. It benefits, I think, like uh, nine people for every one person. So that's pretty cool. Uh, that, uh, that, 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 that's what I think works best. So having the sponsor and listener support. Then... Uh, there's, uh, the intro, which comes after some of the support stuff, but some people lump it all together, but the intro is really a show within a show, which you've seen. I mean, Turtle Wax has come up before, but how many other podcasts are you getting, you know, pondering? I mean, you're confused. You're as confused as I am, unless you're in the auto industry. You're like, you're right. Uh, Like, was there a time, I mean, no, I, okay, no, you're right. Part of my brain, I said, was there ever a time where there were racing turtles? And I said, oh yeah, there are turtle races, but those turtles actually rely on their, 
I mean, they they get a number sometimes painted on their back on their shell, but usually their shells matte. If it was shiny, it'd be harder to pay attention. You say, oh, I can't follow the turtle race. The turtles are too shiny. So that's not why they call it turtle wax either. But it also, I got to shrug my shoulders and say, it kind of works. As confusing as it is. Now, if you're listening and you're into analytics, someone out there saying, like three months from now, I say, strange. When that episode of Sleep With Me came out, there was a point zero two increase in, in searches for turtle wax. I don't even know if it exists anymore. I, I don't know if that was the one that came in an orange bottle or if it came in a silver bottle or maybe not. I don't know. So... What was it? To, oh, the intro. So the intro goes on and on and on to ease you into bedtime. So the intro is not so much made to put you to sleep, but to keep you company and give you some space between the day and falling asleep as you get ready for bed or as you're in bed getting comfortable. It's like a lowering of the volume or some twilight time uh, versus it, it. Now, there is a percentage of people that fall asleep. There's a, a small percentage of people that skip the intro. But for most listeners, it's part of their wind down routine. And that's what most sleep stuff has shown to work is having like 30 minutes of wind down uh, to, to, to kind of set the mood, I guess, uh, to fall asleep or to set the mood not to listen or to say, yeah, I'm so confused I stopped listening to you, even though you almost barely didn't make any sense. And I say, thanks for that compliment. So that's the intro. Then again, there's more support between the intro and the bedtime story. So show's free. Uh, that's cool. And then there's our bedtime story. And tonight will be like a 11-11. So some wishes for the podcast and a little bit of the history of the podcast. Uh, and then um, what else? Uh, oh, and then there's thank yous at the end of the show. So that's, that's the structure of the show. It's why I make the show. I'm really glad you're here. I really appreciate you checking this podcast. Please don't wax any turtles, um, except in your mind. You know, a shiny turtle in your mind may be helpful. Uh, was it for the, there was also, while well, turtles in the eighties were really involved in marketing, they had, they had a heyday, huh? Cause there was also that, uh, Tootsie Pop turtle, or that was a tortoise. And that, but that was more a symbol of wisdom. Maybe there was also an owl, so they were choosing creatures that were wise, where I don't think the turtle wax has anything to do with wisdom, except for the wisest turtles have their turtles waxed in spring, except they don't. So anyway, I'm glad you're here. I really work hard. I really are a nice driver. I really hope you can help you fall asleep. Thanks again for coming by. And here's a couple of ways I'm able to do it for you for free twice a week. All right, everybody, this is Scoots here, and uh, this is a new or, <laughs> it's a new episode, obviously, if you're listening. Um, but this is a new approach. I don't even know how this is going to go. Um, but usually, it's, I think it's been a while. I don't know if we've done, like, a, what do you call them, even? Like a, like, a, like a place marking episode or bookend? It's not a bookend episode. But this is episode 1111, or it's supposed to be, uh, but I'm recording this. There's a lot of times I'm surprised. Uh, so I'm going to kind of um, talk about, it's a wish episode, because I think you're supposed to make wishes at 1111. Now, unfortunately, it's not 2011, and this won't come out on 1111, but it, it will, it is episode 1111, or 1000. 111, I think, but maybe we just, oh no, we passed a thousand episodes a while ago. So what I'm going to do is run through some wishes I have, uh, maybe run through a little bit of the history of the podcast as related to some of my wishes, and then uh, do like uh, on the back half of the episode, uh, some listeners took the time to participate, and so we'll see how that goes. Okay, so I guess my wish is for you as a listener right now. If you're listening to this, this is really what I wish for you. Uh, and when I say I wish for you, I hope deeply. Uh, I yearn for, for you to feel valued and seen. And 
you, you know, and, and I guess maybe to, 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 to spread that to other people and make them feel valued and seen. And yeah, it's reflective too. Cause I, I, that's the person I want to be is someone that, uh, feels valued and seen by making other people feel valued and seen. So that's a wish I have, a desire I have for all of you that are listening right now. And for you to feel safe, uh, at least in this moment, uh, or some sense of safety, uh, whether it's this podcast being a port in the storm for you, or that you just develop this podcast or something else as part of your bedtime routine, uh, to create a, you know, kind of sense of comfort and, 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 uh, safe space, uh, where ideally you could get the sleep you need. I mean, that's really what this show is about. And that goes into wishes I repeat every episode. Like, I want this podcast to be there for you so you could get the rest you need so that your life is more manageable. And I probably already talked about it in the intro, but, I mean, a lot of us listening know how that feels. And that's kind of my deep desire for you is uh, that you get the rest you need on a, on a regular basis, at least like a better than baseball. Like what do they hit? Like 33, you know, a top baseball player hits like 300 or something. So three out of 10, I'd like it to be around seven out of 10. Uh, that's about when my sleep now with a regular wind down routine. Sometimes it's eight out of 10 nights. I get a good night's sleep. And then if your life becomes manageable, that you could just be there and be present in your life, uh, live your life, take part in it. And start to flourish. Uh, that's really what I desire for all of you. So those are my wishes for you as a listener and all those things that come along with all that stuff. And, you know, all that stuff that happens in between all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, I know life isn't easy. Uh, uh, it, being human is not easy. And not being able to sleep on top of that is tough. Uh, and I know that also, like... Uh, Speaking from experience, I don't always feel like I'm the person I want to be, right? And and, uh, and that kind of goes into some of my wishes around the podcast and uh, uh, for the future of the podcast is that really, like, uh, you know, I make the show, I manage the show, anyway, like, uh, is that my fears and my need for certainty or my default behaviors don't get in the way of the podcast. Cause they, they like, that's one of the biggest challenges of the podcast is me. Cause it can be like really hard for me. Just like I kind of said for, for all of you, my desire too is like to feel okay and trust things are going to work out and not try to force solutions or, uh, run around like, uh, like that little chicken that's in the books, uh, like thinking, oh, why can't I? Do, why isn't this happening? Or why isn't this happening? Or I need certainty. I need to know it's going to be okay. Or I need this many. Uh, I, like uh, that gets in the way of me doing my best job, and also closes me off from uh, like change and, and saying, oh, okay, well, maybe this has to change with the show, or maybe this has to change with the show. Uh, it's like uh, I'm not able to see. You know, I, I, my I, my vision is only focused on, uh, uh, like, uh, n the non-positive outcomes uh, and stuff like that. So I really have a wish uh, that I keep growing and I can stay out of the way of the podcast and, and uh, know that if I'm just doing, I don't know, this is the hardest part, honestly, is like to be like, okay, if I do the best job I can making the podcast to put people to sleep and it puts people to sleep that it'll be okay. And that enough, you know, that the rest of the stuff, uh, outside of that, what, which is under my control will happen as long as I'm trying to, you know, create a safe place and, and put you to sleep that every, everything else, uh, you know, if I do my best, uh, that things are going to be okay. And my desire is for me to b b get to a place where at least I'm just like I kind of talked about. I think I'm in the base play baseball player zone now. It's like, oh, if I like, and I'm not an all star. So I don't know if I'm, maybe I'm, I don't know if, if I'm, a, I'm, I'm in the major leagues uh, where I say, okay, two out of 10 times I can trust things are going to be okay. And uh, yeah, so let's see. Let's go into the history of the podcast a little bit because this is a major. 1111 itself is just a symbolic number. 
But wow, the show has been coming out now for nine years and, uh, we're about to enter the 11th, uh, uh, year of making the show. Wait, so is it 10 years? Uh, so I started the podcast really, I don't know, like, uh, I won't go into the pre, I don't know where I'm going with this, uh. But yeah, it started the show, the show started coming out in the feed in 2013 in the fall, like right around now, October, I think. So let's see, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah, that's nine years and uh, 10 calendar years of making it. Uh, is that right? I don't know. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah. So, wow, 11 calendar years coming up. That's, I mean, holy cow. I mean, really, I had no, that's hard for me to process. Uh, probably, you know, so let's steer around that because then I start to get a, like a, the old four, the old four Lauren comes up. But yeah, when I started making this show uh, way back then, it had been something I'd put off for years and years and years. If if you're if you're new to the show, you might not know that. Uh, but maybe you could relate to having that creative idea and then being like, "No, that's not a good idea," because that was years and years and years before. I I actually heard from somebody. I don't even know what year it was. Two thousand seven. That they said they found a in my family. Is that right? I don't know. I have to look at like a a test episode or something. But that was even before, po- I don't know, was that before podcast? That doesn't make sense. But or I don't know. But so, I don't know, at some point it, it, I started making the show because uh, just other stuff. I said, okay, let's just try as a hobby. I had no experience in audio or audio engine, you know, none of that stuff. Uh, so just in case you're in that place where you're like, I can't do it, I can relate. And I guess that's another wish uh I wish for you to, you know, not to try, but to have that love and, and like, uh, to have what you need to get over that hump, uh, because it's tough. Uh, it was tough for me and there was a lot of things in the way of that. Um, and so eventually I started making the show and I had a full-time job, uh, and, uh, it was, it was just a hobby and an experiment, really. I said, well, could I, like, I have this idea, a podcast that puts people to sleep, uh, where someone tells you bedtime stories you don't really listen to. And, like, I think even at the time, even the show the show had to develop, this is the kind of end product I kind of had in mind, uh, in my heart, at least, was, uh, I don't know, a fun show that you don't really, you could listen to, but you don't really listen to with stories. And I said, would anybody, like, I know I would like that. And I know I've encountered other people that might like that. Uh, can I follow through on it? I mean, that was mostly my concern at the time. It wasn't even will it work. Because uh, I guess part of me, to be honest, was kind of, I was like, I think this is a decent idea that I've been avoiding for years and years and years. And I think it will work if I, but I don't know if I'm the one to make it work. I don't know if I can, fo- I've, I don't have a history of following through on stuff. Uh and so that was my biggest commitment. And, and I mean, I had read stuff that it takes th- like three years to really, and this was back in 2013, to get a podcast to know if you're going to have an audience or anything um, or anybody to listen or that it's uh, like, um, like just do it as a hobby for three years, uh, basically. And um, so then I started, so I said, well, could I make it for two years, I think? And and then there was a, no, a couple other facts that were useful to me was that, like, uh, podcasts, and again, this was like 2013 numbers, but podcasts that record episode one, like only 50% of those record episode two, and then podcasts that record episode f- f- two, only 50% of those record episode seven or eight. And then uh, podcasts that record episode seven or eight, only 50% of those record episode uh, 25 or 20 or 18 or something or 12. Uh, and so I kind of set those as my goals, uh, even though part, uh, even though when I was making it, I didn't think I could keep following through or part of me was afraid. And again, I, like there's another wish I have for all of you listening is that uh, 
is that you could have that place uh, and that encouragement uh, or, or not feel alone to be like, hey, there's somebody else out there that feels like uh, stopping or this isn't going to work out. And that's not to say that stuff doesn't work out, which uh, I guess I don't know how long I'll go on about the history of the podcast or maybe this will end up being two different episodes. I don't know. But uh, what was my point? Huh. Uh <laughs> Oh, like uh, giving up, stopping. Oh, that's not to say like uh, that uh, there isn't times to change or to give up or change direction because the podcast wasn't the first thing I tried, right? Uh, and I think that's also important when I talk to people one on one. Is like uh, this might be the thing you make before the thing before before the thing you make before the thing you make uh, because I had a couple other things that uh, I, I felt strongly about that didn't work out. And creatively, but that led, I think those had to, but that I worked on really hard for a while, years. And, uh, that, uh, yeah, that, that led to the podcast. Also, I guess one part of the early podcast development that I, a lot of people know about, but not everybody, maybe if you're newer is I also had to get sober. Uh, uh, I got sober, like, and this has nothing to do with the podcast timing wise. It, 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 like the podcast didn't help get me sober, but it just happened that, uh, the end of my drinking career when it really had to end, uh, came just a couple months after making the podcast. And I mean, there was a couple things that were clear that the podcast probably helped me a little bit on the way it was one, like I really wanted to make the podcast, but that was getting in the way of it. Like even, like, because I was just like, uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to get too big into like addiction and stuff, but like, uh, you know, I was constantly thinking about it. So I'd be like, okay, let me just put it like, uh, like, uh, if, okay, let me just get the, if you re- record this podcast episode, then you can do whatever you want afterwards. Uh, and, but then that didn't, I said, well, let me just have a couple then, and then I'll record the podcast episode. But I wasn't the kind of person that, uh, like once I turned on, uh, it was just, uh, I mean, like, like, uh, when I need to make the podcast, I need to be fully available and even one or two drinks immediately. I was thinking about the third or the fourth one, but it was also like something in me changed, uh, where I wasn't cre- like, uh, and again, this isn't based on chemistry. It's just based on, cause you say, well, that's only like, uh, just something to me changed, and so my whatever creative stuff about the podcast wasn't there anymore or whatever was, I was numb to it. Uh, so whatever, I, I mean, that was just one thing I noticed. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the stuff that pushed me over the hump, but it might've been one little tiny, uh, weight on the scales. Uh, so anyway, you, you, like I just hit, so I started the podcast in October. I actually stopped drinking in like Dece- the end of December or the end of the year, 2013. And that did give me uh, a lot of extra time. Uh, so in sobriety, the podcast, uh, I suddenly had a lot more uh, time. Like even, anyway, I don't want to get too deep. But well, like, because so like, uh, I was making the podcast late at like uh, after work at night on the train to and from work, walking to work because uh, I didn't have a car listening to the podcast episodes on my lunch, any breaks I had. That's I was working on the podcast. Uh, and a lot of that time, not some of that time would have been hung over or the, like the, like late in like nights or, or after work, uh, like, uh, and again, I was a co-parent at the time. So it's like, uh, the nights that I had my daughter, if I got home from work at five thirty you know, realistically, it's five hours I could work on the podcast. And that would have been five hours. I would have been doing other stuff uh, where I wasn't uh, creatively uh, present. Um, So, okay. So then I started making the show and uh, like uh, it basically became like a full-time hobby very quickly because the podcast started to like with shorter episodes and I realized pretty, I don't know how long it took me to realize that I, I don't I, like, uh, I'd have to look back at the episode blanks, but, um, where I realized, okay, this isn't going to work. The episodes need to be over an hour or I'd like them to be. 
And I also started off like writing every single episode ahead of time on the train going to and from work. Uh, so in, in, in the podcast was coming out three times a week. Again, I didn't know, like, again, it was just an experiment and it was based on, oh, well, I wish the podcast would come out five times a week. Uh, and I said, well, if I work every waking minute that I'm not at work, I could get it out three times a week. Uh, and, uh, and, and then I was writing, at first I was writing three different style, like three different fictional stories, uh, I think, uh, on the train. And then we would alternate between those three. And then I was like, wait a second, let's just write, let's just go with one. So then it was like, okay, let's just do after the glass slipper. I think might've been our first series that we just went to full time. And then, uh, and then out of that became like, okay, writing three episodes a week is like uh, nearly impossible. Maybe I could write one episode a week. Um, and, and again, like this was when, like, I was literally like taking the train home, like, uh, and then like writing the episodes, recording them, then editing them and then putting them out the next day. Um, there was like no lead time. And again, it was just a different thing. The show's a different uh, level of quality and really wasn't like a big audience. I know there's some people that are listening now that have been listening the whole time, but for the most part, it was like, uh, and there were no expectations. There wasn't a prior body of work to say, oh, this isn't a, this thing. It was something that was being developed. And so I did that for a while. And I'm trying to think of the historical markers of the show, making it to episode 100 or, you know, 8, whatever. My biggest mistake was making it to episode 25 and then just thinking, okay, let's just make it to 100, I think, till a year. And then it was like, okay, let's just make it to two years once we made it to a year. And I wish, looking back, I have a wish uh, or anybody else to say, well, why don't you check in with yourself every month and see if it's sustainable to keep doing something or what changes maybe you might want to make to take a better care of yourself because that's honestly like a, a wish I have for people is like, don't over, like nothing came from me overdoing it. There was none of the success. Uh, I don't think that's like a, a lesson to be taken. It was like, I was overdoing it and it was probably a part of my personal situation and replacing one thing with another thing or whatever. I don't know what it was, but I would say, because again, like uh, the success of podcast actually came when I pared down to two episodes, and the it like, uh, which I thought was a, one of the biggest setbacks. It was devastating to me, and that was just because we didn't have the support to make three episodes. And it was like this doesn't like like uh, again. It was like this is only because you're doing it. Uh, like there isn't a support there if it was someone else doing it. Uh, so let's just do two episodes. Um, so like times I've cut back on stuff has actually been the times that, that, uh, the podcast has moved forward and improved in quality, but that's ahead of ourselves anyways. So yeah, at some point I started, uh, trying to find someone to edit the show. I found Chris Posty Posterson. Then we started a Patreon and I said, okay, if I could bring in money, enough money through Patreon to pay him to edit one episode a week, then two episodes a week, uh, I think that's where we hit a standby, a standstill, uh, not on the Patreon, but, um, it was like, okay, those were the goals around the Patreon. And that was another mistake I made. And again, kind of go back to my fears and need for certainty was, uh, like, and if you listen to early episodes, maybe hear it, like, um, instead of asking for the value of the, what people were getting out of the podcast to say, Hey, if you're listening to this podcast three times a week, uh, three new episodes, it's probably worth 10 or 20 bucks to you, maybe, or five bucks if you can afford it. I, I uh, and that was my original plan, but I fell into a delusion based on fear and unrealistic expect, like need for certainty. And I changed everything, all, everything that Patreon and, and all the data at the time said this was a bad idea. Because you can only get a tiny, tiny percentage of your audience to support you, uh, un, uh, like just realistically. Uh, so that's why I say, well, if you do, like, uh, 
a tiny percentage of people can are willing to support the show 10 or 20 bucks a month, uh, that can, everybody can benefit from that. But I said, no, sleep with me is, you know, so many people fall asleep to sleep with me. It's different. So I think we could get a lot of people at those levels, but also a ton of people at a dollar a month. Uh, but the numbers that don't aren't based on the number or the amount of money you're asking for. It's just a fixed, more or less a fixed number. And some people will say that's not true, but I've never seen the data to back it up. Like I'd be impressed. Like if someone was like uh, getting four, five, or six, seven percent of their audience, maybe they had. If it, I don't, I'd say, man, that's ama- That's absolutely amazing. But for most shows, it's like one percent or less of people are willing to pay to support the show, no matter if it's a dollar or twenty dollars. I mean, you can't get one percent of people to support you twenty dollars, but uh, it's really hard to get more than one percent of people, no matter how low you're asking. And you can eventually get up uh, like slowly above one percent, but I, I've never seen it above two percent, maybe. Or I don't know. I'm this isn't a good time to discuss the uh, analytics because I'm not good at that. But so I, I was like, oh, okay, we'll be able to get ten percent of people to give a dollar, and then one or two percent of people to give five, ten, or twenty dollars, and that'll pay for the editing, and eventually mean that I, like maybe eventually I could work on I could get paid to work on the podcast a little bit, like at least to equal to like uh, part of what I was getting paid at my day job. And that was a mistake, a big, big mistake. Uh, and it set the podcast back probably uh, for a while because I s- stuck to it for a while until some listeners, I think Wendy and Julie are two of the people I'm thinking of, uh, reached out to me and said, what are you doing? Like, uh, the podcast is not worth a dollar. Uh, I mean, maybe someone casually listened once, but... Uh, uh, I rely on it every single night to fall asleep or I rely on it five, four nights or five nights a week. Uh, so I can hear in your voice, like, uh, you're, you're, uh, letting your self-esteem get in the way or your fear get in the way of, uh, asking for what you and your audience values to show at. And so eventually I changed patterns and eventually the good news was we brought enough money to pay posty twice a week for two episodes a week. And again, it wasn't that, uh, it wasn't a financial thing. It was like from other people's perspective, a freelancer, it's like, well, that's how much time, free time I have, uh, to do work on freelance. And eventually posts started doing, uh, some super deluxe episodes. And then we found Carl W who, um, would edit an episode, would edit an episode a week, uh, and eventually I found out, like, with my day job and just like, okay, like, and need, need sponsors. If I want to, like, uh, I don't know, making the podcast sustainable, I don't know if I want to get caught up in that, to be honest with you. Because, again, it gets into my needs get in the way of all this. Uh, and it's just confusing, like, making something free and then giving it away uh, or having it be sponsor-supported and listener-supported. uh it's, uh, especially for somebody like me, I guess it's a constant growth opportunity. So even talking about it, I'm kind of feeling myself feeling like shut down a little bit. Um, and I guess like, that's like, uh, part of my growth is like saying, man, like, uh, at the same time, like, uh, as hard as it's been, I've been able to make the show and sustain the show. So my wish, I guess is coming true right now is I really am grateful for that fact, uh, that those people came in and supported the show. Those of you, some of you that are listening, that have been there since the beginning and I was able to pay Posty and then have Carl and that helped uh, cleared up more creative space for the show. And then I was able to pay, uh, like uh, for other stuff. And, and then I was able to like slowly cut back on my job, uh, I don't know if I cut back over two years or a year. I can't remember anymore. But where between the kind of the particularly at the time, the Patreon support and then the sponsor support, it was like I was able to save an emergency fund. That's what I did first uh, and then tried to figure out health insurance. And then, uh, well, I guess I got practice doing that because it was like, OK, like uh, if I'm only working half time, I know how much I'm going to have to pay. I had to pay for half my insurance, I think. Maybe, or like, once I went from three-quarter time to half time, I don't know. 
But then when I was half time at work, uh, like working 20 hours a week uh, or 24, maybe I can't remember, but whatever, like uh, where I was like, okay, then how much is like independent insurance going to cost me or whatever from um, the exchange, California exchange. Uh, and then, yeah, then I was able to kind of transition from my job to working on the podcast full time and eventually like uh, try to trim the podcast to where it is sustainable, where I'm trying to be as healthy as I can and set a good example and be available and not overdo it and, and ask for help and get help where I can and, and uh, pay the people that pay people that are involved with the podcast. So, man, I guess it comes back to wishes is like uh, in some sense, my wish came true that I like said, what can I try to do this idea? Will it work? Yeah. And it worked big because, uh, other people out there were willing to help and, and they got something out of it. Uh, and it, it helped people and it did help like, uh, make people feel less alone in the deep, dark night. And it's helped me feel less alone in the deep, dark night of my mind. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, so yeah, but enough about me. Let's get to these listener. If I can find it, uh, the listener wishes here. Okay. Let me see. Okay. So what's your wish? Oh, 54 comments. Cool. Um, Oh, I lost it. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so let's start a bedtime story here uh, where Susan, once upon a time, said, My wish for sleep with me to be a reliable and secure way to Drew to make a nice living as long as he wants to be. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, something I wish, too. It's like, uh, and, and that sleep with me... I guess those are kind of the wishes I didn't share because it's like, yeah, be in other languages or maybe other people doing versions of it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. But, um, and again, I guess that's like my part of it is my own perspective too. It's like, oh, I get to work on this show. It's trying to find that balance between uh, what's under my control and what isn't. Thanks, Susan. And Robert says, all those ones in a row look like hands knocking on a door. I'd like to see a new deep dive into collecting knots, knocks as of some one rapping gently at my chamber door. Yeah, I think we have a couple of knock. I, no, I, I think we have a knock episode coming out. Uh, I don't know if we do. It's something knock related. Uh, Robert, and oh, that's Knox. Uh, you know, I explain it. I think it comes out in the holidays. Uh, is of me, uh, and my dog Koa. We listen to recorded Knox as our hobby, and uh, you find some of those shows in the archives. If you just search for K N O C K S, uh, there should be a few in there. And then, if you're a 10 or 20 dollar patron, you definitely get access to all of them. Uh, yeah, those are uh, fun episodes. Janet would like Ray to meet and shawl Nana. I think they would make a lovely couple. Yeah, I guess, uh, I don't think uh, Ray, uh, Ray, I think Ray kind of is an example. So Ray, the Ray, Ray's uh, my neighbor, and he comes on uh, and does shows. We're getting ready to, oh, but I don't know if it'll come out before or after this, Uh Ray is supposed to do a Halloween themed show for us. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, so yeah. And, and I don't know if, like, uh, Nana doesn't really, uh, I don't think Nana really fit. Uh, Nana's never had her own episode that I know of. Has she though? I'm trying to think of what I recorded. It's hard for me because I record episodes three or four months out. And then this one is like, I'm recording it a little bit sooner. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Nana get, does get some, oh, wait, I thought there was one with Nana in the title. Uh, oh yeah. Nana's, uh, Bartlett's quote of Nana's, uh, quotations, Bar Nana's Bar Bartlett's book of quotations. Did that already come out? I don't think so, but that's scheduled, uh, Janet, uh, Pete says, if you could do one page of an old toy catalog, uh, yeah, we, we actually, we have a toy catalog episode. I think I replied to that. That was recorded, uh, and that'll come out in the holiday season. And we've been doing those uh, 
um, magic episodes, which are kind of similar. Uh, Charlotte asks another random podcast time capsule episode, uh, where you pick episode titles at random and make up a story. Yeah, we did that, Charlotte, with one of the live shows, the 20, what year is it, 2022 live shows. Don't know if it was streamed or recorded, though, um, but I'll have to take a look. Uh, but, yeah, those are fun to use the uh, old episode titles. Okay, then Steven says old catalog. Uh, we Yeah, we, we did do that. Uh, buddy, 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 cat. Uh, that's from cat. Uh and uh cat cat also even made a shirt that says that uh and uh, what would it be like if a few of the characters met up in a coffee shop uh I don't, know, I don't even know i don't know if i have a lot of the character i don't know if i have the ability super doll was one of the ones that taught me the limits of having um like uh lo- like that sleep with me is best when it's like a pair of characters interacting um but yeah, two characters could be at a coffee shop. Uh, I don't know if Bernie, Bernie and Ray's their voices are a little too similar, so it'd be confusing for people. Um, oh, and then it'd be funny to hear them commenting on how I've written their stories. It'd be funny for um, uh, after the glass slipper, I think uh, Agatha and Lady Witchbeard. I'm sure they'd have a lot of comments about it. Uh, Lisa Michelle also knock knock knock. Shout out uh, on a listener's door. Stanley wants to bring back Kiwi Shavers. Uh, Kiwi Shavers is, uh, uh, the podcast gets like, there's a negativity that comes our way on a regular daily basis. And I don't even know if, was that a public episode? But Kiwi Shavers uh, was one of the most emails I've ever gotten, non-positive. Like always the non-positive stuff usually like, we get regular nice stuff on a regular basis, too, so it's not to say that, but uh, the concentrated stuff is always non-positive, and that was one of the most non-positive ones. I think there was, like, only one or two other times where there was, like, a promo or for, for a show or something, uh, but, uh, yeah, so Kiwi Shavers, Stanley, will only make it back as a Patreon uh I could work out a Patreon episode maybe, maybe next summer when I'm where Kiwi Shavers was. But Kiwi Shavers was just a, a Australian accented uh, adventurer named Kiwi Shavers. And he had a saying, I'm trying to think, uh, let's go, it was kind of like, let's go Kiwi Shavers. Uh, that was the kind of rhyme of it. Uh I don't even know what the content was because I haven't listened to an episode in a long time, but it was a fun episode. I remember recording that episode and having tons of fun, but I don't think that's what most listeners, uh, especially on the free feed, are looking for, is me having fun. Uh, um, so, yeah. Uh, let's see. Catalog idea. Wendy likes that. Maybe the Archie McPhee toy catalog. You have to download that and check it out. Yeah. Uh, Brittany... It gives a catalog a shout out. Uh, let's see. E. Margaret says a Roy appearance from Roy G. Biv Institute would be awesome. It would be. I ha- I don't think. I think all the holiday. I have to put that down maybe for twenty twenty three, or um, um. I'm trying to think of what other things Roy G. B. Roy G. Biv Institute. I mean, maybe we could do something about rainbows. Um, but yeah, I think all of 2022, other than this episode and Ray's episode is recorded, uh, I think, uh, knock, knock on wood. Oh, maybe a couple nuns in space episodes. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think, but yeah, Reggie Biv, that's always interesting. Uh, Cornelia, uh, and Snow, like, uh personal episodes it's hard for me to know the personal episodes until they come out because i'm recording so much uh but i think probably the nana's book i'm trying to, i have no yeah i guess i don't have the list of episodes in front of me they've been recorded but i, I know we have like uh um 
So, yeah, I don't know what I have coming up, but I'm sure there's personal episodes recorded. Um, Heidi says, maybe Ray reading a catalog. Um, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. I'd have to take a look at that. Uh, I mean, Ray, uh, see, I have one Ray episode scheduled to be recorded. And then Ray's Father's Day for next year is already recorded uh, for 2023. Uh, Stacy would love old holiday catalog, Christmas catalog. Um, let's see. Chris uh, wanted to uh, uh, access all the um, old Game of Thrones episodes. Those are actually, uh, Chris is a $10 patron, so they're actually in the $10 feed, including a couple all-night episodes. Uh, and then, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not able to take a request for TV recaps. If I ever am in a position to do so, I'll put it out to patrons. Um, but it's just that, again, it's, our planning goes so far out uh, that uh, um, it's just, I, and I get so many different TV requests. And again, it's like, uh, for me, I have to watch the episodes three or four times. So I'm not able to take any TV requests, uh, but those are cool ideas, Chris. Uh, um, you know, oh, and Chris did want to talk about, but there is an Angel Lansbury themed episode that probably came out before this episode, uh, where I came up with the idea for Angel Lansbury Con. Originally, I thought it would be cool to cosplay at it, but then I got kind of got it lost on. Uh, doing a history of, uh, Angela Lansbury roles, uh, and, uh, but, uh, I guess like it'd be cool to go to, I, I think it'd be part of like another, like, I think, I think that was another episode where I was like, oh, let's have some cons and side of cons, uh, particularly there's just a movie with, uh, like a gaming con in there. I can't remember what movie it was, uh. It was like video game characters. I don't know. Was it an old movie? I was rewatching. Wasn't Sonic Two, but not important. Um, let's see. Uh, Bernie the Butterfly. Yeah, Bernie. I don't. I don't think I have any Bernie episodes recorded. Uh, Ted says uh, Bear with the comic uh, comment on its belly. Redo. Maybe you could re-release those. I thought we have re-released them before. Um, I mean, those should all be in the patron feed. We haven't really done any redos of episodes. I've been meaning to do episode one redo. Um, probably like for patrons or something, or maybe for the free feed. So I don't know if that's something we could do eventually. And Kathy loves the Trader Joe's Fearless Flyer episodes. Yeah, those still come out in the, um, occasionally... Like depending on the health, like uh, the health of the Patreon and stuff like that, uh, on um, on uh, what's that thing called, uh, Patreon, uh, and the ten and twenty dollar feeds, and there's a lot in the, even the five dollar feed, uh, and then I might do one for the October live show. Humphrey says, uh, catalogs are TNGs, TNG. Yeah, we have the catalog episodes recorded and then we have TNG on the schedule, uh, but not in the, not like in the 2023 schedule, but no episodes recorded at this point. Um, let's see. Snow says, uh, Ray meets someone at a theme park. Uh, yeah. So kind of more specific episode ideas. Um, which is hard. I, I'm not a, like, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, but yeah, Ray, uh, Ray has met some people, had people at theme parks and had fun, have dinner together. Uh, sounds like an early Ray episode, actually, Snow. Uh, uh, Ray, Ray, uh, yeah, Ray, Ray, Ray's so friendly that, uh, he, he has such an easy job making, uh, connection with other people. Uh, let's see. Uh, L says, uh, the personal stories. Yeah, I think we have, um, again, I, maybe I could look if I have a chance. Oh no, none of my devices will look up that, uh, where we keep all the episodes that I've recorded. I mean, he can't look in. Let's see. I want to get through all these. So, um, 
Clara, Clara says, uh, wish for another board game unboxing. There is one recorded. I don't think it's scheduled for this year. I think it's a 2023 episode. It's uh, a two. Oh, no. It's an unboxing of one game and then a bunch of uh, stuff from another gaming company. So that's coming up. I just don't think. Uh, I don't know. There's a couple. Uh, what are we in? August. Uh, I don't know what the openings are. It could be coming out this year. Clara, 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 Clara. Clara sorry. Um, yeah. Constant says love hearing Scooter's personal stories, but uh, uh, hope that no matter what, how much tension we hold or interest we have, we ex- exhale and uh, drift off into deep slumber. Uh, thanks, Constance. Yeah, it's kind of share that wish. Uh, uh, but I mean, it is an important reminder. Like, there is a percentage of people that listen to the show, and I'm glad you're. I'm here with me you right now. Uh, that can't sleep uh, or that need a break during the day. And that's the show's kind of also designed with them in mind to keep everybody company. Not that I'm not, not that you were saying that Constance, but, uh, if you can't sleep, I just want you to know, like, uh, there is no pressure to fall asleep. I'm going to be here to the very end for you. And I think that helps the people that are relaxed in a deep slumber in some sense. Alexander says personal story. Uh, be cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I've got a couple coming up, uh, Let's see, Stacy would like, a, uh, this is kind of a uh, more specific, like an episode about Speed Racer, uh, and then the one involving Count Chocula, uh, and then uh, both uh, Stacy and Mars wish for peace uh, um, throughout the world, uh, and in specific places too, um, and sending our love to everybody in the Ukraine. Um yeah, I haven't had any visits from any serial uh, people lately, uh, Stacy. But uh, yeah, uh, have to check it out uh, at some point. Um, and then yeah, Speed Racer again. It's just hard for me to. Uh, it's, it's not possible for me to take a TV show suggestions. I mean, at some point, if I, if there's like a like I was in a position to do so, I'd put it out to everybody. Elizabeth says another season of Otter Things or something similar. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd do that um, at some point. I, um, the first half of 2023, we have something, our new series after Nuns in Space uh, scheduled. Uh, and I'm not sure about the back half of 2023 yet. Um, let see. Lenny or Leany says I'd like an episode featuring... Oh, me out of breath with a cool hit on my face. That's kind of a personal story. Uh, uh, I, I constantly out of breath, uh, sharing stories. Uh, Alexander loves trending Tuesdays. They'll still come out every third episode. Alexander, we just don't call them trending Tuesday episodes anymore. Um, I wish for something like the robes fashion show episode. Those, uh, I think that comes up again as the, uh, with the Kuzak family. And yeah, like regular characters, they usually record two or three episodes a year. Um, like of Robes Fashion Show and stuff. Not sure if, again, I'm not sure if they've recorded anything. Like, uh, I know there's a Spelling Bee episode and uh, a Bartlett's Quotations from Nan episode. I don't know if the Kuzaks were involved in either one of those. And they may have been at one of the live shows, but I'm not sure. Get them not that. Uh, yeah. Uh, Lauren would love to hear a story about uh, Scoots as a kid in the great outdoors. Uh, Paul would like the etymology of supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Uh, yeah. And even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious, uh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Marie would like to hear uh, to library and talk about books. Uh, I always read before bed. Yeah, me too. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to go to, I, I'm trying to get access to uh, some of the couple different archives, uh, but I haven't heard back from those places. Uh, 
and then uh, more real time recipe episodes. Yeah, I'm, I, I've ran out of recipes is a problem. And I think our writing, like we're not in a position to, uh, pay for recipes right now. Um, and we don't do any non paid work for this podcast. Uh, so as I develop more recipes, I'll do more real time recipe episodes. It's just a matter of, um, can't use, I don't want to use anybody else's recipes unless they're being compensated. Um, yeah. And this is Debbie says, yeah, Kuzang, 20 step skin, skin, skin care, uh, and the robes one are some people's favorites, uh, including, uh, Debbie's. Yeah. Those are fun. Uh, Raina says, uh, Maybe a show with Antonio Banderas and Carol King as guests. Uh, more from the Boredom Institute. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the Boredom Institute. I pitched somebody on that, um, like a sponsor or something, or something, or maybe we didn't. I can't remember. Didn't get like in the same with. Uh, uh, we don't have any guests on the show. Uh, even the fake guests we have, I get angry emails about. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. And, uh, let's see. Mary says, uh, I don't know if I understood the prompt. Uh, Mr. Turtle pool filled with rare beanie babies. Uh, uh, something specific as an element that could pop up in a show. It just did uh, very random. Uh, that's how it works. I'm new here. Thanks, Mary. And thanks to everybody for your wishes. Uh, and uh, your, all your wishes got into a podcast. I can't make it. I mean, I'm not really in a place to be able to make it. We don't, you know, it's just hard with the show. Maybe you heard it because of all the distance planning we do that we can't take episode submissions. So this was a fun way to do it, I guess, because uh, uh, I normally can't uh, do it uh, with regular episodes. But it's fun. Uh, and, yeah, couldn't have made it to 11.11 without any of you. Uh, even if you're new, uh, the, the show that way, cause I knew like maybe the podcast would be there waiting for somebody to discover it. Even when it was early on, it was like, uh, you know, you, you kind of, as a fan, that's another thing I tell people. And I wish for you as a fan of stuff to be like, well, I want to make something. I'm a fan of this. Uh, you don't really like, uh, have to, to, to do the same thing as what you're a fan of, but it's like, Oh, I want to make this experience for someone else, uh, for it to be waiting to be discovered. Uh, and that's kind of like wish I have, uh, for the people out there that are listening now or listening one day that is sleeping me is waiting for you to be waiting for you to discover it. Hopefully you like, you feel seen and welcomed in to like a kind of virtual safe place where you could get the rest you would need. You could breathe, uh, and your, I can take your mind off stuff and keep you company so that you could fall asleep. Uh, it's made a lot of my w- wishes I never even would have known to have come true. So thank you so much, uh, everybody. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for the podcaster who's wearing a watch, uh, but I don't need, you know what time it is. It's time for me to go off topic, get mixed up. It's time for me to keep you company. Uh, cause you, cause, uh, that's kind of what I do. That's, uh, also, I was trying to think of more witty things to say about not having a watch. Uh, you're here just in time for me to go off topic and get mixed up. And if you say, I don't know what you're talking about. I thought this was a sleep podcast meant to keep you company. So you're not alone in the deep, dark night to take your mind off stuff so you could fall asleep. You're the most important part of the show. But this podcast is very different. Uh, not, not for everybody. Give it a few tries. See how it goes. The structure show is uh, I'm going to do uh, some support for the podcast. And there'll be an intro to help you ease you into bedtime. And there'll be an episodically modular bedtime story you could listen to in any order. And it's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. And uh, thanks for making it possible, patrons. Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning 
mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep, well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights, and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever is keeping you awake, whether it's things on your mind that you're thinking about. So thoughts, you know, things you're thinking about, that uh, about the past, the present, the future, all those thoughts can come up in my head as at bedtime. So it could be thoughts, it could be feelings, anything you're feeling physically that's keeping you awake. Uh, it could be f- feelings, emotions uh, related to the thoughts or physical sensations or something else. You know, you could be anticipating something, you could be traveling, you could have guests, it could be those changes in the, the weather, or, or it could be something else. Whatever it is that's keeping you awake, I'm here to take your mind off of that and keep you company so that you could fall asleep. And, you know, sometimes we just don't know what it is. Uh, I'm going through that right now. Not even during, you know, you say, oh, I got a case of the, um, the, the blahs is the underselling of it, but a case of the blahs, you know. And so whatever it is that's keeping you awake, I'm here to take your mind off it, as I said, and keep you company so that you could fall asleep. The way I do it on the podcast is I send my voice across the deep, dark night. I'm going to use lulling, soothing, creaky, dulcet tones, uh, pointless meanders, and superfluous tangents. So that means my voice is not traditionally soothing, but it's more not bad. You say, well, his voice is okay. It's, uh, it's not great, but it, you know, I don't really, it's the kind of voice I don't want to pay, I, like, I don't mind, but I don't need to pay attention to. So that's a creaky dulcet tone. It's pointless meanders and superfluous tangents mean that I'll go off topic. I'll get mixed up in the middle of talking about one thing. Then I'll remember something else. Then I'll try to remember what I was remember, talking about. Then I won't remember then I'll get distracted, then I'll go on a tangent, and then hopefully I could get back to, you know, the original point, if there was one. At that point, it'll be more like the original nub, but which I have on the back of my head. That comes up every once in a while. And then, and then I get to misuse the word vestigial. I have a vesti- like, it's not a vestigial nub. I guess the nub, ideally, would be remnant of some, something vestigial that's no longer there. But I don't know if that's the right word even. It's a word I use incorrectly many times, and, and, and that would be a superfluous tangent. You might say, Scoots, I'm new to the show. Tell me more about this. Before you get to the podcast and everything, uh, what do you mean a nub? It's a great question. It's very small, not not noticeable because my hair covers it. So even when I don't have hair, sometimes there'll be a bald spot there when I would go to a barber because... Uh, they wouldn't even notice the nub till they were buzzing it. Uh, and then because the nub is, it's a raised area made of B O N E, uh, underneath, you know, you can only feel it. Uh, to me, you'd say, what do you like? I've talked about this, but it's been a while. I always imagined as a kid that it was like a, like once I figured out what a ball, it took me a long time to understand what a ballpoint pen was. Uh, I don't know why, and I don't know why I, I'm someone who thinks about, I mean, I guess that's why I make a sleep podcast. You, so you spent a lot of your childhood thinking about ballpoint pens? No, the ballpoint that became a selling point at some point during my youth. It, here's the thing, here's a, like, a, I don't like to throw these words out there, but one of the greatest, uh, uh, I guess the only word I can say is S C A M. Ever ever pulled in the in the late eighties and early nineties was erasable the erasable ink. And any left hander that was school age or professional during that era will tell you that uh for some reason that one does not get the press it deserves. Uh, maybe now they have erasable ink, but here's the thing they should have called it ink that doesn't really dry. So it makes a giant mess if you're left-handed or messy or anybody's going to touch it. By the way, you could erase it, but it's because mostly because it's not dry, maybe. I don't know. Or it's just not like uh, it's ink-like. But, I, okay, back to my – back. To, there's a tangent within a tangent. So 
At some point, I started to imagine this snub, not snub, nub, in the back of my head. Oh, where is it? Um, Good question. If you're right in the middle of the back of my head, but towards the bottom, like the the top of my neck, the bottom, which is the middle, you know, right around, like if you were looking at the back of my head and you had like some, you're doing some sort of measurements, or for now, you know, am, uh, amateur, if you're an amateur phrenologist, uh, you'd say it's pretty close, to, uh, closely aligned with your ear, your uh, ear holes or whatever. But I mean, I would say it's probably somewhere where my amygdala meets my cranium, but I'm not, you know, but but that's probably incorrect. Uh, uh, it's probably why my lizard brain stays extra, extra active. Uh, it's uh, in my mammalian brain. They're in constant, they're in constant flux because my nub, uh, you'd think it would offer extra protection, but it's a vesti- whatever a vestigial you had maybe did. And then my br- those parts of my brain are my, my, the old brain stem. Oh, what was they saying? I don't know. I had another topic in there. Oh, so I used to fantasize that it was a ball and I'm not kidding. Not when I was a little kid either, when I was of a, a pen using age, which probably is high school, I guess. And middle school, uh, I don't even know if middle school you're allowed to use pen. And that's when they tried to push these, like, uh, and they said, why is your paper such a mess? They say, why don't you call one of these, uh, why don't you call Big Ink and uh, why don't you call Big Pen? There's only two companies that make these things. And uh, clearly they're up to some, uh, my papers, it's not my fault. My paper's a mess. I was hoping they have the option to erase all my mistakes. Uh Clearly, that's bad. Clearly, as always, that backfires on me. Uh, so, okay. Oh, so I used to just imagine, I guess that was, this may be one of the more boring tangents I've ever gone on. I just took six or seven minutes to explain a story that said, and then I imagined a nub within my head was a ball, like in a ballpoint pen, even though it's not like a ball bearing. And I would rub the back of my head against something hard, like a wall or a really high back, any any smooth uh, object, uh, always upright. I never did it lying down, probably too much gravity. And I would imagine that it was a ballpoint pen. I wouldn't imagine I was writing or drawing. Great question you you just thought of there. I just I don't know. Uh, yeah. This is how you become a sleep podcaster, uh, clearly. Yeah, I didn't imagine. Those are, these are good questions, reasonable questions you're thinking of. Uh, did I imagine I was drawing something or writing something? No. I just imagined that there was a, just imagining of the, it's like almost like if I was writing fan fiction about the ball in a ballpoint pen. The ballpoint pen ball. I guess that'll be tonight's episode. Let me write that down. There's a delicious piece of irony. You know, I did that with a ballpoint pen, of course. Uh, first, it, it took me a while to find it. Big, made by, free free pen, but made by one of the big pen companies. I don't even know if all, both of them are still around. There's been more, I think when I was a kid, there was only two. Now there's more, at least there's more brands. There might only be one or two companies that own the brands. Okay, so where was I? I was trying to introduce a sleep podcast that has pointless meanders and superfluous tangents. Well, and uh, I have no idea, like, really why I brought any of that up. But other than as an example of stuff that will take your mind off of stuff and keep you company. And the, the reason I make the show, that's kind of the most important thing I'll tell you. I make the show because I've been there. Oh, boy. Trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep right now and uh, tossing and turning and mind racing. But whatever it is that's keeping you awake, I'm here to take your mind off of that because you deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve a place you could get some rest and not have to worry about it. Uh, So I'm here to help uh, if I can with that uh, and... And like, uh, because the reality is not only do you deserve a good night's sleep, but but if you get the rest you need and you deserve like a bedtime, you don't dread, uh, your life's going to be better. Your life's going to be more manageable. That means the world we live, it's important. It's important to me and it's important to the people around you. And it's important to everybody listening to the show because they can relate. 
So I'm glad you're here. Now, the thing is, this podcast is very different. You already heard, I mean, you already are like, holy cow, this guy, he's really publicly sharing. And they say, no, this isn't the third or fourth time I've talked about my nub. Uh, I've moved, we, we, I think it, we came up with a couple of songs, Emmett Otter and the Jug Band. They, 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 you know, they came up with songs about it. Talked about how it's good for, uh, if I had a cap, uh, with the plastic, the, the caps with the plastic thing, you can hook it, hook, hook, and, hook, hook, and, hook, hook, hook under my nub or whatever. Other than that, it's good for like, uh, the middle stages of a relationship for the other person to laugh at me, you know, it, it brings levity in that situation. Doesn't bother me. I'm not self-conscious about my nub. I, you know, except when it gets buzzed, uh, but I don't get a buzz cut anymore or that kind of barber cut. Uh, but that's more because I have to answer the question. They say, you got a little, oh, I say, that's my nub. That's the old nub, that's the nub buzz. Uh, what if I rub your nub, I'll get a buzz? No, I don't think so. Uh, okay, so, oh, so the spy cast is very different. Give it a few tries. That's what a, a million people probably have said. It takes two or three tries to get used to the show. Because it is something you don't really listen to. You just kind of barely listen. I'm more here to keep you company than to put you to sleep. I'm here to be your boar friend, your boar bay, your boar sib, your boar cuz, your boar bestie, your neighbor, your boar burr, your friend in the deep dark night to keep you company uh, so that you can fall asleep. Whether you're awake or asleep, I'm here. So some people, they can't sleep. They listen to the show because they're not going to sleep. And I'm here to keep you company if you can't sleep. But I'm here to keep you company just as much if you're not listening to me at all or you got me on a mumble, whatever it is. I'm here to take your mind off of stuff and be a presence, even if it's just a mumbling, rambling presence across a room or in another room. My job is to be here for you. And ideally, that gives you enough distraction or comfort so that you can fall asleep or that it takes away some of that feeling in the deep, dark night. Like I said, when you got a case of the, something stronger than the blahs, uh, as I, I have, uh, going on a little bit, uh, but by the time you hear this, the, like I'll be, you know, I, I have, I have plenty of th- resources to deal with my b- b- blahs. Uh, and I record these episodes months and months before they come out. So thank you for thinking about me. And that get, being, being one of the things is that being a service and being a help helps me. So uh, this is a podcast you don't really listen to. It doesn't really put you to sleep. It more keeps you company. It's very different. Not everybody likes it. Some people loathe it. If you already loathe it, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you has plenty of other options there for you to check out other sleep podcasts and other sleepy stuff. Cause whether you like me or the show or not, it doesn't change the fact you deserve a good night's sleep. So those options are out there. And what else do you need to know? What else can I help you with? Um, I don't know. Uh, not going to put you to sleep. I'm here to take your mind off stuff. Oh, structure the show. That's the last thing I got to tell you about. Show starts off. It's structured in a very specific way. Starts off with a greeting, friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, so you feel seen and welcome. Uh, and you say, okay, maybe I could check this show out. And maybe I say something silly or lighthearted. You say, okay, this might be my style. Then there's support for the show. So the podcast is free twice a week for whoever wants to listen with over 500 episodes in the archives. What makes that possible are the people that directly support the show or support the sponsors. And that's how we're able to put in all the work it takes to be here for you for free twice a week. Then there's support for listeners who are having a tough time and support for communities around the show. Then there's an intro. And the intro, some people associate with the sponsors and the support, but it's a show within a show to give you time to wind down, to give you some transition from wake to sleep. So you can use the intro in different ways. You could use it while you're getting ready for bed, while you're in bed, or while you're doing some other chill activity, or while you're drifting off. Uh, But the intro is designed to ease you into bedtime. And it's different every time, so it has a piece of some some familiar structure, but some variety. So whatever part of you is keeping you awake, you can't adjust and say, oh boy, here comes Scoots again. 
a thousand times he's talked to say, nope, now he's going to talk about uh, ballpoint pens, fan fiction or whatever. So uh, that's the, the intro. There's a couple percentage of people that skip the intro. There's a couple thousand people that pay to listen to story only episodes, but there's more people that pay to listen to all intro episodes, I think, or maybe it's about the same. So just kind of see how it goes at first. You can set a sleep timer. You can listen all night. Uh, you know, just to, but the, the intro is a part of the show uh, to, 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 as a part of people's bedtime and wind down routines. Uh, then there's support again between the intro and the story. So the show could be free and it's optional to pay for instead of being a part of a paid service or whatever. So that's uh, the, the, the intro, then the, the support, then there'll be a story. Apparently tonight will be the ballpoint ball. I don't know. I'll, I'll try. I'll think of whatever. I don't know. We'll come up with a story for about ballpoint pens or something, or maybe erasable ink. And, uh, yeah, and then there's thank yous at the end. So this is the structure of the show. That's why I make this show. I'm glad you're here. I work really hard at your next drive. I really appreciate you coming by. And I really hope I, hope I can help you get to sleep. Uh, and here's a couple ways I'm able to do it for you for free twice a week. All right, everybody. It's uh, Scoots here. It's, it's tonight's episode. Apparently, according to the to the, the message I got from past Scoots, is called the Midnight Ball Ball. Or the no 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 not the Midnight Ball Ball, but the uh, it's called the, the Ballpoint Ben Ballpoint Pen Ball. And, uh, I don't know, I guess like I was thinking, well, what would that episode be about? It's not obvious. And then I realized I haven't done a, a my life with a perm episode in a long time. And, uh, I did talk about erasable ink pens, which happened to coincide with, uh, my awareness of my hair as a liability as a child or a young adolescent or pre adolescent so, and that, that was when I was using erasable ink pens. So I'm wondering if there's a way we could build some bridges uh, from the past uh, to the present into another world where, uh, I don't know, things go well. So if you're new, it, it, it's been years, I think, since we've done um, a uh, My Life with a Perm episode. So I will set this up uh, is uh, Once Upon a Time... I was a young lad, and uh, like other young lads, uh, I had, you, you know, I, I was born with hair, you know, hair follicles, like a lot of people. Now, my hair is very thin and very fine. And when I say thin, I guess, I don't know, because I only have my head of hair, and I don't think it's really appropriate, e even with someone, I've never really looked at a lot of people's scalps before you know and uh, studied their hair so honestly i don't know what people mean when they say thin hair like i wonder for me this is so this is just speculation but i'm pretty sure i'm right uh, when i say my hair is thin i think it's a twofold thing i think my actual hairs if you were to measure them their their diameter is thinner than uh like other ones, like, so you have different uh, podcast or, uh, podcasts, so, so, like you have different pasta sizes, right? Like, I think you got your spaghetti. I don't know. Is a linguine flat or is a linguine a uh, circle too? But you have your spaghetti and angel hair would be in fettuccine. There's fettuccine linguine. Think fettuccine's flat, uh, linguine. I don't know. But so you have different types of pasta. There's different shapes. I mean, if you had linguine, like a flat hair follicle, that would, you'd probably be famous. Uh, or, you know, that'd be, I'm sure, I wonder if there is. Uh, but so, um, where was I? Uh, like, so, um, so I'm, I'm presuming, and this is a presumption, that the diameter of my hair, much thinner than, I don't think many people have angel hair thickness uh, hair. So you say, wow, it, like Angel must have a very strong core and, and you know, bone structure to hold up the hair that, that is the diameter of Angel hair pasta. Also, what the heck, who came up with that? I, I mean, I'm sure it was a marketing term, but it's like, no, no, no. 
first of all, the angels would be like, we don't need you eating our hair. It's just hair. It's for uh, no one, even in heaven, we don't know. The, uh, it's to keep our heads warm, I guess, uh, technically. Uh, we And keep the sun off our heads, maybe. I don't know. Uh, we, like, we don't think about it. Angels, we kind of, t- we, we're in such great shape. We don't, we take our hair for granted. We don't even think about our hair. Uh, so don't eat, you we shouldn't be eating it even symbolically. That is, uh, you know, hum- humans, you're so interesting. Really, you named a pot, you're eating a pasta named after our hair. Do you think about it when you're eating? Not really. You just think, oh, this is thinner than spaghetti. Great. Uh, that's all I think about. Um, so, oh, so oh, what was I talking about? My hair. So my hair, I would assume, is 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 thinner in that sense. And I think it's probably more spread out, uh, which is probably when people say you have thin, because when you say you have thinning hair, I think that means the space between the follicles is less, uh, like, uh, yeah, it's like, I'm trying to, less dense, your density per square, per square micrometer or whatever. So I think my hair follicles are probably more spread out than someone that has a more robust head of hair. And so I don't know, like, because you can even see it when your hair gets buzzed. When my hair gets buzzed, you can see a lot of scalp. But other people, I think, uh, and I don't know if that's the density, both uh, the distribution of follicles or the diameter of the hair the follicle produces. Uh, But for me, both of those are on the thin side, always have been. So that's one part of my hair that that's important is it's thin or fine. I guess, oh, you say your hair is fine. So I guess that's another way of saying uh, when they say fine, though, that means your strands are uh, of low, like a lower diameter. Now, the good thing about that is my hair is very soft. Uh, I mean, I don't mind saying it's uh, it's soft. It's also my hair is incredibly straight. Now, people will look at my hair today and say, it looks like it has some bends to it, but it, it uh, it's mostly either product that's moving my hair, you know, holding my hair, or uh, natural uh, greases uh, if, you, if my hair looks like it's falling in place. And I do wonder about my part, but let's stick with my hair, my actual physical properties of my hair. And if you say, like, give me a way to describe it, say, like, you, some people hear, you hear hair described like corn silk. And I would say, like, idealized corn silk, because when you get down to corn silk, you're like, what the heck, this stuff, uh, like, just like angel hair pasta. Like, when you're actually dealing with corn silk, you're like, this is not something, but, but like, uh, you know what I mean? So my hair was always, it just, and it just fell like it, oh, it also grows, like I've been told it grows in the wrong direction. Like, and I think somebody tried to describe it to me, like most people's hair follicles are pointed maybe backwards. My hair follicles are maybe pointed a little bit more forwards. This could be speculation as well. Uh, but you know, let's speculate, you know, why not, uh. So those are a couple pieces of information about my hair. And uh, and then I don't believe I have a natural part. Because even now, like the, like I've been getting my hair uh, cut uh, or, you know, glamour, whatever, by, since I grew it out uh, as a part of the um, past couple of years, um, the... Uh, the, the the woman that does my hair beyond the ponytail. If you want to check check Angela, uh, check check her out on Twitter. Uh, she she does part my hair in a certain way and then cut my hair. So I don't know, I, like uh, and I don't even know. I don't know if I. I mean, I guess because my own experience, I said, is there really a natural part in people's hair or not? And I, I mean, I'd like to get on someone like an anthropologist or, you know, to say, oh, like, really? Like, uh, our hair, I mean, I, maybe there is isn't. they said, well, you can see, but if you didn't cut your hair or your bangs and you had a natural part, it'd be easier to see stuff. Uh, and I say, okay, I could buy that for right now. So those are a couple things about my hair. Like, that's a little bit of a uh, hair background. So, th- So what that means is that, 
Now, as a child, you get you you get the hair you you get you, like I guess a part of me just said you get the hair you deserve, and I say, oh boy, thanks for not, thanks a lot, and that's what the angel you get the angel hair you deserve or the, not the angel hair, and I say, well, maybe that's true. Maybe it led me. I mean, I guess that's what these are all about. You get the hair you need to become who you're going to be or whatever, and that road is not all it has its bumps and. Uh, you know, yeah, so it's not always easy. So, but so, um, uh, okay, so my hair, though, my hair cuts before as a child. We'll just run through them for your own entertainment. So, I mostly had a bowl, bowl cut or like some sort of bangs. I wouldn't say a bowl cut because, uh, like uh, the bowl cut is not, it's more of like a two bowl cut because uh, your bangs were one layer trimmed one way and then the back of your hair was trimmed another. Though there were times I had a bowl cut. But most of the time it was like a two layer, like a two way thing. And so, um, uh, it, you know, most of your childhood, you don't really care, right? Like uh, your hair is just your hair. I mean, maybe some people do, or maybe it's part of your family value system, and that's fine. And if you have good hair, or you come from a hair family with high hair value, and you have good hair, or you're taught how to groom it, maybe that's like part becomes part of your. I mean, maybe in a positive way, it becomes part of your identity. For me, initially, it wasn't really part of my identity. I just didn't think about it very much. Uh, and I guess this goes back to the thinness is, again, when my hair is just lying flat against my scalp, uh, there's not much of a protective layer there. Like, literally, it's like uh, like like having just wearing a piece of paper where, you know, so you see some people have a lot thicker hair. Like the the idea that my hair is providing warmth. I mean, I guess it is does provide some reflectivity. So so that was my haircut for most of my childhood until, and even into um up until at least sixth grade, I did I had no hair awareness. My hair awareness was zero. Uh, in. I don't know the first time, I don't think that, like, I think in like fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and this might be a little strong for some people, though, the things that kids point out, like, they don't start pointing out your hair until, uh, pub pre -pub -pub you know, pre like, till your adolescence, right? That, uh, they're, they have other things, like your clothes. There's other more, I had more obvious things, uh, other than my hair that it weren't necessarily going for me. But then, like, around fifth or sixth grade, like, I was behind the times, right, because I was just uh, aloof and, like, just, but some of my friends, you know, they started to get into pairings or, you know, imaginary pairings or, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, hand-holding and that kind of stuff. And then, but then you go into seventh and eighth grade and everybody's, uh, growing up at a different speed, right? And that causes some ruckus, uh, and it causes a realignment of values. And even in there, I'd have to look at pictures of myself. I don't think I really cared about my hair, even in, at least in seventh grade. Now, at that point, it did become a uh, hurdle. And I'll have to try to figure out what I looked like back then. Uh, but my hair was still thin and fine. And, you know, I, but again, I had other things not going for me, but that was like the high point of my life. I mean, I'll be honest with you, seventh grade, and this is going to sound like I'm being ironic or uh, self-deprecating, but it's the truth. It was probably the best thing that ever happened to me um, was that we had tracking in our school, right? Uh, and so the, the school I went to had five seventh grades. Uh, Seven one, seven two, seven three, seven four, and seven five. And seven one was for the kids. The, however, they decided it. Uh, they the, the, and they didn't have. This wasn't to assist us uh, because they didn't have. Like I think they had some basic assistance for people with learning differences, but this wasn't like how it is today. Like where it's like, okay, these are the, the kids. We're going to focus on some uh, their learning differences and help them. This was more like, give us everyone, 
and they had one other group that was like, like also like uh, challenging, but that's going to be challenging for the teacher, for classroom management. Uh, and they said, whatever is going to cause, you know, there's different ways you're going to disrupt the classroom. Let's gather all those kids in one place. And honestly, I mean, I don't think the 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 higher set the higher you got in the sevens, their expectation for your success was much higher. I mean, that's just the truth. And that seven five was like the advanced kids, and seven one was the exact contrast to that. But that was like if I look back and you say, what was the happiest you were in your life, uh, where there was like a balance of um like where you were being yourself and you weren't overthinking it. Uh, you had the freedom to be yourself and you hadn't had the, like, uh, you know, and I mean, I think it was cause I was pre adolescent I was behind the, the, you know, I was lower on the curve. So my evolution hadn't kicked in. So, um, so I was so happy because I was among people I could relate to really like, uh, people that had, uh, trouble with authority figures and maybe they couldn't, they had their troubles manifested in different ways and people that were at my level. And for the most part, the teachers really did, did well. It wasn't like, uh, I have a lot of memories of te- like, like, uh, like, so, so it was like, I don't know. Like, I was just so happy. I was socially, like, I felt like it was so comfortable. So it was like this amazing time in seventh grade and eighth grade. And I don't know, but at some point between eighth grade and 10th grade, my hair became what I would uh, describe as a problem. Now, that was because at seventh grade, I still had, what is that called? Like, not innocence, but I still wasn't overly consumed with my attraction to, 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 to like, or my image and how it related to me being attractive to, to, to girls I was attracted to. And kind of obsessing about that, right? And, uh, but at some point between eighth grade, you know, between eighth and 10th grade, that like slowly dawned on me that one of the pro, like, and, and again, I was actually incorrect uh, in some sense, but one of, I assumed that one of the things I, under my control that was affecting this was my hair. And, a lot of my friends had good hair. That's one of the things I always talk about on this, my life with the perm thing is that my friends had good hair. And so I took it under my, and we all got our haircut at the same place. And I would try different haircuts, parting it in the middle, greasing it. At one point, um, I guess it looked like Marty McFly because it was like a close, close cut and then long and then whatever. And then some, some classmates tried to help me and they said, Hey, do, like, go, like, just let your hair flow. And, and, and now that's where I'm at. I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. And that never worked out. And then I, I guess then I grew really long bangs, like to my chin and I would wear a hat or whatever. Like, uh, I just had that super long bang look, but very unstyled and, and like, uh, but not in a way of like total confidence. Like I was hiding behind my bangs, uh, and it was like a way of saying, I don't care about my hair instead of loving it. And then, um, at some point in adulthood, again, I still had the same problem. Um, and it's supposed to be, I never had like a business job, but you know, I had jobs I had to go to. And at some point, like in my, maybe my twenties or thirties, I was like, oh, let me just buzz my hair. Then I don't have to think about it at all. And I guess that became like, it was like, okay, that's just how it's going to be now. It's like, but I'm going to be a buzz cut guy. And then what happened during 2020, like I said, oh, I'll just grow my hair out anyway. And then I had the idea, oh, maybe we could raise money for, for, for a nonprofit if I get, grow my hair out and get a perm. But people then, it's hard to get people that listen, they're falling asleep to a podcast to do stuff. So we couldn't even, couldn't really get anybody involved with that. And so that didn't work, but I kept growing my hair out. And then I realized, huh, like, uh, if, if, like, I, like it went through a very strange phase, but then I said, oh, wait, I like kind of having hair. And then I found someone that's, uh, very capable. And she actually took the time to kind of get to know what she was working with. And the best way to approach it, 
And so then it's like, okay, now at this point, I'm like, I'm fine with my hair. Like, and it's like people, and I'm saying, okay, sometimes it looks a little bit like uh, 70s or whatever, but I'm like, whatever. So all that said, that's kind of sets up this idea of my life with a perm, which we'll jump to. So, uh, so my hair was uh, dissatisfactory and, 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 but so I always wonder if there's, you know, and now, you know, again, these, uh, how the how purveyors of, uh, universe, you know, different universes. Now we've had this particular year or I guess over a year, not a calendar year. We've had, uh, a great, a really good TV show about multiverses. We had a great independent movie. Or I guess I'm saying it's independent, uh, but uh, uh, everything, everywhere, all at once uh, about uh, different universes and uh, probably different. Well, yeah, then uh, different movies with multi, you know, multiverses, whatever it is. So we've had a lot of this uh, pervade to us in different ways or, yeah. But for me, like, this was pretty, you know, I, I said, is there a universe where I have good hair and am I living? And I mean, obviously, I say, of course, but I say, okay, could I access that world, please? Uh, and uh, I say, don't judge that version of yourselves outside by your insides. Uh, they never, they, that's what they always say. They don't show that in the Marvel movies or the, you know, uh, I don't know if maybe if anyone could have that conversation, it would be Michelle Yeoh to say, OK, don't judge because uh, that's what, kind of what she was going through. Right. Her. Right. Is that in that? I mean, part of it. So but so, yeah. And, and the reason I ask that is, that, is just like we're splitting hairs now. They say the, the, who say, oh, boy, the great uh, cr- creators of uh, multiverse fiction. That's who they is. But in this, they say, okay, when a decision is made, that's when the universe is split. I think that's explained multiple times in multiple different ways. And so in my life, that did happen, really. This isn't fiction. When Frank Z, who cut my friend's hair, and again, this was with some of my friends that already hit puberty. I had not, uh, some of them had a self-confidence or like a, uh, you know, the, the, the attractiveness that I did not have. And I was always judging their, you know, my insides by their outsides too. But they all got, to, or one of my friends got their hair with this guy, Frank Z. Then we all started getting our hair cut there. And we'd only go to Frank Z. So the poor other, every once in a while, I would, I would be afraid and I would just go with another barber. And my friend said, you know, afterwards we do, they say, the reason your hair looks like that is because you didn't get it from Frank. Uh, you got to wait and, and, and be patient uh, and say no. So it was an opportunity. For, that was an opportunity for me to learn a boundary. And be like, there's a reason that guy is four chairs down from Frank. Uh, and they'd say, because, uh, but whatever. Uh, so eventually I would wait for Frank. Now, Frank had, uh, I, I believe at the time, a perm. And, uh, and that, that, that just sticks out to me in my memory. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not on perms on, on dudes, uh, like they've gone in and out of fashion and I don't, but I, I don't know, like I'd be hard pressed to say who wore it, who wore it well. I'm sure there are people and that'd be cool to point out to me, like, uh, who wore a perm well, like, and not just natural curly hair. I'm talking about f- fake natural curly hair. Cause I could tell you, I have some cousins that had curly, naturally very curly hair and they wore it well, like, uh, uh, Matt Miles and, and still, uh, like, uh, what was my point? Okay. So one time I was getting my hair cut from Frank. And after Frank started cutting my hair, one of his things was that I had so many cowlicks, uh, and he loathed my cowlicks. Uh, and I think, I guess a cowlick is that the cow's saliva is so uh, non viscous that if a cow was to lick your head, your hair would stand up. But it's if a cow licked me at all, all my hair would stand up, first off. 
Like, why is the cow so, why is the cow licking me? Why is the cow so close? Why is the cow licking my head? My hair is going to stand up. Uh, I mean, maybe even stands up because it tick. I mean, I would presume it would tickle. Like, even if it was, if it was a surprise, my hair would stand up. If it was some sort of strange, like unexpected thing, it would, or if it was like, Hey, come over and meet Birdie. She's, uh, she's going to lick you. She's the cow that licks people. She loves it. It's good for her too. So she keeps her salt up. Uh, so don't worry about it. She's going to, Oh boy, there she go. Like my hair would still stand up. Cause I say, Oh boy, I, I would giggle like the Pillsbury dough person. So, Oh, okay. So, so Frank, he loathes my, uh, cow licks. And then one day he proposed to me and I was there with all my friends, uh, and I don't know how we decided the order. I was definitely not, I did not go first. I can tell you that. Unless it seemed like Frank was having a bad day or something. So, um, what, so, okay. What, what happened? Um, so one time Frank was cutting my hair, complaining about my cow licks. He said, listen, the next time you come in, I want you to grow your hair out, uh, even longer. And then we give you a nice perm like mine. And we'll put a little curl in your hair. And I even looked at him like, this is most, this is, and he goes, so trust me. Now he was trying to be, I think in the end, I think he may have been misguided, but that's why I have to explore this universe stuff. Uh, but he said, Hey, if I could cut your hair, if I could, uh, like, uh, if I perm your hair, you like, like, it'll be give a little bit of curl. We won't have these cow licks. It'll be really nice. Trust me, like me. But his hair was different. His hair, he didn't have the same hair I had or the same face, you know. I mean, I would say for, for, well, I can't say he wore it well. He wore the perm the best he could. And it fit his character. But he was very encouraging. And I don't know if my friends heard it or if they said anything or I said anything to them, but I probably kept it to myself. But I can remember later being in the bathroom in the basement of our house, looking in the mirror and looking at my hair. And again, it had, it was impacting my self image. And again, in a different world, someone would have said, hey, don't worry, you know. But again, you got to go, this is like adolescence, you know, it's part of adolescence. If it's not your hair, it's going to be something else. It's part of your journey. Maybe because someone could have said that, I wouldn't have believed him at the time. Or maybe somebody did say, hey, yeah, you don't like your hair. It, it doesn't, it, you feel like it impacts your attractiveness and your self-confidence. And maybe it does. And that's tough. It's part of being an adolescent. Don't worry. After you've lived like a, many, many decades, you'll be comfortable with your hair. But it'll take, a, you know, it'll take a lot. Uh, so maybe one, maybe you, you're, maybe you became comfortable with something else before you were comfortable with your hair. So I was looking in the mirror and I was thinking about what Frank said, and also I was afraid of this boundary thing of just saying no. So I was like, hopefully he'll forget about it. But I said, maybe he's right. Uh, what would it be like? And some part of me, some wiser part of me in that universe, I thought said, don't do it, man. Like you are not Frank. Like picture his hair on you in the mirror. And I pictured it and I said, okay, like I have a pretty high forehead. My hair is thin. I think, you know, some of my facial, facial features are large, you know. And so I said, oh, you're right. Like uh, his hair on you, you're not like just, just picture his hair on you. It doesn't work. Uh, don't do it. But I do wonder if there's a world where I did it and it went well. Like, what would that be like, you know? did it. So that's my life with a perm. And I think about ballpoint pens, right? And this idea, this was at the same time. Uh, the, the, so at some point they came up with these pens called erasable ink pens, or, or I think that's what they were called. And they kind of came out of nowhere, at least in my mind. And, and I, it was like uh, I was still in grammar or elementary school or primary school, depending where you, how, what are you, what do you call it? When these pens came out and at some point, like the nuns in our school, let us go from using pencils to pens and we use pencils for math and pens for other stuff. And anybody that listens to this podcast knows, um, or maybe you don't know. 
like uh, one I have learning, like uh, like I have dyslexia. I have not like I've not taken tests for other things, but maybe I, like who knows? I learn differently than a lot of other people, uh, and that's okay. I also, am left-handed, and then I also some some um, some that also impact my ability to write with good penmanship physically. So like uh, so so physically, my not only am I left-handed, but physically, my penmanship is affected by something. And so I had all that going for me in an age of Catholicism where penmanship was like, honestly, we talk about confusion or stuff. And I think it was more not just in Catholicism or Catholic school, but that somehow penmanship was considered, uh, was equated with intelligence and, you know, conscientiousness and goodness in, in some sense. Even though it was, you'd say, well, that was like not, that should have stopped in the like 20 years before you're taught. And I say, yeah, I know, but there's, there's holdouts. But also I, like, because I wasn't a good student, I made a lot of errors, right? Uh, and I had a lot of challenges with school. So this, these invisible erasable ink pens were presented as a panacea of, for people like me to be able like, okay, you're supposed to be writing in pen. Yeah, now you can fix your mistakes, uh, even when you write in pen. And this was one of those ones that, uh, and maybe it was just because of right-handers, but I can't imagine that right-handers, and again, I know Rusty Biscuit's going to look up some great articles about this, but I can't imagine that it was just left-handers that were impacted by what I could say was a, a scam. Like, uh, this erasable ink was just ink that didn't dry, that you could erase it and, and whatever. The eraser just absorbed the ink. Uh, and maybe that's what an eraser does with a pencil. I, don't, I think so. But a pencil's like dust. Uh, so it picks up the dust and, and rolls it up in the eraser, whatever, and flakes off. First of all, whoever invented erasers, holy mackerel, you're brilliant. But so the idea of the pen was that it was it was just like a pencil, but it was pen, so it's permanent. And may I don't think this thing ever dried, uh, like uh, properly that you could erase it at any point. But because you, you know, for most left-handers, our palm, for whatever reason, or at least for me, when I'm writing, my entire uh, side of my the heel of my hand or the palm, yeah, the side of my hand is on the is on the table or on the paper. And then I write from left to right across a page. So my, like it would constantly, my, my hand would be covered in ink. There'd be fingerprints or palm prints of ink everywhere and the ink would be smudged. But it was like a trade-off. I mean, I think they flooded the market with these pens too. Or maybe it was just a pen preference at my family because you had to bring your own pens to school. I'll have to ask my dad about it, but, um, cause I'm pretty sure I can see him having a lot of, like, uh, but, uh, huh, that's interesting. So maybe it was just me. Again, I'm making it about the world, but maybe it was just me. But so it, my stuff went from looking poor, I had poor penmanship and poor neatness to like w w looking way, 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 way worse, uh, but the option of erasing it, or maybe it was just the pens that I had uh, access to. Um, and again, this wasn't because of deprivation. Like I, if, if I was supposed to ask for pens, there's the last thing in the world I would do. I'd just find pens. So that's the situation we find ourselves in with straight-haired Andy. But like if we go and we close our eyes and we look at the... Um, we look at the uh, world again. The things get fuzzy. There I am writing at my desk, uh, shoulders slumped, a hand, the scent of wet ink, uh, my paper smeared with ink and uh, frustrations. Uh, but then there's a twinkle in the air as we trans transverse planes into another world where my hair has a round curl like a gold lock in locks streaming off my skull. And maybe this is in this world, it's just my first or second attempt with these pens. Uh, 
And old sister St- Sternchen comes by, and she says, you know, she makes she says, you know, well, there's going to be another thing on your penmanship. Uh, and what's going on? I say, oh, sister, I was trying out these new pens. Uh, have you heard about them? Erasable ink, uh, er- er- erasable. Newfangled pens, she says. Uh, you wouldn't have to erase it if you did it right the first time. And I'd say, yeah, sister, uh, well, you might, you're like, uh, you're right about that, but uh, I didn't even realize that's a pun, huh, sister? And she says, well, let's look at this. And I say, okay, you're right. Uh, I said, sister, could, could, could you smell the ink? Uh, it smells different than the other inks, you know, we're used to. And then she, go, she well, sister goes on a soliloquy about... Uh, feathers and ink 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 jugs and i'd say well i definitely wouldn't have made it back that would have been a lot worse huh sister if i got a fountain pen for christmas once i think i ruined a year's worth of clothes uh didn't even use it uh i just wanted one like i'm no calligraphist i'll never be one but don't you get some sort of powder or something to sprinkle on that this one you don't have any of that uh, and we don't need it and I say, I'm sorry, sister, it's clear that this ink and this pen is making my schoolwork more messy than it needs to be. While having the option to uh, erase the ink is appealing to most people and is very marketable. And also, sister, oh, by the way, like, uh, yes, like uh, I'm tempted to put this in, you know, you know, I put a lot of things in my mouth, uh, especially erasers, and uh, this uh, and test out their mouthfeel. And um, these erasers do have an interesting mouthfeel. So um, I don't know what that has to do with anything, sister, but that's also on my mind. And I'm more impressed with the eraser than the ink. But I found a couple things, sister, in my brief observations the eraser does not really erase regular ink. Uh, and unlike a pencil, there is like a grittiness to this eraser that's different than a pencil eraser. Let me just show you here, sister. If I try to erase the erasable ink with a pencil eraser, it smears and it smudges even worse. And there, like there's something in the pencil eraser that can't quite get, a, um, can't quite get the friction it needs to, to take care of the ink. So this has some sort of grit in it, especially because I've chewed, I'll be honest, sister, I've chewed up a couple of these erasers on these erasable ink pens. I know, I know, sister. But uh, it's, a, it's, it's clear to me that uh, the, they have a grit in there, and the grit is something that helps uh, erase the ink. No, I have, sister, great question. I have not tried to erase any pencil with these erasers. But I have one more point, sister, that I learn. I'm going to learn in the future. But I'm, you know, believe it or not, sister, I'm traveling. I'm a time traveler, and I'm travel. I've traveled to this time to put a stop to this erasable ink thing, or to put make some changes. And I know you're aghast because you think I'm just trying to get out of this math assignment. But it's not a math assignment, sister. This is some sort of other assignment. The math assignment later, while I'll be using a pencil. I forgot my point, though, sister. Something about uh, erasable ink, chewing on the erasers. Sister, I totally forgot what I was talking about. Uh, I was about to make a big point about something, a a ballpoint. uh, But now I forgot where I was going. But it was uh, that this uh, this can't stand. Oh, what I was going to say is in the future, I will actually attempt... uh, to uh, test out my erasable ink uh, eraser on my report card. And I know this wouldn't let you slip by you, sister, but one of the uh, teachers that's not a nun ends up using erasable ink on the report cards. In a normal student, sister, they just look at their grades and they accept their grades and they don't look at the ink and analyze the ink uh, because they're a regular kid. But to me at the time, I had already, you know, this is two years from today, sister. They're still using erasable ink in two years in the future. 
And I was able to analyze the fact, just with mere sight and smell, that that was raceable ink. Uh, and I said to myself, that is, uh, I don't know if this is what irony is, uh, but it is delicious, the fact that my report card is made in raceable ink. It's so delicious. Even though this is a decent grade, I believe it was a B, sister, I decided to erase my grade uh, to see if it was truly erasable ink. And it came to my attention, lo and behold, sister, that uh, it was erasable ink. And it came to another classmate's attention who brought it to the teacher's attention, which would, you know, not go well for me. But uh, it was just an experiment. And, uh, like, I want to put a stop to that future, too. I mean, maybe, it'll, you know, maybe it'll, I won't be able to make a sleep pot. Do you know, in the future, sister, I have str- in another world where I don't have a perm to comfort me and to give me this confidence to talk to you using words and being comfortable and saying, hey, I, I don't like this. Uh, in another world, I'm not like, you know, I don't have all these tools. And so... Yeah, I could, like, luckily we're in our universe, sister, and not in that universe. We're just visiting this one. But I'm actually visiting, so maybe I'm being, and my dis- sister, do you know if I'm disrupting this universe by telling you? Uh, but wouldn't you like to work with me together to, oh, sister, there's a knock. Oh, sister, it's a business person. Hello, you have a briefcase and a suit on. What are you, from Big Pen? You, yeah, okay. I, sister, we have to go with them. Uh Okay, they're taking us uh, somewhere. Okay, we're sister, we're getting in a uh, van. This is uh, Sister Sternface, I call her, and uh, old Furrowbrow. You know, two of those furrows are mine. Out of the, I'm just kidding, sister. You don't really have more than 10 furrows, uh, two of which are mine. Thank you, everybody. So where are we headed? Oh, uh, to, uh, the, oh, okay. Oh, uh, this is, we're seeing all of the pen. Oh, oh, wow. So you really do have a big industry here making. Oh, so you want to tell me about the, this is a tour of the uh, pen production. It's a booming business. Uh, and oh, there was some lean years before this. Okay. So you're telling me that the invention of erasable ink in quote quotes, uh, by the way, is, uh, is, 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 is a necessary to the economy of this area and that I should be thankful and I shouldn't stir up trouble. Uh, well, let me just, let me just touch this curl here. Do you see, did, did my curl just make a springing sound? Yeah, yeah, it it does. It, let me tell you. Let me let me tell you a little thing uh, about uh, this erasable ink. Uh, let's let's sit down. Is this your board? Oh yeah, and your supervisor. Yeah, okay, great. Everybody have a seat here. I'm gonna stand here on your conference table, and uh, I'm here on behalf of myself. Left handers everywhere, and general consumers. Listen, we all know that this ink doesn't really like that. Uh, they had maybe had good intentions. Maybe this was an accidental discovery. I have no idea. And I'd love to know, but right now, right now, because I'm trying to make a speech here, like which came first, the eraser or the ink? Uh, and I would love to know the branding meetings to make it a gray eraser because I really appreciate There's So there's a lot of things about your pen I appreciate. Uh, do I prefer chewing on a, a like, here's, here's one of the things I appreciate. I got to tell you, whoever decided to make the eraser, eraser easy to get out of the pen cap, uh, really saved my de- dentist a lot of tears because those pencils, they got metal around them. So if you want to chew on a pencil eraser, you're really putting a lot at risk where this one, I can just get it out and chew it like gum. Not that I should, or that, it, that this is total fiction. So if you're listening, and, you know, it gives me something to play with. Believe it or not, I've used your eraser as a toy during class. Sorry, sister, but I have. Uh, and as an entertainment object, an object of speculation, a space capsule, uh, many different things. Uh, so I appreciate uh, Those are things I love about your pen. 
And one day in the future, I'll speculate and fantasize that the back of my head is a ballpoint uh, from a ballpoint pen. But here's the thing. This can't go on. Like, like in our our world, like, this is not going to end well. People are going to, um, I don't know what took people, took the marketplace so long to reject your pens. And maybe it became a niche product. And, but think about the money you've invested in this, uh, because I know you're about to do all those expansions you told me about on the tour. Let's agree not to do that, uh. And uh, w- what we'll do instead is I'll help you. Uh, like, here's the thing. You we pro- probably have two companies, right? Uh, this Erasable Ink Company and brand. And then maybe you have another brand. If not, there's a free idea to separate the two products, right? Then what you're going to do is you're going to say, have a ball with a ballpoint, uh And you'll put on, you'll start sponsoring balls uh, and uh, ball, like uh, not ball gowns, but yeah, let's do a ball gown scholarship. Every city, you give away a couple ball gowns, you'll sponsor uh, senior balls at high schools, uh, maybe some other kind of social balls. And you'll say, have a ball with a ballpoint. uh, And your commercials will show the joy of using a ballpoint pen. The ballpoint pen, Paul, maybe you even have that once a year here where we are, which feels somewhere like Scranton or Syracuse, uh, maybe Binghamton. I don't know, but uh, have a ball with ballpoint here. Come on down, have a ball with the ballpoint. Maybe even make it, maybe it's every day. Instead of your tour, make it a ball. Uh, there you even say and maybe you get some celebrities, left-handed celebrities. Not Ned, One day there'll be a left-handed celebrity named Ned Flanders, but uh, not not yet. But coming very soon, actually. Um, and, and that's how you'll fix things. You'll actually use your ballpoint pens with real permanent ink that works, uh, Against these, and you'll what you'll do is you'll halt your you you won't stop production. This will be a niche product, and you could charge more for it uh, instead of going and trying to replace the pens that we're already using. We'll do that, uh, okay? And that's how. And you could see if you're if you feel uncomfortable, all of you can sh- touch my curls. Uh, I'll crawl around on this table. It's very strange, yes, I know, but it's this is uh this is how I'm gonna save your business uh and save myself for, from two to five more years of having to use the ink that doesn't actually dry, but not eliminate it uh at all. So why don't you all lie down and and then just rest uh, put your heads down on your desk on this desk conference table. Go ahead and smell the conference table. Feel its war- feel your breath against it, nice and warm, and uh, feel it coming in, getting comfortable. Closing your eyes, that desk smell, and uh, get some rest and go to sleep. Good night, friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's time for the podcaster who's uh, here to keep you company and help you fall asleep. I'm so glad you're here. I'm clasping my hands. I'm leaning forward and hoping to keep you company and take your mind off so so you can fall asleep. If you're new to the show, this podcast is here because you deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve a safe place where you can get the rest you need. This is a silly distraction And a friend to keep you company, just like if you're going to call someone and say, hey, talk to me about some strange, silly stuff. Tell me a story. But I need your help uh, for about an hour or eight hours, whatever it is. You'll hear more about it. Uh, But, yeah, I'm so glad you're here. And the structure shows uh, first we'll have some support. Then we'll have an intro where I'll talk about the podcast and kind of set things up uh, and kind of go off on, on more tangents And then we'll have a a visit, kind of a lulling visit to a theme park uh, in the autumn season full of autumnal joy. 
So it's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. And uh, thanks for making it possible, my patron peeps. Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights, and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake, whether that's thoughts on your mind, things you're thinking about. So thoughts, uh, any feelings, anything you're feeling physically uh, coming up for you uh, or emotionally coming up for you, like uh, about the past, the present, the future related to the thoughts, uh, physical feelings or the emotions things that could just be there you could be it could be changes in time or temperature or routine it could be something else whatever it is that's keeping you awake the most important things for you to know is like while i might not know exactly what you're going through i could relate to some of the feelings and if i can't relate to them someone out there that's listening right now probably can relate to what you're going through they know how it feels and for most of us it doesn't feel great That's one of the reasons I make the show. The other reason I make the show is because you deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve a place you could get some rest or whatever is keeping you awake. You could have a little distance from distance from that. You have a bedtime you don't dread. So your life is more manageable tomorrow. That's what's important to me. That's the most important thing about the show. That if you get the rest you need, your life's going to be better. That means the entire world we live in will be a better place. And that is true. If you're rested and your day's a little bit better. So that's why I make the show. Now, this podcast does not work for everybody. And uh, some people, you may already realize, I don't like, I'm not sure I like you or the show. So I'll tell you, for most people that are fans of the show that pay to support the podcast, they agree with you. They they say it takes two, two or three tries to get used to this podcast. So that's the majority of people's experience. But for some people, this podcast just won't work or you just won't like it. And that's totally fine, too. I have a list of other stuff. Sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you. And you could check out there's other sleep podcasts on there and other sleepy audio and stuff like that. So check that out if you're already like, you know what? And yeah, this show is not for me. That's cool. I still want you to get the sleep you need and deserve. It's still important, so keep trying. But if you're skeptical or doubtful, but you're like, well, I'll check it out. I'm willing to check it out. I'm willing to try anything. That's how most people, that's why I started the show. I said, I I need something a little bit different. And doesn't anybody, isn't anybody looking for something a little bit different? Someone to keep them company with no pressure to to listen or to uh, fall asleep. And so that's what this show kind of is. And what I'll do is I'll send my voice across the deep, dark night. I'll use lulling, soothing, creaky, dulcet tones, uh, pointless meanders, and superfluous tangents. So that means uh, my voice is not traditionally soothing. I'm going to go off topic. I'm going to get mixed up. I'm going to backtrack. I'm going to forget what I was talking about. Uh, all that stuff. But but all of it is to keep you company And take your mind off stuff so you fall asleep. So like I kind of said earlier, this is a podcast you don't really listen to. You kind of just barely pay attention, just like it's a little bit out of focus. Like a podcast, you say, okay, I I kind of know what you're talking about. Like I'm kind of paying attention, but just barely. We've all been in that situation during the day. And we have feelings about it because you say, well, you're supposed to be listening to that person. Or you're supposed to be paying attention in class. Or even, like, do you remember what that movie was about? I don't know. Like, that person with the cape. uh, I don't don't know. I was checking. I missed part of it because I was checking my phone. And uh, so, no, I wasn't. Like, but people say, you weren't really paying attention? My goodness, that's never happened on planet Earth before. You say, really? (laughs) Uh, That's part of my brain talks to me like that. Uh, That was pretty extreme. And that's like not the extreme version of what it sounds like during the day. But it's, that is that's sometimes how my reaction to myself is. You say, I don't think anybody, you know, what kind of person doesn't pay 
a hundred percent. You can't put your phone down for a two and a half hour movie. And I said, well, if I'm in the movie theater, I can. And I'm, if I'm, I'm at a home, I aspire to. But uh, you got me. You got me. I got your brain. The old gotcha brain. There was a movie uh, called Gotcha. And it came out. It was about uh, it, it, like, you know how ner there's Nerf. Nerf is popular with them. Um, I think what they are like little water balls now. And you play a water ball tag. And there was actually an episode of Ted Lasso about this. Back then, they would, uh, they were, instead of just water, they were paint. Uh, and it's different than paintball because paintball is like a little bit more, um, like this, these were, this was a lighter version of it. Uh, cause those ones, they, they, you say, owie. These ones were back when, uh, but anyway, there was a whole movie about that. And in the, it starred Goose from the original Top Gun, who was also in a sh procedural uh, TV show on NBC in the 90s or the aughts. Um, Anthony Edwards, uh, not the Anthony NBA Anthony Edwards, uh, uh, different Anthony Edwards. Uh, but so um, anyway, what was the, my point? Uh, <laughs> way off field. Oh, this is a podcast you don't really listen to. You just kind of barely pay attention, and that's okay. That's what my that was my main point. Say, oh, okay, and no, like I stopped paying attention when you try to explain. Uh, what were you trying to explain again? Gotcha. I think there was a song for that movie that was a uh, uh, that is in my head. That was like one of the movies that was uh, I would just watch because this is the way it was, kids, back when we had uh, linear television. If something that was on that was just okay, you'd like at least I can't speak for my entire generation, but I, I think I am. I would just watch it. Uh, I'd say, oh, the Scotch movie's pretty good. Um, pretty not bad. I'm going to have to rewatch it. And so I like Anthony Edwards, and uh, I like to I, I kind of remember the rest of the cast. It was a confu. it was like, um, it was nothing like, uh, what was that movie called? Uh, Space Quest? What was that one? It was one of those mistaken identity movies. So, uh, oh, you may be mistaken. Don't mistake the identity of this podcast with something that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, don't, this is a podcast you don't really listen to. It also doesn't put you to sleep. There's no pressure to fall asleep here. I'm going to be here to the very end if you can't sleep or you just need company. I'm here to be your boar bay, your boar sib, your boar bud, your boar bestie, your boar burr, your neighbor, your boar friend. Uh, to keep you company in the deep dark night while you fall asleep, just to take your mind off of stuff. And uh, to be here, that's it. Uh, like, And then you fall asleep. You say, okay, I, yeah, I did, I did stop listening and fall. I, I, that's ideal breakfast conversation after sleep with me. They say, what was it? What was Scoots talking about last night? I don't know. Something about mistaken nerf and mistaken identities and water, water balls. I don't know. I, I don't even know what a water ball is. They said, well, it's more like it's like a miniature water balloon. I think, he, but I don't know. I don't know what he was talking about it, but uh, fell asleep. So it's a podcast you don't really listen to doesn't really put you to sleep. It's here to keep you company. Or if you need a break during the day or you can't sleep at all, I'm here. There's also people that listen to episode after episode after episode all night long. So if you're new, those are a couple of things to know. The other thing to know is the structure of the show is very different and it's designed in a very uh, deliberate way. But there are ways to adjust the show as you become a regular listener. So let me explain to you the layout. Show starts out with the greeting. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Uh, and then I say something else. So you feel seen and welcomed in. Then there's support for the show so the podcast can be free and come out twice a week regularly over. I mean, we've been doing this almost 10 years now. So, uh, yeah, okay, actually, when this episode comes out, it'll be the ninth year making the podcast and coming up on the 10th calendar year. So, yeah, that's pretty cool for free. Uh, so that's the sponsors and the listener support enables us to do that. Then there's an intro, which is separate from the support. 
And we're like 12 minutes in or 10 minutes into the intro where I go on and on and on explaining what the podcast is. I'm not successful, but it is a show within a show that serves a few purposes. One, it inefficiently tells a new person what to expect. Uh, and it gives you kind of sampling of what the podcast is like and what I'm like. Two, it's different every time. So regular listeners know, okay, the intro is going to follow a similar structure. It's going to be somewhere, it could be 10 minutes, could be 18 minutes, could be 11 minutes, could be 17 minutes, maybe 13, could be 12, might be 21 minutes. But I know Scoots is going to be there trying to explain what his podcast is and getting distracted. But I know it's going to be different every time, so my brain never quite adjusts. And I also know it's going to be part of my wind-down routine. For most listeners, there are listeners that fall asleep during the intro. There are listeners, 2% or so, that skip the intro. But for most listeners, the intro and the start of the podcast is designed to ease you into bedtime. To be a twilight between whatever, your evening and falling asleep. Uh, so whether you're getting comfortable or you're doing some other chill activity... That's what the intro is really here for, uh, is to ease you into bedtime and for me not to successfully explain what the podcast is. So that's the intro. Then there's, an, again, support for the show between the intro and the bedtime story so the show can be free. And then uh, there's a, a bedtime story tonight. We'll have a guest on, uh, my neighbor Ray Perkins, talking about uh, autumnal joy at a, a avant-garde display of a, a autumnal joy. I think. I don't know how accurate any of that is, but he'll be rambling and put you to sleep. It'll be really nice. And then there's some thank yous at the end. So that's the structure of the show. That's why I make the show. And I'm really glad you're here. I really appreciate your time and checking this podcast out. And uh, you're a nice driver. I work really hard. I really hope I can help you fall asleep. Uh, thanks again for stopping by. And here's a couple of ways I'm able to do this for you for free twice a week. All right, everybody, this is Scoots here, and this is a seasonal episode, uh, but I, I guess it'll be kind of timeless, where my neighbor Ray comes in, and this, so this is a new style of Ray episode, and anybody that uh, is part of our Midnight Mission newsletter helping us build hygiene kits, you may have seen this already in the live show, or those of you that came in person or online for free, or patrons, you probably heard this. Uh, we kind of did a live show about uh, how can we help Ray make this episode, because this is a new territory for Ray, not a Disney theme park, not a Universal theme park. And if you're new to this podcast, Ray Perkins is my neighbor. He's the most well-adjusted person I've, I've ever met, uh, super kind, loves theme parks, loves adventuring. And he just will kind of, he's going to run through our experience. He's got my notebook and uh, it'll be cool. So uh, without further ado, uh, my neighbor, uh, Ray Perkins. Uh, hello, 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 everybody. This is your friend, Ray, your neighbor, Ray. Hello. So good to be here in your ears. Uh, Scooter, thank you for that introduction. My name is uh, Ray Perkins. I'm a member of the Deep Dark Night United. So glad to be a member here in the Deep Dark Night with all the yous. And uh, to be a friend uh, and keep you company. Really my honor. And it's also my honor to be a friend with Scooter, little Andy as I call him, or the pod boy. And uh, you have known him for quite a, quite quite some time. I knew him before I knew him, but I knew him uh, I was his neighbor back in, uh, I don't know what year it started, but we'll say 2010, it just for uh, brevity's sake. And uh, I didn't really, he, he, well, I talked to him, but he didn't acknowledge my existence till about 2013. He lived in a, ho a, a, a apartment, which was a four units a, a home that at some point a long time ago had been divided into four apartments. Or four unit, but not a, you can't say it's an apartment building because it looks like a house. Uh, and he would go into his apartment from the back. Most people did that lived there, even though there was a front door. 
nobody seemed to use it. Now, Scooter had his dresser against his front door. It was just easier. There was a driveway, and that's where I'd see him, little Andy, uh, trying to get by me. I would. I lived next door in an apartment building next door, and uh, I would see him, and I would try to make small talk with him or large talk, and he would just keep on walking. He a lot of times he pretended he had earbuds in, even before there was earbuds. Uh, in 2010, and he'd oh, he put put his phone. Well, he, he'd he'd smile at me and wave, uh, but then he said, "Sorry, got a call here." But he was, you know, it was worth the wait. Uh, being friends with him, even when I'm friends with him, and I'm, wor- it's worth the wait sometimes. But we we we, uh, I come on the show and I get the honor of uh, talking about little uh, theme park trips I went on with Scooter, sometimes with his little one who's not so little anymore. And we got so like uh, last year, a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago. When you're hearing this, probably uh, we will. Uh, we went to uh, an event at a theme park and at Knott's Berry Farm. And Scooter thought it'd be funny because it was a theme park after dark event for the autumn season. And it was a very long, you know, they have a shorter description of it, not fun fun farm after dark. uh, But the the official title in Scooter's imagination is uh, not Berry Farm presents uh, an, an, uh, an interpretation an avant-garde interpretation of autumnal joy. But when they say autumnal interpretation, you know, that's meaning Scooter's interpretation of that word. Uh, but so we went there. It, it, now, Knott's Berry Farm, this was at night, and it's a ticket, separate ticketed event. And Scooter handled all of the uh, details. Now, we did not stay in, we stayed in uh, Anaheim, but not right by Knott's Berry Farm. And so I'm getting out his notebook, actually, which is not open to the page. Uh, Is this it here? Barking Group. uh, Walk to Ride. No, that's not it there. 1245, 150. Here we go. So we took an Uber there, the three of us, and and according to this, well, I'll explain it. We took an Uber there. We arrived at about 4.45, uh, and uh, we we were in line to check in, and what does that mean? Done. Okay, so 4.45, and we ate for about an hour. So we went and we did a dining buffet package where you get to dine with, okay, so this is an interactive theater, more than theater in the round, it's theater in the surround, this uh, autumnal joy event. Uh, So you're going to Knott's Berry Farm, not just so much to ride the rides. Now you can ride the rides, and we did ride a few rides, but mostly you're going there to be immersed in performers, not that, well, pretty different than the Dickens Fair, but uh, on the same level where you're going into like like uh, themed areas and there's performers there. We call them AJP, uh, uh, AJPs, uh, Autumnal Joy Performers, or AJPs, Autumnal Joy Providers, uh, but so the thing started with, now this was something Scooter per- purchased separately. And if he did it again, he said, I'm not so sure, but he'd have to look at the price. He, he, but he said, uh, where well, you go and you eat, uh, now you do get a buffet meal. And I'm pretty sure they had Knott's Chicken. So that's, and it was in the Knott's Berry Farm restaurant, but in the back at a buffet area. And you get you got yourself uh, unlimited refills, though they refilled them for you. And uh, I think it came in a souvenir cup that you could use in the park later that day. And uh, what else? Uh, uh, so there was buffet food. And now we don't we didn't write down anything that we ate, uh, but there was dessert. And while you're eating, the all, uh, the AJPs, the, all, the the performers are going around. Now the theme to their their uh, their installations, their artistic installations, and there was so there was um, 
uh, a few different ones that scoot, like there was a, a, a large number of the performers were from uh, installation called uh, what was it called? A scooter had told me, and then I forgot. Like it's, uh, but it, it's like a the old west in a bit the, the, the people from the old west who have joined the big farm in the sky on like like uh in, in, yeah in the, they're in the big farm in the sky o- version of the old west and uh so a lot of them there and they're saying hey like uh and so they're very themed you know they have uh old west clothes but their clothes, you know, they no longer really need them because they're living in the big farm. So their clothes, you know, they're not aware that they're deteriorating. And they've accumulated some dirt and stuff. Uh, and I asked them about it. I said, why is your clothes so covered in dirt? And they said, well, it's a big farm in the sky version of the Big West, you know. We crawl around a lot. But they were going around. There was also people from... um a carnival uh, themed area uh, of autumnal joy, and they were there. And Scooter was not, you know, it was, it, like Scooter said, okay, like, uh, but they were very friendly and they were mostly there to interact with you and to let you know, to give you a little pre- preview of what's to come and, uh, you know, take your pictures. Uh, you take your pictures with them. Then after we ate dinner, we get we checked in. Now we were early. Now Scooter did not know this. He thought maybe we would get a head start on the crowds. But really what we had was from five forty to about six fifteen just sitting around because we had finished eating, but the park wasn't open. Like they were still having people leave the park from the day. And so that was would did not work out well, especially for the young one, because her and I we had never been to this before. Scooter had been to this event in in when he lived in Los Angeles, and he had a very fond memory of it. He said this was like a top notch event, Ray, and I want to one day go back to it uh, when my daughter's old enough to go and enjoy it. You know, avant garde things. You know. They take, you know, something similar to suspension of disbelief, uh, your suspension of need, you know, to, un, you know, your suspension of, uh, and I said, I understand, Scooter. So he said, this is the time, you know, and then he asked his daughter, would you be interested in going to a strange seasonal event based on autumnal joy, but interpretations of it that, uh, you know, may be, you know, not the same as your expectations, and she said, I, I will. Uh, but while we were waiting, we were getting nervous, the two of us, because we said, what does this even mean? Uh, and especially seeing performers walking around in character the whole time, it led us to believe, like, uh, well, are we going to be able to um, accept, uh, uh, like, are we going to be able to do something similar to suspension of our disbelief? And will that be all right? But I think it was good because it provided some buildup. It wasn't great, though, because there wasn't really anywhere to sit down. There was, you know, so in the future, we would get there a little bit closer to 630. But at 615, the rides did open. And we went on uh, the wooden roller coaster twice. Uh, and I don't have, I can't read Scooter's notes, but I know we rode it with 615 and then 624. We went back on. It does say, wow, fun, and view. That I can see. It has a very good first drop. Uh, and for a wooden roller coaster, it's very smooth. And it's an old-fashioned wooden roller coaster, not the re, you know revamped versions. And then after that, we decided to start at, at 6.53 was our next note here. And it's not interpretation, you know, it's, uh, so we had to walk. And as soon as it, you know, it's getting dark now, not yet, but uh, everything's immersive. There's a lot of uh, fog machines so that you feel like you're in a dream. Uh, and there's like sound effects and then there's performers. Uh, and so at least at some point around 6.53, we got in our first line this says the Sand House or Sand Horse, then Druthers. Uh, 
but there is no sand house than Druthers. And let me just read through his notes, uh, because I don't know if any of this... 703, Third Mira, The Dock, or something. 705 is blank. 711 uh, was uh, the holiday show. 720, The Depths. Uh, 728, again, to the show again. 745, uh um, Madam T's, uh, and then we left that part of the park. So in this part of the park, which was backstage normally, there was four different installations of different interpretations of what autumnal joy might mean. And these are very, uh, I mean, I don't even know if this is avant-garde, but its I, I would say it's avant-garde to say, okay, just make your own interpretation of autumnal joy and pitch it to us, you know, initially, probably. And this one was very themed. The first one was called Madam T's. As now, I can tell you what it's based on. is like uh, if you go to any tourist area here in the U.S., maybe even, uh, uh, in, I don't even know where else. I know in uh, Niagara Falls, uh, Fisherman's Wharf in Hollywood, there's a Madam Tussauds, uh, or, or even Orlando has it, uh, but there's a Madame Tussauds a wax museum with, like, celebrities and historical figures, right? And you could go stand with different historical figures, and uh, I don't know if they're actually made from wax, uh, but that's what they're called. Originally, they're called wax museums. So this was a different take on it. It was celebrities making... Uh, like making stuff to celebrate the ha- ha- Halloween uh, autumnal season. A lot of it, because they were working, you'd see the backsides. Like the first one I said, is that uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon? Like uh, like putting out like a little uh, like a cat and pumpkins? It's so cute. In different things like that. So you go through and you see celebrities and you say, okay, that celebrity's putting up lights. Uh, like Michael B. Jordan was painting in uh, like, uh, like uh, what do you call that, neon paints. And then the lights would change and they'd be glowing. And uh, like, um, I think one had like Emma Thompson and she was making, she was working with dry ice and making a bubbling cauldron. Uh, then you move on and you see like uh, children coming to the doors, trick or treating, but none of this, it was mostly static. So that was like, it, you really had, it was a good preparer, but you're also immersing yourself. Uh, like you're becoming, you, 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 it does best when you're like fully involved. So you say, okay. I'm not me. I'm a version of me who's is, who's in a tourist area somewhere else who has paid to go to a, a museum where they're showing uh, the celebrities celebrating autumnal joy. And then they also showed, uh, you know, oh, how hard the celebrities work to make it perfect and spread their autumnal joy and showcase the seasonal fun. This is the second year we've presented this. This is from Knott's uh, material uh, here. And uh, it's really going to be a fun time. It. Uh, let's see what other notes we had here. Yeah, you go through, you see celebrities crafting and having fun, work, you know, working with uh, craft paper even. And uh, a little interaction with you, like every once in a while, so there'd be a person pretending to be a, a celebrity, a waxed celebrity, but mostly it was uh, people that pretended they were working there because it, it did this one. It did take a lot of exponential. And they say, oh, no, that's Matt Damon and Ben Affleck uh, decorating and actually, I think they had a, like a, like a, like where they, where they were able to, cause then they would come up with a story. I don't know if it was improv, but they'd say, oh no, every year they go to five houses and they decorate the houses, uh, for fans. And so it was refreshing. 
uh, and fun to just see uh, and not to know where the real, like, to know, okay, this is all fictional. So even the, um, what are those called? Pledges? The people that work at the museums. Uh, but yeah, it was cool. Then the next one was called uh, The Depths, and Scooter was under the impression that this was about mining. And uh, he said, I don't know, I guess it's about, my, like, because we said, Scooter, what is this? What should we expect? And at first there was a couple people in mining gears and there was mining equipment, so I don't think he was totally misinformed. And Scooter said, I think it's going to be how do miners uh, celebrate autumnal joy. But really the plot ended up being miners searching for autumnal joy and what they discovered. So, yeah, like, uh, uh, yeah, like a heavy fog, uh, uh, shows a successful mine, uh, where deep inside the miners will find autumnal joy. The mining crowd, the mining crew has uh, looked uh, and and heard tale of autumnal joy deep within the earth. Uh, when they look, uh, maybe they'll find it, uh, or will they enjoy enjoy their journey to discover autumnal joy? And so this was our second one to go on. The line was uh, very short for this one because it was in the back left corner of these four uh, installations. And it had one of the coolest things we ever saw. So the story kind of goes, they go in the mining and then they're kind of guessing, oh, let's go this way. And then they discover a world within our world where there's still autumnal joy so part of it is below the earth, uh, and part of it is like, uh, below water. And that was my favorite part was the illusion. This was one of the coolest illusions, Ray, will tell you about. Uh, so you go into this one room and there's laser, green lasers or blue lasers, uh, and there's fog, but the lasers are going around about your belly button level in a vertical horizontal way, horizontal way, so it looks like the surface of the water, the just a straight line, and the fog is is like so. You see the fog, and you say okay, and then below the fog, below the lasers are uh, fr- Earth, uh, you know, inner Earth friends. And they say like th- then out of the fog they come and they say. Oh, like this is what we, you know, we've learned from your autumnal joy. And they say, see, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm jumping in a pile of leaves here. Even though they're like a water-based creature, the, 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 the fully sentient. And they say, oh boy, I can't, I, I really love this. Uh, and then there's other ones with ships and, uh, I don't know if there's any pirates, uh, and then there's other ones, yeah, like that aren't like water based, but that was one that just stuck with me. I said, Holy cow, this is interesting here. And what a ton of fun they were having. I mean, really, uh, really seemed like a ton of fun. It was a ton of fun for us. Uh, and, you know, you should go. I don't want to spoil it and tell you every, in case you're going this year, next year, and they still have this to say. What kind of autumnal joy did the, and they, but I will tell you, uh, you know, in the end they say, it's the autumnal joy that lives in your hearts. And the people inside the earth, our friends there, they say, and it's the autumnal joy that lives in our hearts or whatever is a version of the hearts are for us. Like one said, it's the, it's a, it's the autumnal joy that lives in my exo, you know, exoskeleton, uh, so that was fun. Now, the next one after that, apparently it was based on a game that uh, kids play on the phone, so on the computer, like where they walk around a space station. So this was very powerful set design because you're going there to go on a space station and see in the future on a space station 
How do they sell? Now, this is the 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 initial concept, uh, but of course, there's a story. There's always more to it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. Now, these ones, other than, unlike the first one, all performers, some on screen, some in person, some um, animatronics or special effects. Uh, but again, if you suspend your disbelief, it's all real. Oh, I found myself on a space station where I get to see how they celebrate the autumnal joy and express it. Uh, but what you quickly discover is that this spaceship is its a bit comedic. Like, they've set out to celebrate autumnal joy, but nothing is going to plan and so one of the things is based on, and it had very, what are those called again? Cookies or uh, cupcakes or whatever. Uh, so one of them is like on Star Trek. It's a double Star Trek reference. One, it has a character uh, who has asked the uh, food moderator or whatever, the food uh, amplifier, what is that called? The... Uh, replicator or whatever so it's not a replicator though but it makes the thing on star trek that makes the food they've asked it to make candy for the trick-or-treaters and uh like uh they, but the replicator has gone into like some sort of triple mode now if you look at the labels of the candy and they did give you one piece of candy on the way out the candy said triple bars which was i thought was funny but the machine just keeps making candy, and it was a special effect. So this person's up to the, the, the elbows in, in candy bars, and they're saying, stop replicating uh, the candy bars. And then you walk around, and you see them in, like, uh, uh, some of them have, like, altered the like um, the monitors, so they're watching different... Uh, Halloween specials on the monitors instead of doing the job. And, you know, Houston's calling. I said, no, but it's Halloween specials on the uh, monitors. You're supposed to be looking at Pluto or whatever. You're giving James Webb a bad name. Uh, but so that was another thing. Then another one was a little gag with a... Um, not uh, with an airlock, but, like, the airlock has two phases... Uh, but like where the people, the trick or treaters are on the inside of the airlock and they're trying to get the candy and the people with the candy, they had switched positions. Or something. I don't know if I totally understood. I said, I'm not sure that's how air, air, airlocks work. Uh, then there was a cute one, which took very good special effects. Now they used a combination of uh, lighting and strobe and fishing lines, I would assume, or magic. And so there, and then, um, what do they call that? Like aerial artists, so like you would see at the circus uh, performing. And they were pretending to eat candy in zero gravity, which was, oh boy, was that exciting. So they're floating about in zero gravity and doing flips uh, and, and trying to catch the candy. And then they had like the, uh, you know, like a stand type Android figure saying, you know, all the candies are short circuiting me. Uh, the candy's short circuiting me. Yeah, let's see. What do we got? Uh, in the backstage area with uh, other neighbors, uh, Takes you to outer space uh, on board an aircraft where nothing goes right, uh, and uh, fantastic. You know, it's a really uh, fun one, uh, and it's in a back corner. I think we did it twice. You know, this one it was not as it was uh, it was good, but it was uh, a little too out there, I guess, in outer space. Uh, but, uh, the, this, like, I guess it was like the next one was so in depth, uh, the levels they went to that that's probably another reason. So the next one was called, oh, I forgot the name. I don't have it written down, uh, uh, like, uh, oh, the great Halloween investigators investigation, the great Halloween decoration investigation investigators, uh, that is a mouthful. But again, you're suspending. Now everything's themed. So you are an audience member. In how you, you've gone, 
you're in line and initially, even when you're in line, it's themed. And this person, there's people outside saying, okay, everybody, it's time, you know, for another taping of your favorite show, the great Halloween decoration investigation investigators with your favorite investigators. And we're going to try to get you inside. Uh, hopefully we can fit everybody, but just stay patient. You know, don't worry. We're doing three tapings today. To where you almost, even though you know it's not really, say, okay, I hope I get in for this taping. Are they really only doing three tapings? Are they really taping anything? Uh, then as you get closer, you get let into like a, like an, another area. And they, the, the, they are keeping count. And they say, okay, that's all we could fit for this next taping. And you say to the people, I'm sorry, I guess you can't get into this taping. And it's people pretending to be production assistants. And they're saying, okay, we're going to go inside to the warm-up room before we go into the tape. And now the great Halloween decoration investigation investigators, you also learn, in case you didn't know, because it's imaginary, is this is the top show on, uh, you know, Knott's TV where... These, uh, the great Halloween investigation investigators, they go around to the best decorated houses in the world and learn all the things of how they did it, uh, all the tricks of the trade. And, uh, they can, you know, so that you can do them at home and you say, okay, this sounds great. So then you get let in the next room and this is where they were kind of, this is, I think there was only one other house like this. Where they're using, where it's just really, you know, in-depth theater. So then you go into another room and it's more people at a little bit higher level production staff. And they say, here's the show, here's the show with taping uh, and the next taping that you're going to get to be a part of. Now, just make sure you follow all our directions. We don't want you to end up with pumpkin pie in your face. And they they kind of go through and they kind of show a couple segments. Uh, then they have a stand-up comedian to, to tell some jokes to warm up the crowd. And once they get you laughing, they say, okay, like everybody go in and take your seats. Uh, make sure to follow our directions, uh, you know, follow the path. Uh, and what you realize, and now there's three doors that open, and you could go through, you just go through, you're supposed to go through the closest door. Now, spoiler alert, one thing, it doesn't matter, because we didn't went out more than once, it doesn't matter which door you go through. And another spoiler alert, because it's kind of the part of the thing, is that you never reach the taping. That's the point of the experience, and it's supposed to be funny. So you're basically going through and then you go through all these different scenes where you can hear them taping, you can hear the audience cheering. And then sometimes you could see through like a hole and they're like, they say, how do you, how do you make a, you know, something look like, what is, how does the strobe light effect work? We're here with the top strobe scientist, uh, Dr. Bennington. And Dr. Bennington kind of shows how strobe effects work. Uh, and then you kind of see, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, it's, but basically you're just kind of going through backstage areas and seeing things, but all of it is, and a lot of it is like other shows being taped and they say, what are you doing here? You know, we're doing the baby dinosaur show. You're interrupting the trick or treating episode. So it's very fun. And I don't want to spoil, you know, I, I know I spoiled the, the overall thing, but I just want, I don't want you to be stressed like we were being like, do not do we really have to find our way to the taping? No, you don't find your way to the taping. You do hear them. You do hear somebody wins the contest. You hear everybody cheering. Uh, but you just know, never reach uh, the taping. And so we did do that a couple times. And that one seemed very, very popular, I guess because of the layers. And we did all of those attractions twice, which I was glad for now, they also have outdoors, uh, the areas are themed. So we went through the uh, Old West part of the park, which was covered in fog. So again, you had uh, the characters walking around that would again be at the presentation we were 
now this one was more dreamy where there was uh, people from the, the, the Wild West or the American West or whatever you want to say. And they're saying, oh, you know, what do I want to dream? Like their ideas, their dreams of like what they're going to, what they want to do with the big, fun. I want to be an angel. I want to be someone's kitty cat, all those kind of things. This was very uh, out there. But then you go to um, like a, like this uh, like a Wild West set uh, installation. Again, it's like uh, how the Wild West became the Wild West, big big farm in the sky, Wild West or something. I don't know. Right in right in town. But we went out. We got in line at that seven fifty two. And what is strange is that uh, initially, again, you're an observer. But sometimes they observe you observing them. So it's kind of like this one, you are in line. I mean, not directly with other people from the Wild West in line. And they were in line for because photographs were new or something. But they had a photo booth where you could dress up as something. Uh, but like with slightly autumnal themes for, for like a Wild West uh just like at a theme park, you go, oh, you could dress up like you're in the Wild West. This was people in the Wild West dressing up like they were people in the Wild West, but with autumnal joy and getting the pictures taken. And, but what was it? That was the first room. Then the second room was that like, uh, and this was a bit of a leap, but it was someone, a person like Lady Witchbeard. And she had been told she couldn't go. Uh, that uh, there was no pirates uh, in the Wild West. So she, in this next big room, like a big chamber, had a. She was making a. Um, she, she was making a cauldron and saying, "It's not okay to treat me that way." So now I'm going to make your town's dreams, you know, go bye bye to the big farm. And then it was like each person became the character. Uh, so let's see, like uh, one person, I don't know, they dressed in all leaves. So then they kind of became a tree later on. And you would come upon them and you, oh, like the sheriff. I think that's who it was. So you knew it was the sheriff and they still had a sheriff's badge. But they were saying like they were just like a slow moving tree, like kind of like an ant. Uh, because they were still moving. But someone's saying, Sheriff, you know, the, we need more water in the water troughs for all the horses. You got to get over there. And the sheriff wouldn't explain, you know, wouldn't answer. They say, Sheriff, uh, you're covered in leaves. So what's going on? Or another one was the saloon keeper uh, had decided they were going to become like a, a, a tin man. Uh, but they were a rusted, frozen tin man, and, but they were still behind the bar at the saloon. So the people would come, you know, give me two bits or whatever, a couple of shots of uh, old gut gut juice or whatever. And then they wouldn't respond, you know, the, the, the barkeep or whatever. Yeah, or like the piano player, uh, w like uh, they were yodeling. I don't know if that has to do with autumnal things, but uh, they'd say, play me a song, Jenny. And uh, she would just be yodeling. Uh, and they'd say, what kind of piano is that? Uh, that's, and they'd say, yodeling, who? So very uh, avant-garde, I guess. After that, uh, there's a new page. Oh, after that, we went on... Um, uh, the Pony Express, which is a ride. And it's a bit like uh, an earlier version. There's a ride in Universal now called Hagrid's, right? But this one is you ride on a pony. It's a roller coaster. It doesn't go upside down. But you sit on a pony. You're up uh, in that position, leaning forward, riding like essentially a carousel horse. You are more secure, like there's something holding you back and your legs in, I think. Uh, so you are secure, and it goes pretty fast. But because you're in a different position, it feels like uh, very interesting. 
So we went on that. Uh, then, oh, we went on Barry Tales, uh, which is a 3D ride. Uh, there was a live band. There was also a 1920s uh, Prohibition newspaper newsies uh, zone of how do people in Prohibition, they'd say, pure pumpkin juice, no booze. Uh, that's all they did. And they said, breaking news, it's uh, October, chill in the air. So, but that was fun. They'd say, you know, like the, each newsie had a different, or they were singing the different uh, news news line headlines, or there was competing uh, prohibitions, and, you know, and there was even as fake speakeasy. They said, "You want to come in here? We got pumpkin juice, the real stuff here, or well, real cider, hard." I mean, but it was a joke, I think. But there was also a band playing, unthemed band, but playing music about autumnal joy. Uh, Berry Tales was not, it was just a Knott's Berry Farm ride. It had been a re-theme of an existing ride we really liked. Uh, that was uh, steampunky and uh, very cool and very out there. And ba 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 uh, ba Barry Tales, uh, like wasn't working. So it kept breaking down. So it was not a satisfying thing. Then we went on the Calico mine ride. I thought there would be performers in there, but there was not. And I talked about that in another show. It's a very out there ride, very long. You just go on a train. It's not a roller coaster. There's a giant room in the middle, multiple levels of stories. I mean, uh, like, uh, just a very early dark ride that is still very impressive, even though it's a simple, it's about people working and living in a mine. And I think most of the story that you project on it, or you would project on it. Uh, then there was another very themed ride called Pretzel Ride. And they weren't talking, well, this is, that was what was funny. It was a pretzel ride, but it wasn't a ride. You were going through watching people riding a pretzel ride, which is an early dark ride that you still see today, like like at carnivals and stuff. So this was in the carnival zone. And this pretzel ride was based on a pretzel maker. So it was very meta because you were watching people going on a ride, watching a story about a pretzel maker so I think it helped with the narration because you were able to watch the people riding the ride commenting on the ride while they were watching. So two layers of performers. But the ride story was about the people's reaction to the story on the ride, which was about a pretzel maker and the, the greatest who wanted to be the greatest pretzel maker in the world. But then they would maybe they were and they were dissatisfied. And they decided they would make a pumpkin pie spice or pumpkin spiced pretzel and then everybody and it had a bit of music to it too because at first they said this is what i'm going to do and people said no 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 you make the best 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 pretzels in the world don't do anything don't change it and they said i want to do more i want to make seasonal goods and people said no you can't do it and then they cried you know and they went off on a loan then they said they wouldn't make anything. Then people said, please be reasonable. I love your pretzels. And then they said, well, I'm going to try to delegate. And then the delegation didn't go good. Then they tried staying up and test. And then they couldn't even get the flavor right. And so they had smell-o-vision. Like one part, you know, it's too pumpkin-y. Then another one, it's too sweet. And then finally, they uh, do what a lot of people do. They create a suit, you know, a secondary personality. So then you get a third layer of autumnal joy where they're putting on a costume. They become, they open a rival pretzel shop. Exciting stuff here. And they only sell seasonally flavored. Uh, and it's a mystery because they say it's a mysterious, you know, and, and, and the person is playing it up. Uh, and then there's even a gr the greatest pretzel competition in the world that the town, you know, it's in Pretzelville, Pretzel, you know, Pennsylvania, something. And every year they have the Great Pretzel Festival in the autumn, and the you know greatest pretzel maker in the world, uh, 
and then the pumpkin spice pretzel that everybody loves it comes in second, but the pretzel maker comes in third, and some young person they've mentored comes in first, which was nice. It doesn't even live in Pretzelville. So that was a satisfying story. Let's see. Then we went on. Uh, I guess this was our last attraction here. 930, 945, we went on something else, uh, but I can't uh, read that. Uh, but 930, we went on mesmerizing. And that one, again, was multi-layered, very long at the far, far back of the park. And we did have to take a break. Uh, I think uh, we got a snack. We got some drinks. We sat down with some distance because the carnival zone was not Scooter's Cup of Tea, you know. Uh, there's performers that hang out in the carnival zone that Scooter, you know, he'd ra- he said, I'd rather be in the fake prohibition zone than... Uh, seeing certain uh, beings that would be at a carnival celebrating autumnal joy with the giant shoes and a lot of them in a small car and the squeaky noses and uh, puffy balls and hats. But we got through it and we went to mesmerizing. And uh, this one was uh, like, uh, I said, what is this? And it was, uh, you go in... And at first you're going in and someone's making a speech. And at this point it was a bit like the Sleep With Me podcast where they're making a speech about uh, autumn and uh, uh, all the things uh, all the things that could be autumnal and, and just a long list. But really what, you have, what they're doing is, is you're being mesmerized by how dull they are and you fall asleep. Uh, a bit like sleep with me, I guess, where you fall into this deep sleep. They use fog effects. They use, um, you know, ultraviolet or black lights and um, neon paints. And you sink into this world where you go in there and it's all dreams of autumnal joy. Now, this one was very avant-garde. And it also had must have had high ceilings because it was like 10-foot things. So you see, like, different candies talking to you, and uh, that was probably my favorite room. I mean, they were imaginary candies talking about how much they loved Halloween because it gave them purpose uh, in the dancing around and everything. But, like, a huge, 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 uh, and I don't even know how they did it. If it was puppets or people, or I don't even know. Then there was another room again with black lights, so they were very so it's cats and dogs and fish, but not real ones like puppets and people performing. And they were talking about uh, what is this Halloween? Uh, like they were kind of sitting around. There was even dogs playing poker, which cracked me up. And they're playing poker and they're saying, "What is this Halloween? This doesn't even make any sense to me. It's so strange." Uh, why do they even, what are they doing, these humans? They dress up, uh, they give a, uh, like, uh, uh, then there was, uh, the, um, you go into a room and this giant, uh, Jack O'Lantern s- singing. And I think that one had, like, uh, a couple different, um, acapella groups uh, doing it live, uh, or they were actual live acapella people in those costumes. And, uh, and then, uh, oh, Leaves, that was another great one. Uh, they had, like, a way you could just be in a room where there was leaves falling off a tree. But each time, now, it was like you had to be patient. I mean, none of it was real, but it was super real, you know, because it was in all neon. And the leaves were made out of paper or something. And I don't know how they controlled them, but every once in a while, a leaf would fall off a tree. And we're talking, you have to wait eight or nine minutes. And the leaf would fall off the tree and would say, we, uh, or, uh, you know, a circle of life, uh, or, you know, I'm going to be, you know, whatever. And, uh, and so, yeah. And, uh, then there was a last part was where you could lie down and you would lie on this thing. You could lie on your back, which was best for your view or your stomach or your side, 
And it was a bit like, um, you know, the things that mechanics use that go on to cause. It was kind of like that. So each person gets to lie on it, but it's pulled by something. And for a long time, oh, boy, it was so relaxing. You just lie there, and everyone falls asleep, they say. And you're looking at a, you know, a fake sky. So you're in a very dark room with black velvet it makes it even seem darker. But then there's like uh, neon clouds and stars and shooting stars and moons and, and things waving. At. It was, it's like being in a, like a, in a Sesame Street skit or something. And we we wrote it 50 times in a row just to do that part over and over again and rest as we were slowly drifting with a black velvet sky and friendly stars and moons above us waving with autumnal joy. Now, And that's what they told you after you were done was this is the autumnal sky. Each room was a different autumnal sky for a different part of the world. And that was what we loved the best uh, at uh, Knott's uh, Farm of uh, Autumnal Joy. Good night, everybody, from your friend Ray and Scooter. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, journalmen, where did that, I don't even know where that came from, journalmen. I think maybe somebody in my my life, my personal life, was singing like for the role of uh, one of the roles in um, what's that? Uh, so, so they were singing "Suddenly Seymour." My brain has totally gone blank. Uh, and if you you say uh, my brain's gone blank because I don't know what in the Rick Moranis you're talking. Are you? And I say you're right. I don't know what in the Rick Moranis I'm talking about. Because, uh, like, uh, this feels, you say, I thought I was tuning into a sleep podcast and not a little shop of meanders. And I say, oh, no, this is a little shop of meanders and pointless, uh, superfluous tangents. And uh, this shop is here to keep you company and ease you into bedtime. Take your mind off of stuff so you could fall asleep. It's very different. So give it a few tries to see how it goes. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we're going to do some support for the show. Then we'll have an intro and a nice little story after that. Uh, because you deserve a good night's sleep. Uh, it's time for sleep with what in the Seymour? Uh, so, so, whatever what I said. Journal, journal, like uh, it's time for sleep with me. The podcast that puts you to sleep. Thanks for making it possible, my patron peeps. Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do it a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake, whether it's thoughts on your mind, like the stuff you're thinking about. Uh, So thoughts, you know, think of the past, present, future, baffling thoughts, uh, like uh, figuring stuff out, whatever it is. If it's thoughts, it could be emotions or feelings coming up for you. That happens sometimes for my thoughts, sometimes my feelings. You know, it is which which comes first, the feelings or the thoughts. Sometimes both. You know what I love is when I'm trying to get in bed and hand in hand, my feelings and thoughts come to me. And they're holding hands, but it doesn't seem like they're interested in holding my hand. They're kind of swinging their hand. Holy cow, I just realized I'm a third wheel to my thoughts and feelings. I'm an expert on being a third wheel. I, well, I don't know. Well, so, okay, we'll come back to that. But it could be thoughts or feelings, uh, physical sensations, changes in time or temperature or routine. And also, I don't know what third wheel really means because most vehicles that I'm familiar with uh, have, like, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm sure it did in the, its original context, uh but uh, I'm, I say, well, I'm just a wheelbarrow. I'm doing fine on my own. I carry my stuff around. 
I'm not a third wheel. I'm a wheelbarrow. You know, I, wait, but I don't know if that makes sense. But, uh, like, um, I'm here, uh, like, oh, just let me get to the, let me start the podcast, the third wheels and wheelbarrows uh, on my brain. But whatever's keeping me awake, I'd like to take your mind off of it and keep you company. Just in case you're having any strong feelings about being a third wheel, don't worry. I'm going to cover, I'm going to give you some relatable stuff to put you at ease before, you know, ideally. Because, you know, I've had, I've had those feelings. But whatever is keeping you awake, I'm going to try to take your mind off of it eventually and, and, and so you can fall asleep. And the way I do that is I try to create a safe place where even terms like that are kind of safe to have our feelings about it. Uh, but eventually what you'll do is I'll take your mind off of that. But I'm going to send my voice across the deep, dark night. I'm going to use lulling, soothing, creaky dulcet tones, pointless meanders. And superfluous tangents. You've kind of seen a pointless meander and a sur- superfluous tangent already. And you're hearing my voice, which is not traditionally soothing. It's more a voice that takes your mind off of stuff that's good for background noise or barely listening to. And a couple of things about the show if you're new. This show is not for everybody, but for most people it is for. It does take two or three tries to listen to. That is the consensus among listeners. Like over a million times I've probably heard. It took through two or three tries. First I disliked the show, then I felt neutral, then I loved it because I stopped listening, paying attention to you. And I say, what a great compliment. Also, thanks for giving a few tries. So if you're new, see how it goes. If you're already at the point where you don't like the show, check out uh, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you because there's a lot of other shows on there, um, uh, like other podcasts and sleep audio you could check out because the reason I make the show and the reason sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you exists is because I want to help you fall asleep, but if I can't, you know, maybe one of those other things will because the, the, it makes a show because, at one, I know how it feels in the deep, dark night. I know how it feels to dread going to bed, to, you know, work, like you know, the strong feelings you might have before bed, after in the morning, and while you're trying, you know, while it's the, the rigmarole of the deep, dark night is going on. And all the listeners, or not all the listeners, but the majority of people listening, they can relate to that pain, too. And we all experience it in a little bit different ways, but we can relate to how it feels. That's why I call it the deep, dark night. But as you become a regular listener, I hope you can also relate to this fact is the fact that you do deserve a good night's sleep. And you deserve a place of respite uh, where you can unwind and drift off to sleep where you get the rest you need and your life is more manageable. That's really the most important thing about the show or leading you to another sleep podcast or something else is the fact that uh, you deserve a more manageable life via rest so that you can flourish. And in some sense, you say, well, you don't know me. I say, well, I know what it feels like, one. And I know if your life is better, then the world you are in is going to be better. And that has a positive impact on everybody in, in, in the universe, really. And that's a tr- the truth to me. So it is important. So that's why I make the show. Uh, another c- couple of things about the show. This is a podcast you don't really listen to. You may have already figured that out. You just kind of barely pay attention and uh, just kind of see how it goes. Some people use it as background noise. Some people listen and then fall asleep. Some people turn me down to a muffle. So just kind of see how it goes. But if you can't sleep, I'm here to keep you company. So whether you're awake or asleep, you don't you could you can kind of listen to me, but you don't have to. And this podcast keeps you company instead of fall, putting you to sleep. You kind of just drift off. I take your mind off of stuff, and you drift off. I'm here to be your companion in the deep dark night, your audio assistant. I guess it would be one way, and and just to, to be your boar bay, your boar sib, your boar cuz, your boar bestie, your boar bra, your boar friend. So that's what I'm here to do is keep you company and take your mind off stuff so you could fall asleep. Now, the structure of the show also throws people off at first. So I just want to run through why the show is structured the way it is, and then you could kind of adjust. But most people find the structure works well for them. So the show starts off with a greeting. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Then I say something witty, maybe, or funny, or partially funny. 
And that way, uh, the goal of that is that you feel welcome and seen. That and that uh, you get the tone of the show is not so serious. Then there's support. There's support for the podcast via listener support and sponsor support. So the show can come out twice a week for free on any free podcast app. So paying for the show is optional and supporting the show is optional so that anyone who wants to listen has access to it. Uh, and that comes through the listener support and the sponsors. Then there's support for listeners if you're having a tough time right now. And then there's support for communities around the show and communities where you are. Uh, so we can take positive action to be a part of positive change. Uh, then there's the intro, which is separate from that stuff. But when people don't like the, um, that part of the show, they tend to carry it on to the intro but the intro is, uh, it's, it is important. It's not important to everybody. Uh, and I'll explain that too, but, uh, it is an important part of the podcast. It's a show within a show and it's about 10 to 15 minutes long. We're already, we're like five minutes in. I try to explain what the podcast is to a new listener, but my regular listeners, what up regular listeners uh, a lot of them really enjoy the intro, and it's different how each regular listener uses it, but there's a couple different use cases that, that are popular. And the most popular one is just to listen to the intro as you're getting ready for bed or as you're doing your wind-down activity. Because the intro, it's not like a book, like one of those, what are those things called to hold up books? Uh, I don't know. The, I guess the intro isn't a third wheel. But it's a wheel on the wheelbarrow, right? It uh, it's rolling. No, I guess that's not. I'll have to find another metaphor for it. But it's uh, it eases you into bedtime. It's the transition period between your evening and going to sleep. So the intro serves as like a fifteen to twenty minute interlude, where I'm rambling and trying to explain stuff unsuccessfully, but hopefully in a way that makes you feel. Like you're a part of something. Like you're, you say, okay, there's other people listening, but this is here for me to keep me company. And this man is somewhat interesting, and hopefully we'll get to the third wheel stuff uh, that he promised. So it eases you into bedtime. Some people are in bed listening. Some people are doing, you know, knitting or hooking or drawing or stretching. And then there's about 2% of people that start the show at 20 or 30 minutes. There's a few thousand people that listen to story-only episodes. Uh, and pay extra for that. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, it's, a, it's a, 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 like a landing strip. So that's the intro. Then there's more support for the show between the intro and the story again. So it could come out twice a week for free. And then there's thank yous at the end of the podcast. Uh, so that's the structure of the show. That's why I make the show. And yeah, I'm not comfortable, I guess, like thinking about it, I'm not comfortable with the term third wheel. One, because I don't know what, like, what it means, why it's a metaphor. Like a third wheel means, and I've been in this situation my whole life, majority of the time with someone, I'm just like, a, like a third wheel means when one or two of your friends are dating, but you hang around with them a lot. But it's talked about like, like it's a, a negative, which it could be. Now, if, normally for me, it's a negative because I'm actually like would have a crush on one of the friends and it was unrequited and, 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 and usually it was unrequited. Most of the time I was like, at least it was, we remained friends, but I said, Hey, this is not a, I say, okay, I understand. I'm a niche person. So I have, I have a niche level of attraction that you're not, but so you're interested in my friend who's a little more mainstream. And, uh, so like, but you see, but we're still, all still friends, which part, you know, part of you, maybe now as an adult, I might say, well, let me think about it. But at the time I say, well, okay, let's, let's, uh, like, uh, so you hang around with your friends that are dating. And I guess the third wheel part could be one, you know, what, am, what do, am I like looking at my boundaries properly or not? Do I just want to be friends with them? And I think most of the time the answer is, yeah, yeah probably. And maybe the other side of it is, well, we want to do some um, light kissing, uh, you know, like the people do in Europe where they kiss each other on the cheeks. We do like to do that. Uh, and, you know, and you say, oh, OK, well, I'll just sit over here on the couch. Like that happens to me in the movies. I say, oh, boy. Uh, yeah, it's my middle name. Uh, like there's probably a better term for it. But I'd say, no, I'm the wheelbarrow. You two hop in. 
and I'll roll around. I never had a car, so also I, I wasn't like a third wheel driver, luckily. Um, but they say, well, you bring us come. I say, well, great. So I said, my purpose, so I have a crush on you and you found a purpose for me, both of you together in your new relationship. Like, so I'm, it's more of like a really, I, th- I think here's an empowering term. And then you could decide if the role fits. It's like I was their relationship mascot. They say, yeah, we like having you around or side sidekick's a little too diminutive. Mascot feels empowering. Because you have to put on a suit, at least imaginarily. And you could say, you know what? I'm not interested in being your relationship mascot. Uh, Because they say, well, it's fun having a person dressed as a giant eagle. Uh, You know, except when we're trying to kiss each other on the cheeks. We prefer to do that in private. And you say, okay, I can just put my bird head on backwards and I can't hear anything anyway. And I'll go lie down. I fall asleep pretty fast in this bird suit. Um, but you could, that makes it easy role to set. Am I going to be cheering along your relationship and I'm there as an extra fun, which is kind of good. Like sometimes, uh, I've had people, I've been in relationships and then had a third person actually a few different times and it, it was fun. It was like a mutual friend whose presence we both enjoyed. And so I guess you could also use that mutual friend, uh, the, whose presence we both enjoy. So you could decide. I don't know if that mascot, a mutual other ass cot. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see how it goes, I guess. Uh, my advice, think about what what you're comfort, comfortable with. Uh, because you could be, you say, well, for the time being, I'll cheer along your relationship. I'll be your mascot. And you say, well, no, I'd prefer to just be, I'm not sure how I feel. I need some time. But for me as an introvert and a person who practices a lot of avoidance, the nice thing about either being the extra wheel, which you say it's great if you get, a, I mean, I guess that would be, I never fell into that one thinking, well, if you get a flat, if he gets a flat tire, I could, you know, you could change it out and put me in there. Most of my delusions had been already uh, corrected with reality already in my third wheel situations. So I never thought it was like a spare tire. I mean, I've been in that position in a different way, but so, oh boy, this is getting deep, but this is supposed to be a sleep podcast, Uh, but I promised you I'd talk about it and try to empower you to say, yeah, no, I prefer, I prefer, I prefer to be friends with, you know, I'll I'll just think about what my preferences are. Sure, I could do that, but in your head you say, I'm going to be your relationship mascot for the time being. I'm going to cheer, cheer, cheer for, maybe I'll get some pom-poms, imaginary ones, and do a roll, and I'll cheer, cheer, cheer for you as a couple. Doesn't sound so great as the more I talk about it, but it could be. It could be. I'm trying to think of anything. I can't think of any example. I mean, it could be fun for a time. That's the thing. Things evolve and change. Uh, and then your friend might, you know, one of them might say, you could get it, you could take that suit off. The relationship's over. We don't need a mascot. And you, you did good, though, as our mascot. It wasn't your fault. It was, uh, we were incompatible. Um, or you say, yeah, I prefer, I, if we all enjoy one another's company, I'm comfortable with that boundary. So I don't know. From experience, uh, I'm going to go with like, uh, I, I'll, I'll live in my, ma- say, well, okay, so I tried to live in my imagination with the crush, didn't work out. Now I'll live in my imagination in the mascot. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, this is like, I'm digging so deep in the past because I don't have any current context for it, but, and I hope I don't. So anyway, I'm glad you're here. If that's the kind of stuff you could relate to, I'm here to help uh, tonight. Oh, so the structure of the show, oh, the story tonight will be um, some unboxing of some magic. And that's part of our like ongoing partnership uh, to start uh, making hygiene kits for the Midnight Mission. So if you haven't checked out sleepwithmepodcast.com slash Midnight Mission yet, please do. But I'm glad you're here. Uh, I really work hard, uh, really yearn and I strive and I really hope I can help you fall asleep. Thanks again for coming by. And here's a couple of ways I'm able to do it for you for free twice a week. Everybody scoots here. This is another episode of our, um, series unboxing (laughs) magic, I guess it's called. Uh, and I've been trying to pick up magic sets, uh, now I won't be doing any magic. I don't know. Like uh, that's, what's interesting. I, 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 uh, 
if if there's ever a time like where yeah i'm not going to do any magic i'm tr- i'm trying to figure that part out but uh i don't know maybe maybe i could figure something out for it so um but this is about unboxing magic so i got another magic set this one is an open box but the box is sealed you know what i'm saying so i don't know what's actually in there and it's a really big box so i'm going to grab it and we'll start going and see what's in there Oh boy, is it the heavy. And the reason I'm excited, this isn't the same one I got as a kid that started out my interest in trying to find used magic sets. Uh, but it is one of these kits. And I know maybe magicians, and we won't know what quality the stuff is uh, to uh, until we unbox it. But uh, this one's called uh, Fantasy. Uh, I'm changing the names around, but uh, Fantasy Magic. It has 300 plus tricks plus a down instructable video, instructional video download. Okay, so at least it was made in the last 10 years, I'm guessing. Amazing magic, easy to do. You can impress, it comes with a performance table and uh, you can make stuff appear in it. It's officially endorsed by the uh, International Brotherhood of Magicians. So that might be good. It's age seven plus, and it is big, uh, like a, the size of like a large Lego kit, like a large one. So you're talking maybe, um, I don't even know, my forearm. It's longer than my from my elbow to the tip of my finger, and then it's about my forearm wide and my entire hand thick. If you want, you know, to get to the specific. And it doesn't have, it just has what kind of comes in there. Uh, it comes with a poster, Legends of Magic. But yeah, let's, let me open it and then we'll go from there. Of course, I don't have any, <laughs> I didn't plan this out. I mean, I, yeah, so give me a second. Okay, so it took a, a lot of work to get it in here just because, uh, like, I've been working a climbing closet and this is a pretty big set. Uh, and it does have some of the trappings of a slightly used magic kit. There's even fingerprints. I'm just <laughs> seeing on a couple things that are shiny. And I'm not sure everything is here, but, uh, you know, that's kind of thing. The magic uh, of a magic set is that uh, of a used magic set. There is magic in that old used magic set, set Scooch, Scoots found. For when he placed it in his lap, he began to meander around. So let's go over what could be missing first. Uh, um, there's a couple things that do look like they're missing. Oh, wait. So this is where the rings go. And maybe that goes there. So maybe nothing is missing. So I'm looking at it from a top view. Uh, it's arranged, you know, for packaging and shipping. On the top right is a deck of cards. Then there's some sort of clear plastic tube with fake money in there. Then there's a purple cup. Uh, it looks like an upside down. Um, oh, there's it's there's things. There's another cup nested inside it. Uh, looks like an upside down. It looks like a little bit like a what do you call that? A pot you'd put a plant in. There's some red rope, and it actually looks like high quality rope uh, um, for magic. I mean, because I've seen a lot of magic sets. Uh, then there's a magic wand that's loose in there that's long and thin, about the thickness of a pencil, but uh, twice or three times as long. Then there's also two other magic wands with the red tassels attached to them. There's one, two, three and a half red balls. So hopefully, and I remember this from the other magic set I had, was that, uh, that also happened when I bought the other one as a kid that I didn't have all... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have all my red balls, uh, my red hollow balls uh, that uh, I just didn't, uh, you know, I don't have all my marbles either. But uh, so I don't know if that'll impact my ability to impress the audience, because uh, that was like one of the things I was like, oh, one day, you know, I'll be able to make balls disappear. And I said, yeah, well, out of anyway, there's a crushed plastic cup that looks like a standard solo cup. But it's got a bunch of, um, it's got, maybe these are fake, uh, what are those things called, handkerchiefs? They're not very good quality compared to the rope. Uh, red, green, and blue, they look like they're flag material, but low quality. I mean, but maybe they're not uh, handkerchiefs. 
then there's a oh interesting this is something for something for some kind of magic uh, there's a red circle and on one side it's flat on the other side there's like pie pieces and at least one of them opens up uh Oh, maybe like a, where I could hide money in there? A quarter? It looks like there's a cutout for something about the size of a quarter, like a trap door. Then we have uh, three silver cups. Uh, they, again, look like you could put little plants in them. Imagine that. You say, what, what kind of shop did Scoots end up opening? Oh, he sells uh, flowering magic sets i'm sorry what yeah it's a bespoke you know one of his bespoke things it won't last but uh yeah he sells he puts he plants things in magic sets uh like ball, red ball, red ball half balls uh, half spheres uh, full with uh you know air plants or whatever or silver cups uh he makes them into mini pots i wouldn't do that because that would take too much research but but yeah, there's three silver cups. Uh, then there's a uh, a um, a thumb, you know, extra a thumb add. If you want your thumb to be long, if you've ever fantasized about having a longer thumb, uh, your your days of dreaming are over. It's here. Then there's a, something that says it's the money machine, and there's a hundred dollar. Who? Oh, let's look at the money. I think I definitely had some of these. This is might be standard stuff. And then we have a $100 bill with a Houdini on it. Phantasm, fantastic magic or whatever. Their website, not legal tender. And we have another uh, bill that's like looks like something happened to it. And then the fake bills. So I don't know how that works. Uh, then we have three metal rings uh, that are in like a... They're kind of interlaced. You can barely hear them. I apologize, but uh, that's the magic audio. You'll hear a tiny bit of uh, clinking. Oh, no, you know what? I'm sorry. There's four rings. There's one in the bottom. Uh, then we have, uh, let's see. I'm going to skip to the bottom right. Bottom right is, uh, huh, interesting. Oh, boy. There's a mirror. Like, there's a, a flat piece of mirror in a cup. I don't know. I just felt something when I picked this up. I mean, like emotionally. So I don't know. I may be having some sort of magic, <laughs> magic flashback, man. There was a, a, a clear cup inside a cup that uh, has uh, some sort of ridges on it and a red thing. And then there's a mirror inside, which probably is part of the illusion. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, then there's a small paddle. Uh, it looks a bit like a religious artifact. It's red. It has a cross at the top. It also circles. And then three small poofy balls like that I would put at the top. Like if I was um, if I was dealing with a CL, like a, a, if I was making, if I had a baby and I was making it a Halloween outfit, where it was going to be a C-L-O-W-N. These balls are the kind of poofy balls I would make for fake buttons. Or if I was making a uh, hat for uh, el like, el like elven buddies, uh, that's what I would use. Then there's a couple of black boxes. The first black box is 100% empty. Oh, no, there's a penny in there. <laughs> a real penny, I think. I don't know if it's a magic penny. Uh, when a hate penny will do... Uh, I don't know if this is for the cards or for something else, but it's just a box that closes and opens. Then there's another box. Oh, that's a little bit deeper and uh, probably for some, you know, has some magic properties. Oh, it's like a drawer. It has a drawer in it uh, that opens and closes. And that's it in here. Oh, here's another fake quarter. There's a fake quarter. I bet you that goes with that uh, other thing. A lot of instructions here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the box. I'm going to take the box out of the studio. If I have to go, go get it again, I, I will, just because it, otherwise it's going to make a big mess. And I'm, like, I'll tell you what, as soon as I hit pause, I'm, I'm a lot of the stuff. Oh, wait, you're right. Let's look at the um, cards first. Okay, so no offense to Magic Kit, but um, the cards are... They are plastic. They do have a plastic coating, but you can tell 
that they're not exactly the highest quality. Um, and but let's take a look and see. There's one blank card, and it's one of these decks. I think that's like fifty fifty. Oh, it has different things for different. It has a Joker. It has a two and a half of hearts. It has one, so it is like half, like some cards, and then half of a repetitive card, which is kind of standard. I've seen in a lot of these decks, and maybe it's maybe they're kind of cutting away. My daughter figured out how to do it. I've not been able to do it where you can kind of they're different. Like if you mix them all together, you can kind of shuffle them one way or the other. But that's a bit beyond my pay grade. Well, because I have no pay grade, but I'm gonna put those back in here. And I'm going to look at the instructions. And don't worry, I have plenty of other magic, uh, and we'll talk about it. But let's see what the... I like to, like, reve- not reveal how the tricks are done, but what the tricks you could expect, what the illusion, you know, not, like, uh, where the... You know what I mean. Okay, so we have the fantastic magic uh, instruction manual. There's also downloads. Now, I guess I'll talk about this now. I mean, this isn't, like... I, don't, I feel like this is uh, somewhere between big magic and... Indie magic, and I don't know, like, again, I don't have no idea what I'm talking about, so I haven't done any research. But from getting these magic sets over the past couple months, and when you're hearing this, it'll be over a span of years, uh, between probably 2021 and 2023, uh, I did notice, like, at some point with the internet, and, and some of the stuff is, like, pre-Google even, like, the eras when Yahoo and other search engines kind of dominated, or even those kind of stores, online stores, that there it was a big, and probably still is a big, indie magic community where you could just buy one specific magic uh, uh, thing. But this one is kind of uh, professionally made, but it's it doesn't seem like it's made by some giant corporation. So somewhere in between. Now, the... the um, so it looks like, and, and uh, another thing I like about this, uh, now I haven't found any handwritten notes really in any of this magic stuff, but like, uh, it just reminds me of things that are never completely filed through on, and that's probably good. That's why a large number of people that perform magic tend to be very good at it or perform illusions, because just like anything else, like making a boring podcast, believe it or not, takes a lot of work and dedication and repetition to get it down and you have to find the thing that you're going to get through because so this one the um instruction manual it may I mean, it looks it seems like somebody might have been carrying it around in their back pocket but it's not super well worn but it was either carried around for a little while or improperly stored but it does look like somebody looked through it a little bit and uh oh there's 180 this is where i want to start uh uh, but let's see how many, this is like, uh, they're all pretty short instructions. So I'm just trying to see how many, oh, it didn't say 300 magic tricks. Uh, yeah, so it does have 301 though. But this first one I just noticed, this is number, oh, this is billiard balls, but it's not. It's the red ones. Oh, so it was on a videotape or DVD. Oh, so a lot of these you got to look up and watch on the thing. Amazing multiplying billiard balls. Uh, you must have been astonished by Buckingham producing all those billiard balls on your videotape. Uh, and they'll explain how to do it on, uh, on, 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 on uh, you know, so you can do it. Um, but it's basically how you can start with one. It's amazing, you know, this kind of stuff. So you start with one ball. And I mean, the amazing the amount of work. So you would start with, the person would be, you'd see one ball between their index finger and their thumb. And then another ball, by magic, would appear between their index finger and their middle finger. And then they could make another one appear uh, between their middle finger and their ring finger. And then they can make yet another one appear uh, between their, uh, what is that, pinky and their uh, ring finger. So that's pretty impressive. What else we got on this page? Flying coin. Uh, you make a neat little routine, vanishing a coin, and then you say it's now invisible. To get it back, I need a coin trap, uh, and you make one using a coaster and a glass. Uh, 
And uh, then you can produce your coin right under the uh, glass and finish by saying, I don't like to have too much invisible money because the shops won't take it. That's what I like. Number, this one is uh, your setup. Uh, oh, is this for 180? Huh. Start with one solid ball in your left hand pocket. Maybe this is in my. But, uh, yeah, let's see. Incredible coin coaster. Have a look at your coin coaster and turn it upside down. You'll see a flap uh, that we saw. Huh, okay, that one's uh, the cost of travel. Oh, here's the penny. Put a one-cent coin in an envelope and seal it. On the envelope, write a rival station. Borrow a dollar. Put it into your tube. Put it in my tube, man. Wrap the tube up. Uh, and uh, have the ball travel to the arrival station. The, the bill will have vanished from the tube. And then you open the envelope and show the penny. Did I mention the cost of the ticket was 99 cents? Uh, oh, okay. So I guess I gave away. I didn't give away how it's done. But uh, so you make You turn a dollar into a penny. That's cool. Silk, uh, silkworm. Oh, the, so I guess these are progressive tricks. So let me start a little further along. Oh, and this is uh, Roger is the CWO, the chief wizard officer of this company. So that's cool. Okay, so it starts with the illusion box. That's what you can make out of the lid. I don't know. I guess it, like by the time you hear this, maybe I'll do this. This could be good for live shows if I... Um, did magic, but it was in the production, like it was in the uh, style of the podcast, uh, where there was never a ma- like it's like, oh, I just went to a magic show. Oh, how many tricks did they perform? Um, zero. Like he started to perform one and then talked about delivering newspapers as a child and getting a perm, and it was over. Oh, interesting. Okay, so the amazing illusion box that's kind of how to put it together. There's uh, secret things in there, and you can make a bunny appear, or usually a stuffed animal, they say. Okay, this one is called That's All, Folks. Uh, as you finish each of your tricks uh, during a show, put your props into a box. Uh, a tidy magician is a good magician. If you say this every time, it'll become like a catchphrase, and you may even find your audience joining in. At the end of the show, you close the door of your box, snap your fingers, and uh, all the props will have vanished. And you can even use a paper plate, and and the paper, they'll be on the paper plate, but they'll have vanished, uh, which is even more baffling. Switcheroo. Your your illusion box can also be used uh, to, to magically change one object to another. You can apparently make knots magically appear in a handkerchief, for example. And, uh, yeah, make, you know, do other things. You can also reverse it. Uh, You could take knots out of something. And you could even tell a story while you do it. Change a toy frog into a prince, uh, if you like. Time to switch. Here's another switching idea. Two, Two pieces of string. Uh, and, uh, there are different lengths. You make one appear in the box, uh, or, or cut it. Uh, you could do different, oh, so this is a lot of different tricks you could do with this. Uh, long piece of string to four pieces of short string. You could, uh, later on in this amazing box of magic, you'll learn how to make a friend pick the five of hearts from an ordinary deck. You can also use your box for this. Uh, you could, uh, Right, uh, you know, prediction, uh, you're going to pick the five of hearts uh, and put it in a box and make it appear. So then, the, you know, I've seen that kind of, that's like a kind of thing with a truck driving by or whatever with uh, David Blaine. Uh, then you could uh, also, uh, what else, uh, stinky socks, uh, two pairs of socks, uh, dirty and clean and uh, you could switch them around uh, for your friend for amusement. Uh, make them appear super soda, and uh, make one take one can of soda, pour it in a glass. Uh, I don't understand that one. 
uh, bananas, uh, refill a banana. Oh, so it's like somehow you're refilling it with magic. I don't understand how the illusion works. So, uh, and then, okay. So this is a magic wand and now we're getting into, so, uh, you can use the wand to point at objects, uh, wave the wand and you could, you know, watch the, uh, uh, video where you learn how to pluck money from midair, but you could also, uh, Make a wa- like a wand wobble like it's made of rubber. My wobbly magic wand. You could make the wand appear. Uh, produce a wand. You just take a like a small box, like a card card case, uh, and you can make it come out of the box. Uh, and um, somehow you could also make the wand cling to your hand. And, uh, you could make it, uh, professionally cling to your hand. So that's cool. Like, uh, so you really up the trick, uh, rolling wand, uh, you can make it magically roll across the table. Like, uh, you, you have magnetic powers or power of mind force. Uh, wow. That's cool. Numbered wand, uh, you could discover a number that is being thought of, uh, and you tap, you need a clock, you tap across on the number. I don't understand that one, but you know, that's me. My, you can lift it out of a bottle. You can, uh, somehow hold the wand and, uh, put a ring on it and, uh, and make the ring, uh, Move up and down the wand. You can uh, use it for different things. You can produce your wand from anywhere. Okay, then they have a purple mystery box. Uh, oh, I think mine is black, but uh, you can uh, put an object inside and make it disappear. That's always cool, man. I don't know how they do that, uh, even though I have the magic kit. Um, backwards mystery box, uh, finished, great finish for your show. Get really get the audience at the end of the show, fill your box with candy and show them your empty box. Uh, then make a magical gesture to open the box and show the appearance of the candy and share it with the audience. So maybe this is a different box than the one we're seeing. Uh, and you can always use more than one of your props together to create even more magic. Uh, and uh, it could reappear. By using duplicates of your cards, you can make two cards uh, appear in special boxes uh, to make your card reappear or appear even more spectacular. You'll need two identical cards. Uh, you can make a magical message appear, boxy production and prediction. You can take a stage effect further by making a real bo- object appear, be produced from the box, like a watch or a hanky. Show the empty box and then make something appear for real there. You could also use it for covert information to have a message for something you couldn't even know and show them that you're like a half mind reader, half spy. So, uh, yeah, somehow you put that. And then there's the amazing money paddle. This is a simple piece of sleight of hand. So you have a paddle. And you you move it around. You can show both sides that there's nothing in there. And uh, you can really create, a, you can make a coin appear. You can multiply coins. Uh, you can make real money. Uh, you can make money vanish. You could also have a coin uh, produced uh, in... And a reba- like a rebounding coin. You could make unlimited money appear. You could change money. You could do a full changing routine. Okay, then we have the magic coin base. I was looking at that earlier. It's another apparatus that is more than it first appears to be. So it's like a three piece thing. You place a coin. Place a coin. I'm going to try to take the coin without you seeing me, and uh, you could just make the coin disappear. You could also duplicate the coin. Uh, You can make it go from your mystery box there to the thing. 
You could also switch coins. Uh, you could use the mystery box in this thing for uh, candy. Change heads or tails. You could use your paddle with this. Then there's something called cups and balls. Uh, and I said, I thought that was like sport a sporting analogy. But uh, before your show, uh, you you have these cups. Oh, and the sponge balls. Those are the ones I was like, oh, I put them on a cl- baby clown outfit. And you can make, I don't know, you make ball, like the, the sponge balls appear and disappear and move from cup to cup. That's always cool. Oh, they could appear like on the top. You can make them multiply. You could even have the audience, you know, to help with that. Okay, then there's something called the French drop, which I guess is a big magic thing. You can make the wand uh, go through the cup, uh, which is interesting, or go deeper than you thought possible. Super depth illusion, crazy depth illusion, vanishing milk, uh, so this comes with a, oh, maybe I had this one, uh, where you can make an entire glass of milk vanish. So that was, uh, like, one of the things. So then you can do vanishing milk and cookie, chocolate milk, suspending milk, a uh, hanky from milk. Then you have a special card box. That was the one I was looking at. Uh, and, oh, you can even use magic. I didn't see a way to use that for magic, but apparently there is a way to use that for ma- vanishing cards, confusing cards, restoring cards, writing from uh, the other world, uh, cards leaping or getting away, AT- make it, you know, make money appear. Wow, photos, silly photos. I guess this is older because it says you could, you could search for jobs from the newspaper and forcing a card. So then we get into the card tricks. So, yeah, a lot in here. But, um, yeah, we'll stop here. And then I got more indie tricks we'll go through uh, here in a second. All right, everybody, Scoot's back here with some more magic. Now, this is so we're going to get into some indie magic uh, right now. So, uh, fun stuff. I'm going to reach down. I'm going to tell you what I found, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. Okay, so these are all uh, things you could probably get on the Internet. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, some of them are still wrapped. This one is called the uh, 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 Pantum, a uh, bit pronounced with an F, Rising Card. And an image of a deck of cards magically appears on a picture of an empty glass tumbler. Then a freely selected card rises out of the picture of the card deck, and you could use any deck of cards. It comes with the apparatus and instructions. This is a novel rising card effect. Uh, You display an ordinary deck of cards, which can be examined and shuffled. The card can freely be selected for the deck and may be signed if you wish. The performer now explains that the normal rising card routine involves placing the gla- deck in a glass tumbler and commanding the card to rise. But with all the broken tumblers in your bag of props, uh, modif- modified the trick. The performer now displays a large card with a piece of glass with a picture of a glass tumbler, stating he now uses a tumbler, which is easier to pack. Uh, and guaranteed not to break. A deck of cards is placed uh, on a large card depicting the tumbler, and the performer attempts to capture the image of the deck in the tumbler. The deck is tipped off the card, and there is now an image of the cards inside the tumbler. Now you name your card and command it to rise from the deck. And also, as a spectator does, the card rises from the picture of the deck in the tumbler. And as it rises, it can clearly be seen to be the selected card, complete with the signature. The card can be pulled out of the deck and can be given for examination. So, cool. Uh, Sounds fun. That one sounds like magic. This one sounds up my alley. uh, Probably because you can use a regular deck, I guess. Okay, this one is a trademark or copyright from 1974. One, two, three, change. Uh, from, uh, it comes from Virginia. Uh, magic by mail, way back then. 
Oh, and it looks like it has more than one a trick in here. Uh, there's also another one called Interference. Uh, and here, Interference. A performer shows two cards, one which folds lengthways and the other folds sideways. After the cards are folded... It is seen that each of the cards has a small round hole going through them. The long folded card is placed inside the sideways folded card and the holes are aligned. A cigarette or pencil is inserted into the hole, thus securing the cards together. Suddenly, the long card is pulled back and forth, uh, penetrating the cigarettes. The cigarette is removed and the cards are shown to be intact. Cool. I mean, that's two tricks I probably could do. Uh, and then this one is the one, two, three change. Oh, there's two or two tricks actually here. So let's do one, two, three change first. Okay, one, two, three change. Three cards are shown face up, and the audience is asked to remember the middle one. The cards are turned face down, and the middle one is removed. The remaining cards are turned over to show the middle one has been removed. The middle card is named and turned over to reveal it is now completely changed. Cool. So that one, uh, one, two, three, change. That's a pretty simple trick. And this last one is called Two Card Monty. Two Card Monty. Each, uh, two different cards are shown to, to someone. Uh, one is face up, the other face down. Both cards are shown front and back. Uh, one card is placed behind the performer's back. Quicker than the blink of an eye, the two cards change places. And uh, you don't even have to do This can be repeated over and over again. Cool. Two, so one card face up, one card face down. You show them front and back. Uh, then you place one behind your back, and then the cards somehow change places. Very exciting. This next one is uh, has effects on it. it uh, it's called Andrus Floating Card. And it shows someone that looks like a higher power from another universe against a spiraling background holding two cards. Uh, and one seems to be floating. And it has the two cards. Also has other things you can buy. Uh, Zone Zero. A Jerry's classic effect, uh, vanish items behind by like in, into a hole in the center of the board, a Gemini ring, ring and string magic, and the Ellis ring principle, precision machined ring, easy handling, can flip to they don't have any prices, card control. Uh, two volume set contains different card things. You won't find false cuts, shuffles, etc. Only slights uh, that will give you new horizons. The miracle, Jerry's routine reproduces four silver, silver dollars from two cards uh, and then smaller and smaller torn pieces. The Gordon Diary. Card is selected from a borrowed shuffle deck, uh, names any date, looks up, and the uh, card is in the performer's pocket diary. The selected card is printed on their date. Okay, Andrus floating card. A king and queen are removed from a deck of cards and freely shown. The queen is laid on top of the king and begins to levitate. The king is lifted and waved beneath the floating queen. Finally, the queen floats down to the king, and both cards are freely shown. So you can make a card float. One thing I'm learning with I'll have to label these is like red deck or blue decks, because some are red decked cards and some are blue decked cards. Okay, this one this one originally cost seven ninety nine at a magic store. Repeat me, it's called. Ten cards are mixed, fa- displayed mixed face down. Five are given to the performer and the spectator. Okay, so two ten cards are displayed face down. Five are given to the performer, five to the spectator. Uh, the packets are placed behind their backs, and one card is selected and placed on the table face down. Okay, so each put them behind their backs, and one, play, one card is selected face down. Cards are exchanged and placed in opposite packets face up uh, from behind the back. Uh, the remaining face downs are revealing 
I don't understand this one. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it, this one's like a dyslexia one. The packets are both tabled and spread to reveal the ident same identical card face up. The remaining face down cards are turned face up, revealing identical value and suit of every card of a totally different card. Let me see. So it comes with cards, red deck. So these are a lot of these are red deck cards. Uh, so I guess it's like something about the cards is a trick. I don't know. If you get if you have this much magic, you gotta be pretty organized. Okay, we got another bag full of tricks. So I'm gonna hold on though. So I also have envelopes that people uh, bought, like ordered them in. I wonder if it's the same person. This one is like what I was talking about. Uh, Okay, so these were, so this is good. We're investigating. I'm not going to reveal anybody's names, but uh, some of these were bought um, and sent from different places. This one was uh, 2001, August 20th is when it was shipped uh, from one magic place. Uh, this one is from another magic place from 2001, November 2nd. And this last one, 2002, July, and the person was in the same place, uh, but three different companies and then one unlabeled. So this first one just has a bunch of rubber bands and then, and, you know, the rubber bands are 20 years old, so they didn't. They say, Dear Buyer, I'm no longer including the linked gimmick bands. People were getting upset and asked to have their money back because they would break. Okay. What they failed to realize was the, the link bands were homemade and eventually, throughout time and constant use, they will break. I've taken out the responsibility and blame for them in this matter by not including the link bands and ask that you make the gimmicks yourself. Break the band in half, a super glue it back together. Unfortunately, on this one, it doesn't include the instructions. It's just an envelope with a bunch of old rubber bands. Okay, this next one is called The Amazing Floating Glass. And the effect is the magician picks up a frosted glass and a bottle of wine or champagne, but pours the liquid from the bottle into the glass. Uh, and as the magician is a d let's go, the glass remains there floating as it's being filled. Then the magician takes the glass, finishes pouring, puts the do bottle down, and drinks from the glass. And uh, this, I think, is a design your own because there's nothing, no, nothing in here. I don't. The bag that is, the stuff came in is pretty full, though. Okay, this is one over called over and over. And uh, you show cards appearing from nowhere over and over again. Some of these are just too, like, I just don't know anything about magic, you know. Okay, this one looks funny. Uh, controlled thoughts. Uh, you have your spectator pick your thoughts. You prove to your spe spectator that you did, in fact, control their thoughts. And you have a small envelope containing four collector cards. Show it with a flap side up and the top three cards sticking out. And don't let the spectator see the fourth. Oh, this is the performance. Oh, this one's pretty funny because it has. So uh, I like this one. It says you're thinking of the troll card. And it has a troll card with uh, like one of those trolls from the movies before they were movies when they were just toys. Uh, Connie Francis American Bandstand card. And a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers uh card i don't know how it works though okay we got one more pretty packed envelope here so i think this has a lot of just tricks instructions on paper okay this one's three card money which we did before then another one two card money but none of the cards are in this envelope but that's fine because we have so many tricks uh and then some uh, invisible thread. That could be handy one day. Okay, we got another bag here. Uh, there's one for uh, conjuring, uh, uh, but the busker conjurer. And then there's a bunch of other stuff in here, little tricks. Uh, 
two dollar Monty or dollar Monty. And again, this comes with the cards, uh, the equipment. Uh, I want to know the. I don't want to know the gimmick though. I want to know the um, performance. Here we go. I'm going to show you how I lost money playing three card money in New, in New York. You've heard of the game, haven't you? Many versions, but they all involve money and cards. Uh, take out some cards, so hold the money with your right hand while your left hand pivots the cards down. I don't know. You might like uh, see, show something. Then there's one four card money, four, four, four. Four cards alike, three different, three, oh no. Five different, you're going to turn over the cards uh, face down. Okay, I don't want to reveal those ones. And then I got another one here. A lot of money, you know. This one's just called Card Trick. It's from Austria. From Vienna Magic. Uh, four kings are transformed into four point, point cards, which may be examined by the audience. Uh and that one does look pretty cool. Like, it's a sleight of hand one. Okay, this one's called Wild Thing. Double climax wild card effect with blank cards from 1989. And actually has 8-bit, uh, uh, like a Zilla of Gods, uh, went back when 8-bit, like this was printed like with print shop or something. Okay, this has also bicycle style cards, red deck. Okay, set up uh, performance. Uh, oh, you got to do some stuff that I can't do, force decks and stuff. Uh, so that's beyond my means right now. Magic, I don't perform it. I just use it to, oh, I just open magic tricks. Okay, this one's called the touch, uh, typewritten. A secret. I don't see the uh, oh the effect. Uh, nine face down cards are shown and cut. The spectator removes one card, places it face down to the side. You divide the remaining piles into two pile the remaining cards into two piles of four. By touching the backs of the card, you find the pair that matches. Not only does the pair match, it matches the card removed by the spectator. Okay, I don't understand that one. And then this is the busker. Uh, this is a lecture. So, huh, this is more of a storytelling. So I'll have to, it might have, uh, I'll check this out, but I, I can't read anything, you know, that uh, I can open stuff and kind of read instructions, but I want to read a story somebody wrote. I'm not sure where we're at with time, so I'll open up a couple more. Okay, this one is boomerang card change. The card is shown front and back, flipped into there, and changes into another card that be, can be shown front and back. Uh, but the card isn't in the thing, so maybe I'll find it in the bag. But probably you could do this uh, anyway. Okay, this one's a quarter in an envelope. Uh, pencil through the quarter trick. Uh, Show the quarter or half dollar on both sides. Hold the coin on both edges between the thumb and finger and uh, face the audience. Push the pencil through the coin and then show them that it's uh, still solid. And there's even uh, a way to fix it, I guess. Okay, fantastic presto. Six colors to one color. It's a stick with six colors on one side and one color on the other. Effect. The magician shows a rod with six different colors on both sides. Uh, the spectator is asked to choose a number from one to six. Uh, the performer then shows a color which responds to the uh, chosen number, flips over, and the entire thing is uh, the selected color. Oh, but I don't know how you do that to make them pick a color. So that one's beyond me. Anything forced dealing, I just not a... Uh, well, this one's interesting. It has a giant mirror and a couple other things in here. Uh, domino. 
Congratulations, you've purchased one of the best and most clever pieces of close-up mentalism either. Domino divination. It's devastating on an audience and simple. Large flat domino is shown. Unlike an or- ordinary domino, this one you, you has dots. Uh, you explain that you made a prediction with hopefully it will come true. Oh, so they can, the spectator can move the dots. They're movable to form any one of the standard domino patterns. Then you hold a mirror next to the domino. See, there's my prediction in the mirror. This will get a laugh. Uh, this is a prelude to what's to follow. Now your actual prediction is revealed, and it's 100% correct every time. So, hmm, I don't know. And then this last one is some sort of ring on a string tricks, or maybe more than one trick is in there. Uh, the ring thing uh, is a very clever, clever coin on card effect uh, that is certain to amaze your audience. Uh, English penny with a hole in it resting in his fingers. A silken cord threaded through the hole. Two spectators make an overhand knot in the cord and tighten it securing the coin in place. Once the coin is secured and the spectators hold the end of the cards, the hand holding the coin is covered with a hanky. The magician makes a magical gesture over the hanky. It's removed and the coin has vanished and there's a a wedding band inside the knots. And that is the trick. This bag was 60 bucks, actually, that I just went through the final one. Six tricks for $60, uh... So pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, that's a little more sleepy magic for you all. Uh, good night. Friends beyond the binary. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for the podcaster. It's time for the podcaster that finally broke out his winter uh, pajamas, which just means uh, sweatpants or other pants, lounge pants, uh, yeah, there's a big news, breaking news when I'm recording this. When you're hearing this, it'll be all, all Scoot sets old news to us. Uh, and I'd say, you know what news is good news? Comforting news, with because these pants are comfortable. They've been worn in quite a few years. They, they were... Uh, they they were day pre uh twenty twenty uh daytime sweatpants for a bit because they were called uh, athletic pants and or tra- a travel pant it, it was actually singular they singulared it uh, to make it more appealing to wear during the day travel pant uh, the travel pant uh, but now they're pajama pants which is still baffled uh, I guess because there's two legs. Uh, but they don't call it a travel shirt, because uh, that would be confused. If you're confused, you're in the right place. It's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that's here to take your mind off stuff and put you to sleep to keep you company in the deep, dark night, because you deserve a place you can get some rest, uh, some place that's going to take your mind off stuff, keep you company, or put you to sleep. Give this show a few tries. It doesn't even work for everybody. I'll tell you that right up front, but see how it goes. Most people it works for, they say, it took two or three tries to get used to because it never made any sense at all, Uh, just like uh, you've seen so far. But I really want to help. There's a lot of people listening that know how it feels in the deep, dark night, and I've been there, tossing, turning, mind racing, so that's why I want to help too. So kick back, see how it goes, give it a few tries. It is a bit different. We'll start off with uh, some support, then there'll be a long, meandering intro, and then a bedtime story, because it's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. Uh, Hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. We do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to attempt to do is create a safe place where you could set aside whatever's keeping you awake, whether it's thoughts, you know, things on your mind you're thinking about, thoughts, uh, you know, I have thoughts about the past, I have thoughts about the present, I have thoughts about the future, I have thoughts about, I have thoughts and feelings about my thoughts, about myself, about, you know, so many thoughts, uh, 
so 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 little time too too many thoughts so little you know how whatever the phrase thoughts about phrases thoughts about famous quotations about thoughts thinking about those quotations about thoughts um but it could be thoughts it could be feelings i was just thinking about bartlett's familiar qu- quotations you used to have to buy a book there used to be a book. I don't know if there was only one edition. Hmm, that's a good question. Was there more than one Bartlett's book? Maybe that's what tonight's episode will be about. Uh, it will be. That way I don't have to explain it all. But there was what used to be a book or, a, I don't know, is that an anthology? Bartlett's familiar quotations or famous quotations? I don't know if, if no quotations are familiar to me. You see, that sounds familiar, Scoots, but I think you're off. Uh, what about Bart? Here's a book I'll never want to Bartlett's familial uh, uh, quotations. Uh, it, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you like uh, so many quotes from my Nana about me. Uh, don't quote me. Again, in the past, you know, don't quote me that way. Don't misquote me. Also, don't quote me. My na- That's a quote from my Nana, a real one. You know, don't call me the Nana that lives in your mind, even though I'm the Nana that just lives in your mind. Because you can't prove, you know, I say, okay, maybe you're not. The- I've tried meditating, Nana. And they say, don't, you know, go, don't, you know, put yourself outside of your head or whatever they say in those meditations. And I say, yeah, no, my Nana, well, she's everywhere within me, my Nana. She's everywhere within me, especially when I'm with, you know, especially when I'm misquoting her. Don't quote, oh boy, there you go. Oh, there's another one. There you go again. There's (laughs) that one. or, Or usually she says, there he goes again. Too much Kool-Aid. There's another one. Quotes, uh, made-up quotes about my made-up Nana. Bartlett's book of made-up quotes about a made-up Nana. Pending in uh, whatever, because uh, they said, you can't call our book that. I said, really? Oh, just just you wait. There's another one. Just just wait. Uh, just you wait, usually Nana says. Uh don't call you. Don't. Oh, this one's me. Don't call me on your nana phone. And she says that. Oh, then this is another quote from my nana. Don't worry. I'll get. Eventually, there may be a sleep podcast here. Uh, oh, I already forgot. Don't. Uh, don't. Uh, what did I say? Don't call me on my nana phone. I forgot. She had. She had to come back to that. Don't worry. I won't. But that wasn't. It was something else. I said. I forgot. There's another quote from Nana. See, he forgot. Uh, he'll get over it. There's another one. Disappointment is is a part of life. There's a, yet another Nana quote in there. Get used to it. Toughen up. Uh, uh, save. You know. Sa- here's one. Not a Nana quote. It's actually a quote from the weekend. Save your tears for a rainy day or another day. I save mine for rainy days and another, save your tears for another day. You're right, Nana. Don't misquote the weekend. That That's another Nana. Oh, sorry, I'm in a sleep pod. So thoughts keeping me awake. My ma- feelings uh, related to those thoughts, related to my imaginary Nana that lives within me. Uh, it could be physical sensations. Luckily, I only, only I don't experience my Nana in a direct somatic way. I mean, I do, but when I have the feelings about my nan, it brings up uh, a physical response. But I don't have a direct physical response to my nana. Uh, other, well, I mean, I, I want to bolt, but I can't, you know, there's nowhere for me to go because she lives within me. Oh, did I mention, if you're new, I have, I have a nana. I've never had real nana, but I have one that lives within me. Also, if you may, you may see, are you using Nana in a pejorative way? I'd say probably I ain't. I mean, more of a um, huh, good question. I don't think so. I'm referring to an archetypal, my own archetypal Nana. That was that a was that a Wim Wenders film? My own uh, archetypal Nana. I don't know. Like it could have been. 
uh, but, but my own person, my own archetypal Nana. I mean, that's really what I have is a, uh, she's a figure, a, uh, not a motherly figure, but you'd say she could have been, she wasn't a mother to either one of my parents and she's not an aunt or an aunt, uh, but she is a, uh, like a figure within me. I think she was formed honestly from, uh, like different experiences I had, uh, during, uh, clearly. I mean, come on, let's, the Northern Europeans already put out a couple papers on this. Don't worry. Sorry. I'm sorry, Nana. I, I have to apologize because I live with her 24 seven. Okay. So thoughts, feelings, physical sensations, any changes in time or temperature or routine. So anything going on, you know, you could be traveling, you could have guests, you could have something coming up. Whatever it is, I'm here to keep you company and take your mind off stuff so you could fall asleep because you deserve a good night's sleep. That is true. Not only do I believe it, there's hundreds of thousands of people listening right now that not just believe it, that want it for you. And they don't want it for you in some way like running across the finish line. They say, that would be nice for you. You do deserve that. And you might see there's a bunch of strangers that I don't know pulling for me. And I say there are. In this case, really, truthfully, there are. Uh, Just like truthfully, I have an internal archetypal Nana that's only, you know, only my own archetype of Nana. You know, that says, there you go. There he goes again. You know, talking about me. And that makes her frown. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, wow. She's as real as day. I mean, you can hear it. You'd say, what, what, what's the guy? I heard the guy from Sleep Pod, so that Sleep Podcast was actually able to manifest something in his life. Yep, a uh, Nana. She moved in with him. She takes, I take care of him. He doesn't take care of me. That's another quote. She put that on a pillow and over the front door and as a bumper sticker and a t shirt, but it, like an arrow to, towards her. She takes care of me. I don't take care of her. Uh, without her, I'd be lost, uh, my Nana. Well, I'd just be wandering, even with her, I'm wandering around. Okay, um, oh, you deserve a good night's sleep. And, and, you know, a lot of us have been there. That's why I make the show. We might not know, or I might not know exactly what you're going through, exactly what you're dealing with. But if if I don't know how it feels, someone out there does. And for a lot of us, a lot of the feelings of not looking forward to bedtime strongly, not being able to sleep, the frustration, uh, we've been through that. So I'm here to help uh, because you deserve a bedtime you could feel neutral about or look forward to. Now, this show does not work for everybody. The way it works is I send my voice across the deep, dark night. I'm going to use lulling soothing, creaky dulcet tones, pointless meanders, which you've kind of already heard and seen where I go off topic, I get mixed up, uh, then I forget, you know, then I re-talk, I talk about something. Uh, he's just He just goes on and on and on, just like she said, uh, my Nana. He won't, you know, he won't let it go. He doesn't know how to do that. Uh, all those things. Those are pointless meanders and superfluous tangents and all Oh, a couple other things that are hard to, uh, when you first get here, when you first start listening, uh, that are hard to get used to. One, the show is just not for everybody. While there is a lot of people listening alongside you here across the world, and we all share that feeling of the deep, dark night, this show just doesn't work for everybody. But for most of those people that are regularly listening, it took them two or three tries to get used to the show. Because at first you're like, what is what is this dude talking about? That's a normal reaction. I just want vindi- to validate that. And you say, I thought this was a sleep podcast uh, where you're going to take me on a journey. Sounds like you've got a lot of issues. I said, wow, you are observant. Uh, and uh, what are you even talking about? I say, well, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I, I know what I'm, I, I know, I know it. I know when, you know, my Nana, I know it when I hear it. Uh, I know her when I hear her. I feel her when I hear her. When I hear her, I feel things. Uh, She's my Nana. That could be, it sounds like a song, though, like with the thing. She's my Nana. She's my Nana, the musical. 
playing 24-7 without music in my brain. Usually only like the part of the second act where, you know, that one part of the second act where there's frowning. Or the longest uh, second act in history. Just like a bit like a sleep podcast. Uh, he'll never let it go. No, that's, that's a, Nana wouldn't say that. She'd have a subtler way to say that. But so this podcast does take some getting used to. One, because it's a show you don't really listen to. I'm here to, to uh, kind of just be barely paid attention to. Now, if you, if you need to listen to me, I'm here. Because I'm not here to, 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 for you to pay attention to me so much as for me to be background noise or something alternative to you, for you to listen to. Just like I'm talking about in this other example. You know, when I find something outside of myself to pay attention to, then I'm less likely to get caught up in, in you know, these uh, parts of me. These wonderful archetypal parts of me, so wise uh, in her uh, wisdom that she wants to share from with me, but I'm so resistant to it. But if I get outside of myself, uh, you say, okay, this is a little bit distracting. And there are lovable things about my Nana, her ability to shawl herself, butterscotch candy, the fact that sometimes she smiles, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that she smiles so rarely makes her smile that much more wonderful. That would be also, that's another song in the musical. N could we call it Nana, the musical? I mean, I think that this, here, is there anyone on Broadway that listens to this podcast? I mean, you say, okay, wait a second. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a title for a musical, Nana, the musical. Uh, you know, we do, would have some, you know, there'd be a lot of hurdles uh, beyond that, like a plot, and because you plot about your uh, internal archetypal Nana, probably won't, and I say, you're right about that. So, yeah, but Nana, the musical, <laughs> what did I already say? It's playing in my brain. Uh, but so, oh, so I'm just kind of uh, uh, inane chatter. Yes, Nana, I heard you change the spelling of inane. Um so I'm a podcast you don't really listen to. It's also not a podcast that puts you to sleep. I'm here to keep you company in the deep, dark night, to be your boar friend, your boar bay, your boar sib, your boar bestie, your boar burr, your neighbor, your boar bud, your banana, your boar banana, your banana, like Eric, Eric, is it Eric Banya, bon, banana, Eric Banna and my nana, uh, had a banana, a faux fana, fanana fana, faux ban, you know. So, yeah, that's something that never happened. You know, he's Australian, Nana. Oh, she knew that. Thanks. So, yeah, I'm more here to keep you company than to take your mind off stuff. If you can't sleep, I'm here to the very end. If you wake up, I'm here. If you want to turn me on later, I'm here. If you need a break during the day, I'm here. I'm here to keep you company. That's it. Uh, and, and just barely entertain you. So that's... uh. Uh, the two things that take some getting used to, uh, other than my personality, which, you know, it's not for everybody. Sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you has tons of other sleep podcasts and sleepy audio on there. Um, What else? Oh, the structure of the show throws people off. It's designed in a very specific way, but that can throw people off. So let me tell you why. So the show starts off with a greeting. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, nanas everywhere. Uh, so you feel seen and welcome and you say, okay, I could check the show out. Maybe I will. Then there's support for listeners, uh, support for the show and support for communities around the show. And the support for the show comes in two forms. People who directly support the podcast, they actually never hear this stuff because they don't, they get ad free shows. And then people who support the sponsors who support the show in return for the support they get. And what that enables us to do is put the show out twice a week uh, for free wherever you want to listen to it. So that's cool. And then there's uh, the intro, which goes on and on and on. Sometimes people lump it in with the support stuff, but it's like 12, to whatever we are, like we're at 15 minutes, I think, of me rambling and going on and on and on, trying to ex ex explain what the podcast is and getting distracted by whatever's bubbling up in my brain. And because of that, uh, 
I don't know. People say, oh, is that just the show's like 20 or 25 minutes of ads? It's like, no, the, sh- the intro is uh, actually the most important but, but, uh, and popular part of the podcast for most fans, but not all fans. Some people like only the stories. Uh, but the intro it, it really serves two purposes. Introduce the podcast to new people. And, uh, like, uh, then it, it, it kind of eases you into bedtime. It gives you part of your bi- bedtime routine. Part of your wind down could be the intro. It eases you into bedtime. So some listeners are getting ready for bed. Some are doing some other re- relaxing activity. Some people are in bed getting comfortable. Some people are asleep. We're happy for them, kind of, somewhat happy for them. I mean, if you're a regular listener to the show, we're happy for you. If you're a partner of someone listening to the show, you know, we're kind of happy for you. Uh, so 2% of people skip the intro, but just as many people uh, listen to intro-only episodes or story-only episodes. But if you're new, just kind of see how it goes and then decide. But it really is nice to have a bedtime routine and to have a couple pieces of that routine. The podcast, maybe some other chill activity. Whatever it is. Uh, so that's the intro. Then there's more support again. So the show can be free or paying for it can be optional. And then there's a story. Apparently, we came up with it'd be something about Bart. I don't know, something about quotations. And maybe I'll look up what that Bartlett's familiar quotations is. And because it's say, what is that? Who is Bartlett? Was it someone that just loved quotes? I wonder, you'd say, what is. Um, Whoa, now I can't even think of uh, Michael Scott's favorite book. It could be Bartlett's Quotations. If that, if you had to give Michael Scott a gift, pro tip, give him a book. Or, or you said, has there, was there a, if you said, write me a uh, fan fiction office episode right now, I'd say, well, Michael, uh, someone gives Michael, someone Michael idolizes gives him the book. Uh, you know, that would be one of the, you know, the A plot. Uh, but he would he would need to use a book for something a par, part of the a plot. But it would be funny to see him walking around reading from. Maybe that was already an episode. It sounds like it. So there's that. Uh, oh, so what else I even talk? Oh, the intro. Oh no, no the story. So that'll be our story, not a not an office episode because it's. Uh, but it something about Bartlett's quotations. Oh, because I was wondering, is that a person or a mega corporation? Is it Bartlett? You say, with the purchase of a case of pears, you get a book of quotes, Bartlett's. Or vote for Jed Bartlett, a fictional president, a presidential candidate, and get this book that came out 20 years before the show. So that's that. Then there's some thank yous at the end. And, and you know, so that's everything. That's why I make the show. Give it a few tries. See how it goes. I'm glad you're here. Appreciate your time. Thanks for checking this podcast out. And I work really hard at your next drive, and I really hope I can help you fall asleep. And here's a couple of ways I get to do it for free twice a week. All right, hey, everybody, it's Scoots here. I guess we're talking about uh, Bartlett's familiar quotations, at least to start. I looked this up on Wikipedia. It's often simply called Bartlett's. It's B A R T L E T T apostrophe S. And it was written by a Bartlett, John Bartlett. It's an American reference work, longest lived and most widely distributed collection of quotations. First issued in 1855. This is all from Wikipedia and and currently in its 18th edition in 2012. It arranges entries by author rather than subject, uh, as many other quotation collections Enters authors chronologically by date of birth rather than alphabetically. Within years, authors are arranged alphabetically, and quotations are arranged chronologically with each within each author's entry, followed by attributed remarks whose source in the author's writings have not been confirmed. And it can it can it contains a thorough keyword index and details the source of each quotation. History. Oh wow, it gets more interesting. John Bartlett ran the University Bookstore in Cambridge, Mass. 
and was frequently asked for information on quotations. So he began a, began a commonplace book of, of them for reference. We'll look up what commonplace book is in a minute. Bartlett is generally supposed to have drawn the quotations in his book from his own extensive reading and prodigious memory in that commonplace book. But he acknowledged in the 1855 preface uh, that has been enlarged by additions from uh, an English work on a similar plane. And that work uh, was named in some reviews of the time as a handbook of familiar quotations by English authors. Isabella Rushton Preston. And that was from 1853. It was privately printed in 1855 as a collection of familiar quotations. The first edition was 258 pages, 169 authors, but mostly it was from the Bible, Shakespeare, and the great English poets, quoting Wikipedia there. The fourth edition said that it's not easy to determine, in all cases, the degree of familiarity uh, that belong to the phrases and sentences which present themselves for admission from uh, what is familiar to one class of readers might be new to another. And again, I guess this is limited in scope, uh, you know, to this uh, uh, person's purview, you know. Uh, let's see. The book had great success. There were three more editions, and then it joined the Boston publishing firm of Little Brown and Company. Bartlett rose to become senior partner of the firm. Let's look up Little Brown and Company, still, I think, still the publisher. Supervised nine editions of work before moving on to uh, the big publishing house in the sky. Even by 1905, it had sold over 300,000 copies. Uh, seventh edition in 1875, eighth in 1882, ninth in 1891. Then it'll be 20 years before the 10th edition, which was edited by Nathan Haskell Doyle. 10th edition, also known as the author's edition, was much like its predecessors. It began with quotations originally in English and then arranged them chronologically. Uh, Chaucer was the first entry, Mary Frances Butts the last. Uh, quotes were chiefly from literary sources and then a miscellaneous section of quotations in English from politicians and scientists. Uh, then a selection of translations, which is in quotes, uh, mostly of lines from ancient Greeks and Romans. So again, pretty uh, limited to this uh, Western uh, viewpoint. Uh, the last section was devoted to the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer. The 11th edition was edited by Christopher Morley and Luella D. Everett. Uh, expanded the page size, created a two-column format, making the first, edi making the first edi edition that is recognizable to users of the modern work. And they also did a 12th edition in 1948, then 13th edition in 1955, the Centennial Edition. This work was credited to the editors of Little Brown, Preference gives uh, special thanks to Morley and Everett as well as Emily Morrison Beck. This had more recent material, two youngest authors, Bill Maudlin and Queen Elizabeth II. Beck also edited the 14th edition and the 15th. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, then uh, Justin Kaplan whose life of Mark Twain, Mr. Kem oh, whose book of life of whose book, uh, Mr. Clemens and Mark Twain had won the 1967 Pulitzer. Kaplan brought out the 16th edition in 93. Uh, let's see. Then in the 17th edition, 2003, they included, uh, pop culture people, uh, including Larry David. Some classics were cut. Uh, Alexander Pope was dropped, uh, then the 18th edition came out in 2012. It was edited by poet, critic, and editor Joffrey O'Brien, the editor-in-chief of the Library of America. Oh, there's also the Yale Book of Quotations and the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations. And just looking, there's not a ton of... Uh, 
Let's see, we got an online of the copy of the uh, 10th edition or a copy of the 12th edition or the 14th edition. Let's take a look at the 10th edition real quick. Uh, you know, it's like searchable. So I don't know if I can do that. Uh, chronological index of authors. Let me just click on this here. Let's just randomly pick somebody. Ralph Venning. All the beauty in the world's but skin deep. Uh, wow, that was from Ralph Venning. Let's I guess let's try one more here. Yeah, sound like people I haven't heard of here. A lot of dudes here, huh? Oh yeah. Uh, William Pitt, Earl of Chatham. Confidence is a plant of slow growth in an aged bosom. It doesn't sound where law ends, journey begins. I don't see any um, of these that I'm really. Okay, let's look up the, like I used to think, I remember when I discovered this book, I thought it was a pathway to greater knowledge. Not understanding that kind of quotations are mostly based as a part of a larger context and process, not uh, results. Okay, a commonplace book, though. Or a way to compile knowledge by writing information into books. Uh, they've been kept from antiquity, particularly during the Renaissance. Similar to scrapbooks filled with items of many kind, proverbs, adages, maxims, quotes, letters. Entries are most often organized under subject headings and differ functionally from journals or diaries, which are chronological and introspective. Common places are used by readers, writers, this again from Wikipedia students, uh, as an aid for remembering useful, useful con concepts or facts. So I guess that's a little bit about commonplace. Let's look at a couple more things that I, a oh, little Brown and company, American publish, uh, publishing company founded in 1837 by Charles Coffin Little and James Brown in Boston for close to two centuries. It's published uh, fiction and nonfiction, including Emily Dickinson's poetry, Bartlett's uh, familiar quotations, and is now a division of the Hatchet Book Group. Let's see what we got. Uh, I don't know. I think that's pretty good. I mean, that's a, they've been around for a while. Mary Frances Butts uh, uh, was in uh, 1890 to 1937, uh, Ma English modernist writer. Uh, found in uh, recognition in literature, ma literary magazines such as The Bookman and The Little Review, as well as from fe fellow modernists T.S. Eliot, H.D., and Bri Breyer. Uh, regained, fell into obscurity, but then began to be republished in the 1980s. Let's see. I'll read a little bit about uh, her work here. Uh... Let's see. These are some of the writings. Uh, Magic Book 4. Oh, by Alistair Crowley. Ash of Rings, armed with uh, imaginary letters. Uh, Felicity Taverner, uh, several occasions. Warning to Hikers, uh, The Macedonian, Scenes from the Life of Cleopatra, My Crystal Cabern, Cab Cabinet. Uh, most of her books were reprinted in the 80s and the 90s. Anyway, so the, that's a little bit. Oregon boundary dispute. Uh, oh, 50-40 or fight uh, redirects here. So that was one of the quotes that came up. Uh, the Oregon uh, boundary dispute or Oregon question was a 19th uh, century uh, uh, territorial dispute over the Pacific Northwest. So people arguing over somebody else's uh, land, uh, uh, Russian Empire, Great Britain, Spain, and the U.S. Uh, after the War of 1812, the Oregon dispute took on increased importance between the British Empire, the American Republic, uh, and the Russians that signed in the 1820s the Russo-American Treaty and the Russo-British Treaty. And the Spanish had signed on the uh, Adams-Onus Treaty. 
and uh, they're trying to figure out uh, who could control the Pacific Coast. Uh, it was still contested by the U.K. and the U.S. Uh, the disputed area was a region west of the Continental Divide, north of the uh, 42nd parallel north, uh, and the Russian parallel at uh, 5440. British called it the Columbia District, and the Americans called it Oregon, the Oregon country. In 1844, uh, it was a part of the U.S. It came up during the presidential election. Oh, man, good old Manifest Destiny. Oh, boy. Uh, they wa- they wanted to make an offer on the 49th parallel. However, that faltered. Tensions grew. And they, everyone was urging James K. Polk uh, to annex the entire Pacific Northwest all the way to the 5440. And these tensions gave rise to that slogan, 5440 or fight. Uh, and also the U.S. was annexing t- Texas. So, uh, so yeah, a lot there. A lot, uh, a lot going on with uh, that uh, Bartlett's quotations. Uh, but, uh, anytime I think about, uh, that, I think about, uh, you know, my Nana always came up and, uh, so thinking my Nana, um, and records that I have, uh, maybe Nana, could we work out something, um, where we go through these records, uh, and you give me Nana's book of familiar quotations. Oh, Nana doesn't want to be on mic. Oh, that's okay. So I'll do this, uh. These are uh, Nana's uh, quotations you're not familiar with. And I'll, get, I'll try to get... This is a quote from Fabian. This friendly world. And, you know, contextually, Nana normally says, this this friendly world. Uh, I would guess she would say it in irony. But let's imagine a world... From Nana's perspective, instead of only imagining it from my perspective, right, Nana, finally? As you're saying, so what if there was a world where I was more open-minded about Nana's perspective, right? Uh, And where Nana was coming from, trying to help me, right, help myself. So this friendly world, you would say, that's what you're trying to help provide me with your guidance, is this friendly world, uh... Another quote by Fabian, you know, that was the B-side, I assume, because the A-side is Hound Dog Man. And when you say that, you see, like, uh, Hound Dog Man makes me think, uh, you say, why are you acting like a Hound Dog Man? You're saying it in a friendly, helpful way, though, Nana, because I'm chasing my own tail around, I'm sniffing around and trying to find my own way instead of just getting help, right, and saying, okay, well, yeah, isn't there anything else I could do that would be good for everybody instead of just uh, sniffing, like, why do all the work, right? Just ask for help. Don't be a hound dog, man. Uh, Ask for some help uh, in this friendly world. Thanks, Nana. Another couple people Nana likes to quote is Gene Pitney. And uh, one of them is Tower Tall. Uh, I've heard heard her say that uh, before, quoting Gene Pitney, Tower Tall. And I'd say, okay, that means the task at hand is not going to be easy, right? Uh, We could be walking up the tower. It's going to be tall. We could be looking up at the tower. And it's a simple statement. You know, it's a flexible one. Wow, Tower's Tall. Kind of like there, somebody told me recently, hey, there's only four prayers, really. Uh, H-E-L-P, thank you, wow, and uh, another one, uh, fudge. Those are four, the only four prayers. Uh, or, or, and I say, okay, I like that. This one sounds similar, though. Tower Tall could be, yeah, it could be wow. It could be Towers Tall, uh, help, uh what are the other ones? Uh, tower tall. Thanks. That's beautiful. Or tower tall. Uh, you fudge. I got to go all the way up that tower. It's going to be or over it. So how am I going to do that? Another thing I hear Nana say from Gene Pitney all the time is uh, half heaven, heart, half heaven, half heartache. And that's, again, another one flexible. She says it a lot about me. 
when I'm at my best. Uh, she says, uh, and then she usually refines it. Well, with you, it's more like, uh, you know, 99999999999 heartache, uh, point zero 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 heaven. Uh, and I'd say there's a little bit of heaven in all of us, Nana, but mostly in your smile. And then I said, did that give me to half heaven, half heartache? Uh, but that's something we can all relate to, right? Half heaven, it's a relatable quote, Gene Pitney. Another one I love uh, to, to hear from Nana, but I, you know, I, and I'd love to hear it in the way Nana means it. She, when she quotes the Chiffons, uh, One Fine Day, she loves to quote the Chiffons, One Fine Day. And again, that can mean it could be speaking about the present, uh, one fine day, or, you know, sometimes uh, Nana speaks would speak about it. She'd be just jesting, but about my bottom dollar. Uh, but it, well, I don't know. I wouldn't be betting my bottom dollar, but I'd say, uh, and I actually don't know what that quote means, so I probably shouldn't, but she'd say, one fine day, you know. And I'd say, Nana, we don't, you don't practice, you're, you're imaginary, so you can't practice corporal discipline with me. But one fine day, we might. Uh, and then another thing I can relate to, maybe a lot of you can relate to when Nana quotes the Chiffons, why am I so shy? Why am I so shy? And you could say it with a forlorn thing, but what, you know, I've learned from Ted Lasso is, uh, or maybe say, I mean, you could say it like that, why am I so shy? Uh... Or you could say in a playful way, uh, or you could say, hey, it's okay. Why am I so, so, so shy? Don't know. But I'm here by and by to give you uh, everything uh, you can need, you know. But it is a quote that comes up for Nana. You know, another one that comes up, uh, by, you know, another person, you know, this is Nana's generation. She likes to quote Bobby Darren. B-O-B-B-Y-D-A-R-N. And she says, sorrow tomorrow. And when she says that, you know, uh, I say, Nana, like, uh, I said, what about, how about, okay. Uh, but, uh, like, uh, you, like, what can't we look for? Uh, I thought it's one, one fine day. Sorrow tomorrow. Is that like you're predicting the weather now? But maybe it's more of a wise thing. Again, if I can embrace Nana the way I embrace Ray, I'm sorry, Nana. Like, it is a case of you spot it, you got it for me, because you're so relatable. But maybe you're saying, hey, save the sorrow for tomorrow. But I would say, for me, I'd say, it's okay to be sad today, too. But uh, maybe if you're, here's, here's where I think you're coming from, Nana. If I'm focused on tomorrow, it'll always be sorrow. Uh, even when I'm fantasizing about taking a vacation or being a different person that's uh, living tomorrow like it's one fine day. It's, uh, you know, it's all about living in the moment, right, Nana? Thank you for that lesson. It took me a while from you and Bobby Darren. Another thing you, you, I, I took, probably take the wrong way is when you say, you must have been a beautiful baby when you quote Bobby Darren. And uh, I, I say... It, like, uh, are you saying I'm beautiful now or I'm be like, I was a beautiful baby and I'm not beautiful anymore. But I think what you're really saying, Nana, which other people say is, Hey, pay some compliments. Uh, and that's the easy way to pay a compliment. But even, I think it's probably confusing in the modern day parlance. So, and plus most people don't remember when they're a baby. So I'd say, uh, like, just find a way to compliment somebody is what you're really saying, Nana. Oh, then there's your, uh, your quote of them. Uh, here comes the night. Uh, and again, I guess it's like, uh, you know, that's sometimes it's r r ready. Like, hey, here comes the night. Let's do our bedtime routine, right, Nana? And to get ready for bed. Uh, and uh, here comes the night. Uh, it'll be okay, right, Nana? That's what you're saying. Here comes the night. Uh, and all for myself. That's also another quote from them you like to quote, huh, Nana? All for myself. Uh, and that's when I think you, you're like uh, really, uh, you, you know, I don't know, like, uh, 
I don't know what that one means. I'm trying to find the deeper meaning. I mean, I can imagine you, like, I guess this is my chance to grow. Because I say, well, if you were hugging me, you'd say, I'm going to keep you all for myself. But that would make me take off, Nana, and, you know, want to have my own distance. Uh, but maybe it's that. It's like, oh, I can't have all it all for myself. Uh, I want it all for myself, but I can't have it all for myself, huh? So not easy, but true is uh, you can't have it all for yourself even when you want to, right, Nana? So that's that's another good lesson from you. Thank you, Nana. You know, Nana, I wanted to take a second to compliment you on how... Do, do you realize that your um, quotes are so brief, usually only a few words? I mean, brevity is the act of uh, sincerity, or sincerity is the act of brevity, or something, because that's not my skill set. That it could be set on a 45 or a 33 record. But I remember when you quoted Johnny Horton to me, the mansion you stole. And I guess I took it a little bit in my my interpretation of it. Because uh, I think you were describing it about my habits and uh, cleaning up after myself and staying organized. But I took a much different meaning from it, Nana, that, uh, that uh, of heartbreak and, uh, but of depth uh, to a person that, uh, like, I, I guess, cause I said, well, if that was a song that you were quoting the title of instead of a pithy saying, first of all, I'd say, I don't think there's anything pithy about the mansion you stole because you say, but they see, oh, like a person is a mansion, so many rooms, whatever the, I don't, Nana, what's a ball, there's a word like balustrade or something, but uh, I say, okay, that is a way to describe it or the depth of someone's heart. Uh, and of course, that Johnny Horton song, you like to quote from a movie, I don't know, but where you're going to send, where you tell me to go sometime north to Alaska, when you send me to my room, when you send me out the door, when you send me on my way in north to Alaska, I know what that means. Also, because your body language usually helps me uh, north to Alaska. That's where I'll go. Now, this one, you know, this is a famous, uh, you, when you, this is the most famous person. I mean, some might say, I don't know, did you quote Donovan earlier or was it, uh, you quoted a couple of for people that could, could, could be considered one name people. You name this person, they have two names, but they probably, if, if, like Elvis Presley, you say, and I like how you don't do quotey quotes, you do, uh, Whatever those things are, brackets and not brackets, uh, parentheses. You say you're the uh, uh, figure with red spandex in disguise, and I say there's no disguise in me, Nana. That's re- those are red spandex that I, I'm not that I'm wearing figuratively. It, you, my figure is figuratively wearing red spandex. Oh boy, is it! Uh, and I'm shaking my hips. Because those mean that I am the red-wearing spandex person from beneath the earth or somewhere, you know, down there in disguise. And the other one, I guess I never took it as, I didn't realize it was figurative. Because, But you quote Elvis, you say, please don't drag that string around. And I always thought that was... Uh, did, like you were just telling me, and I said, "Well, uh, you, what? Which?" Str-? Then I'd look behind me to see if it was a string hanging off my clothes, or a lot of times I assumed it was my sho- way you were saying my shoelace. But uh, I guess it's in some sense it's to gather up the string of the uh, things I drag around, and maybe I should gather those up and not drag them around. Uh, especially the, the, because normally I say, wow, Nana's really asking me in a way I'm unfamiliar with, uh, saying please. But another quote of yours I love, Nana. Oh, thanks, Nana. Nana just asked a question. 
<laughs> she said, oh, is this like Bartlett's familiar's quotations? Are you doing, what What system of order are you doing them in? Is it chronological? Is it by, I say, Nana, it's by the stack of records in my hand that I'm reading off of uh, your famous quotes. And this is one of my favorites, uh, except that I always you talk about misquoting Nana. Uh, and even when I, when I misquote you, I do sing this. All that glitters isn't gold, you say, from Lou Christie. But I always say all, you know, I, I, I guess I do. I think, isn't that song, All That Glitters Is Gold? Uh, but then you say that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and I'd say, well, that's, I say, I think I learned it from a commercial for cereal or maybe it was for golden um, sugar cubes or whatever they're called. Uh, sugar, golden sugar puffs uh, with the bear on there. Are they just sugar puffs? I think they're golden, and they glitter like gold. And I say, all that glitters is gold. And you say, no, all that glitters is not gold. And I'd say, isn't gold, right, Nana? And you'd say, correct. Uh, and I'd say, well, it still sounds like me, but that was uh, old, or not Luke. And then I say, is that from, like, then I say, do you know who said that? Now I'll say this, all that glitters is gold, Lon Chaney. And you say, are you doing this on purpose? Because it's Lou Christie. Two faces have I. Oh, boy. If I could say, I say, well, my face, uh, Nana's face usually has, you, Nana, you have more than two faces. And I wouldn't call you two-faced because you're so straightforward and honest. Uh, but if you were trying to simplify it into a song that only had four, you know, a quote, obviously, we're talking quotes here. I'd say you probably would say it, uh, you know, two, two, like uh, two faces have I. I think that'd be better. Was that a song in Phantom of the Opera? Because I think, uh, does Phantom of the Opera have a song, Two Faces Have I? It sounds like somebody would be singing that in a musical anyway. And Nana, this one will, even you will laugh before, we won't even have to get into this quote, but you'll have a laugh at what you would, would, you know, so will all the listeners listening along at this one. When you quote, 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 Connie Francis, but you're saying it like your quote, if my pillow could talk, uh, talk about something for sleep with me. Uh, you know, that's so easy because we have that quote, you know, boy, you know, if my pillow could talk, it's, it, there'd be nothing to say, uh, other than, you know, no, I, I mean, I wash, I don't wash my pillow as often as I should. And, uh, like, uh, but it, you know, that, Nan, I knew you'd have a laugh at that. You're still laughing, uh, too easy, she says, uh. And, you know, Connie Francis also, you quote Connie Francis saying, um, uh, you're the only one who can disappoint me. And uh, then I usually sing like another song that goes, do you really want to disappoint me? Do you really, you know, want to make me cry? But then you say, and I say, really, I'm the only one that could disappoint. And I say, oh, because you're an imaginary nana living within me. That makes sense. And also, that's a great lesson to tell me, tell me, like, just like we said earlier, I spotted, I got it, right, Nana? Because, uh, yeah, I could do, you know, th that uh, only, you know, that's my behavior, like, uh, that's disappointing, you know, and my expectations. So you're right, Nana. Another person, this was an obscure one, but I take it, you know, sometimes you say this when you're frustrated. You quote Leslie Gore, uh, and you say Danny, but you say it in a way, you know, where you snap your fingers. So I always thought it was a way so you wouldn't, uh, you know, because you, sometimes you say it after you say, it's my party, the old, that's the mo is that the most famous, uh, like, is that the one I cry if I want to? Or is that another one? You know, because I always wonder, uh, I always wonder, is it Nana, like, is Nana, um, is it my party? Um, another one, you know, you, I've heard you quote before is old Gene Pitney, right? 
And you all like that's when you pretend. Sometimes you you uh, you say because uh, this was one of the f- funniest things. You, you like you say I'm dehydrating you. Teardrop. You just say teardrop by teardrop. But then I had to imagine what you were saying. You just say teardrop by teardrop. Uh, but then I said, wouldn't it be more make more sense if you said, little Andy, you're 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 dehydrating your nana, teardrop by teardrop? Or hey, nana, how did you get dehydrated? Well, because teardrop by teardrop, by dealing with little Andy, I turned to dust, teardrop by teardrop. Um, but you could, oh boy, Nana. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's other ways you could. And then you said Mecca, the Gene Pit- Pitney thing, which I didn't understand. Uh, and uh, like, uh, you, you could, like, I didn't know if that was like something like, uh, I didn't know if you were working on like a screenplay or something, Nana, where you're trying to write hip dialogue for, because then you say, well, when they wrote that dialogue, like, uh, I was thinking of Heathers and Tina Fey. I think Tina Fey said, well, they made up the, some of the stuff. Uh, so I don't know. And I said, well, I don't know if you should be using Mac as a, t- like, like I said, Nana, can't we, can't you just use it in, uh, but you say, well, I'm not, I'm quoting whatever Gene Pitney. This is one I, I never knew. Like, it just made me laugh. Uh, Bob B. Sox, uh, you quote and you'd say flipping nitty, and I'd say, "Did you? How do you spell Bobby Sox?" B-O, and you say Bob B O B B S O double X, and I'd say, "Oh wow, Nana, that's some wild stuff." Uh, Bobby Sox, eh? Flipping nitty. I'd say those sound like uh, characters from from like a, a Sleep with Me podcast. And then you say zip a dee doo da, and I say is that like the song from a like a? But usually that's when you uh, that's when you answer my question with a song, and you say uh, trouble in paradise. When will I be loved? Uh, and I say are those two different songs. So trouble in paradise is, uh, and I guess that's uh, what it's like being around me, huh? You say trouble in paradise. And, uh, but Josephine, this is what makes me giggle. Itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. And I think Josephine is another quote, right? Uh, you're just quoting various uh, popular artists, vocals, and orchestra, right? But uh, itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. And then Tommy Rowe is another one, Nana. I've heard you, oh boy, do you love to quote Tommy Rowe, save your kisses. Uh, and if I could quote Tommy Rowe, I'd say, like, uh, in that other thing, teardrop by teardrop, I would quote The Weeknd uh, and say, save your tears. And then you'd say, what are you going to say, save your tears for a rainy day? And I'd say, for another day, Nana. But, I mean... If I, but it, here's it, here's it, th- something. Maybe the weekend meant this. Maybe the weekend read Cat in the Hat uh, as a boy, as a lad. Maybe the weekend chain, maybe it was Save Your Tears for a Rainy Day. And uh, that was for the Cat in the Hat, like some Cat in the Hat related project. Uh, and it really, the, if anyone knew what was going on with the cat in the hat, there'd be a lot of tears, even though everything was fine. I mean, other than the fish, I guess the fish would sing it. Uh, the fish is that the fish would say, "Save your tears for a rainy day," and then the like, uh, be a rainy day, good day to cry. You could say, but you like save your kisses for Tommy Rowe. And I always say, well, what does that mean? Uh, Like, you you don't want, I mean, obviously, you know, we won't be doing any kissing, even, you know. I mean, I could kiss your forehead if if you were under the weather, Nana. I mean, I'll be honest, our relationship preferred not to be a kissing-based relationship, even a pecking. You know, that's just where I'm at. One day, Nana, the podcast listeners may hear three years from now. I'd say, Nana, go ahead and give me a kiss on the cheek. But right now, just where I am in my honest growth is I say, Nana, I'm practicing trying to be somewhat kind to you occasionally. 
and I'd prefer you save your kisses. So thanks for helping me assert myself. And then you quote Tommy Rowe when you say Sheila, who, you know, that's uh, someone in my family. And I say, wow, Sheila. Uh, but then there was also the song, Oh, Oh, Sheila. But that's a different song than what we're talking about. Another quote I like, Nana, is when you quote uh, Doris Troy. It's so rare, but you say, just one look. Uh, and I said, what does she mean by that? Just one look. Like, are you just going to give me just one more look? Or are you um, uh, like, uh, you see, just one look. And I said, okay, Nana, I'm just giving you one look of uh, miss, like, I don't understand. But maybe you're saying it to yourself. Uh, and I'll never forget the day you said, you, you quoted Doris Troy, and you said, I got the Bosa Nova Blues. And I said, Nana, I think that was my favorite uh, piece of sci-fi fiction I read as a boy. And you said, no, no, I'm telling you how I'm feeling. And I say, are you sure? I said, I thought that was in a series of books that I read as a boy that I've been trying to get the bottom of, Bossa Nova, Bossa Nova Blues. Don't, don't you remember, Nana? There's two books that I'm searching for the titles of or copies of. And one of which is a b book I read as a, 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 a child. I checked it out of the library. Not a not a young child, though, probably somewhere between first grade and ninth grade. Probably between first grade and, and fifth grade, though, Nana, really. And I could swear that if I was going to invent a title for the book five of that series, it'd be Bossa Nova Blues, uh, because maybe they live on the Bossa Nova. I don't know what it would be. I mean, you could make it about Bossa Nova, which I think is a kind of music. I don't know, Nana. But I was thinking it, they live on Bosa Nova Station. Or maybe there's a Bosa Nova coming to the planet so everybody's down. But that was a boy who was my age when I was reading it who had an android duplicate of themselves, maybe, who was their best friend. But I don't. that's all I remember out the book. I, I mean, other than lying on my bedroom floor reading it and listening to the radio. And uh, so I say, Bossa Nova Blues, I guess I gave you a case of that. And then, oh, of course, Nan, I'll talk about the other book. I mean, the other book comes up a lot, which is a book where, you know, like where they do, the kid tries to, do, like, uh, eventually uh, tries to dig a hole through the center of the earth. Uh, and it kind of shows scientifically what kind of equipment would be needed as a boy escalates from just a shovel to uh, actually trying to dig to the other side of the earth. But uh, I guess that, would, that reminds me of those quotes where, where you roll your eyes and you, you quote Dodie Stevens coming of age or you shrug your shoulders uh, to be, be, you know, describe my behavior and you say, I don't know, coming of age. Uh, and I guess I never know what that means. Uh, another one, this is like an emotional thing, you say, like some of the things, I don't know what the term is, uh, but it was called Pink Shoelaces by Dodie Stevens. Another Dodie Stevens quote, Pink Shoelaces. Uh, you know, it reminds me a bit of Ted Lasso saying barbecue sauce when you say Pink Shoelaces. But I don't know. Uh, and then you'd quote, I know you quoted the monkeys a few times. Uh, one of them, you just said words, right? Uh, and uh, like, I guess that was when I was talking too much or I didn't understand something. You'd say words. Uh, and normally I would respond to that with word up. Uh, uh, and you'd say, no, words. Uh, you wouldn't say it's just words. You'd just say words. Uh and they'd say, oh, that must be the wisdom of the monkeys. Like that other monkeys quote, you like to say, Pleasant Valley Sunday. And then you'd use the day of the week that's not Sunday. Pleasant Valley Sunday on Thursday. And I'd say, is that what time with me feels like, Nana? Pleasant Valley Sunday? 
And that was when you'd again quote uh, Connie Francis, as you love to do so much. Uh, and you'd say, everybody's somebody's fool. But then you would move it around. You'd say, you're somebody, every, somebody's, everybody's somebody's fool. Somebody, you're the somebody. And you're uh, for every, and I'd say, thanks, Nan. I'm glad. And I say, well, it's good because I have a purpose now. So, but somehow, somehow that quote, that Connie Francis quote, Led to the podcast, Nana. Do you believe that? Uh, good old Connie Francis saying everybody's somebody's fool. And, uh, you know, the other thing is sometimes I can, you know, let my feelings come up of jealousy. Jealous, you know, and I'm jealous of you, just like you would say with Connie Francis. You would usually, uh, I guess I'm imagining you would say it when I didn't do some. I'm jealous of you. Don't do the dishes. Uh, when they're supposed to be done. But I think the one thing that, you know, I love the most, Nana, is, uh, uh, you, you know, when you quote Eddie Hodges or Edie Hodges and you say, I'm a knock on your door. Cause I, again, mistook that as some sort of, uh, passive aggressive statement, but it was more like, I'm going to say hi to you. I'm going to knock on your door with kindness with love, I'm going to reach out to you and, and quote, I'm going to knock on your door. Uh, and then that other, uh, Eddie Hodges or Edie Hodges quote, you love the last quote we'll share in this book of, uh, Nan, Bar Nana's unfamiliar quotations ain't going to wash for a week. Uh, you would usually say that after, if, if an occasion I did kiss your forehead, I would hope you'd say that, Nan, or shook your hand or gave you a hug. More as not a state, a statement of fact, but as a statement of disbelief, right? Like, I ain't gonna wash for a week. Uh, you know, I don't want your kiss. You know, you actually hugged me. But you're, you know, every quote you have in Nana, when I take it, when I take a second to actually listen, is like, uh, I guess I shouldn't wash my ears out for a week. After hearing all this wisdom, uh, so I'm glad to hear it, Nana. Thanks so much and good night.